Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Unwrapped. Welcome to the third and final day of the Data Wrapper Conference. If uh, you're super new here today, uh, my name is Lisa. I'm the head of communications at Data Wrapper. You might know me from a blog post or two from the Data Wrapper blog, but I'm also kind of in charge of this conference. So I'm the one who um, will tell you what to expect today. Um, we do have a packed agenda. We did have a packed agenda yesterday and the day before too. And I want to quickly talk a little bit about what happened so far. So on Wednesday, we had an introduction to Data Wrapper. It was all about the basics. It was a kickoff. Um, you, we explained how to use it, um, what you can actually do with it. And at the end of the day, uh, we saw some examples of use, but also a peek behind the curtain our co-CEO Elana gave um, or explained how and why we are adding the features to Data Wrapper that we are adding. Then yesterday, we had a lot of speakers that explained how they use their uh, Data Wrapper in their organizations. So basically, it was all about this one, this chart. When you signed up, we asked you in which organizations you are in, and that's what you told us. A third of you who signed up uh, said they are in some kind of media organization, but the rest of you are doing all kinds of stuff. You're in all kinds of organizations, research, businesses, government organization, university, um, nonprofits, all of that. And we really wanted to celebrate the diversity. So uh, yesterday we had a first block where we looked at data wrapper across non-media fields. And then we slowly went into going to um, to media companies, how do media companies, uh, organizations use data wrapper um, and what design um, yeah, specifications um, do they use with data wrapper. Um, after that, we had a keynote by Amanda Cox, who also works at a media organization, Bloomberg. Um, and if you've missed that, I can really recommend to rewatch this one, um, as well as the product announcement and the Q&A session that came afterward. So the Data Wrapper CEOs, David and Alana, went um, on air yesterday to announce two exciting new features in Data Wrapper live collaboration. Um, so you can now see the settings that somebody else is changing while they're changing them. Um, and edit history, which means you can now restore past versions of your charts, maps, and tables you create in Data Wrapper. So these were the two last days. If you missed any of the talks or the whole days, you can rewatch them at datawrapper.de slash unwrapped slash day one and day two. And yes, you can guess what the recording, where the recording will live of this day. We will upload it to slash day three right after the conference uh, day ends. But you're here for today. You want to know what's happening today. Uh, so let me tell you that too. Um, we basically tell you today, or like a lot of speakers will tell you today, what's possible. So when you signed up for Unwrapped, we also asked, what do you want to learn at the conference? And you told us you want to discover what's possible. You want to learn about automation stuff, about workflows, about the powerful crafts that think can be created, more innovative ways to build charts. And that's what today is all about. So this is what our agenda looks like for today. We start with an hour of locator maps um, with two talks uh, and then go into um, the creative use of data wrapper block where we have uh, six talks um, from speakers from Spiegel, Tats, um, Urban, Urban Institute, Star Tribune, um, LP, the Finnish parliament. And they will all talk about, well, how they use data wrapper um, creatively basically in ways you probably haven't uh, used before, in, in ways you haven't even explored or like um, thought of. Um, I'm super, super excited about this blog. It will be hosted by my coworker, Gregor, who's also the co-founder of Data Wrapper. Afterwards, we go to the Data Wrapper API and see what's possible with this one. How can you automate chart creation? This is the big question that um, will be answered in that blog. We have great speakers there again from the Times, Süddeutsche Zeitung, Axios, Reuters, Los Angeles Times. I'm also super excited about this blog um, and to see what they are doing with our API, which again, 
I probably haven't even thought about. This will be the official end of the conference um, and there will be closing remarks. But if you want to stay with us for a little bit more, you can also join our Data This Book Club. So the Data This Book Club is kind of a tradition at Data Wrapper. We've organized a few by now. And today we will um, discuss Alberto Cairo's uh, latest book, The Art of Insight. That's how it looks like. This is what we will discuss. Join us, even if you haven't read the book, Guillermina and I will ask Alberto a lot of questions also from you. We want you to participate in that, so stay around. All right, so this is today today. Uh, locator maps, creative use of data wrapper, data wrapper API, and then the database book club. You can find the full agenda and like all the times for the talks on our conference website. So just go to datawapper.de and then slash unwrapped. Um, but what we really recommend again uh, to add all talks to your Google Calendar. So if you haven't done it yet, download all talks or add them to your Google Calendar. You can also do so on the conference website. And this is where you can also download the agenda as a PDF. Um, so this is what the PDF will look like. You see that on the left uh, and also what it will look like once it's in your calendar. And a quick reminder that these buffer zones uh, that you will find labeled in the agenda PDF are not really to be thought of as breaks, but more as extension zones. Uh, so you will find that talks might start earlier, but also might start later and actually extend into this buffer zone. Um, so if you want to just come here to watch one talk, we recommend to come like 10 minutes earlier, but also the talk might start 20 minutes later or something like that. Um, we are flexible there because we really want to foster discussions. If there's a good Q&A session going on, we want to leave that running. Um, and so we plan a little bit of buffer uh, in there. Um, all right, and now all that's left for me is to ask you to take part. Um, you can do so by this way, uh, using the chat uh, on your right. Um, so introduce yourself, ask questions there, um, talk with the speakers, definitely ask questions also to the speakers. There will be a Q&A session for every single speaker and every single after every single talk. So if you have anything you want to know uh, um, from the speaker, just ask and we will bring your questions to the screen. Before and after the talks, so you can also, or for general questions, you can also join our conference Slack. So if you go to datawapper.de slash unwrapped slash chat, you can join our Slack workspace uh, where people ask general questions about data wrapper, for example, um, you can also, if you have any problems with the conference in general, you can ask that there, but so far, uh, things have been going well. Um, but yeah, the data wrapper chat channel is definitely something to check out. There have been some interesting questions. Uh, so I can recommend joining, joining the Slack workspace. All right. Um, well, welcome to the first blog, everyone. I'm actually the host too of that locator map, uh, blog. So I'm excited for our next two talk, uh, talks. We have one by Sharon Dolmer, um, a short lightning talk, and then a longer one by Philip David Pries. So let me bring to the stage uh, our first speaker, um, Jan. Um, this is the first speaker of the day. Uh, she is a freelance cartographer who will uh, show locator map. She created as part of the so-called 30-day map challenge uh, last November. Um, I actually remember seeing her map on Twitter when she first created it, and I liked it so much that I had to immediately share it in our showcase channel um, in at the Data Wrapper uh, workspace. Um, so I'm super happy that Sharon is here today to share her thoughts about that map in uh, a short talk. And Sharon, the stage is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction, Lisa. As I said, my name is Jelen and I'm a freelance cartographer and a data visualization designer. And today I'll talk about my experience of visualizing peace with Interact. And I'll do that by walking you through my process of creating this particular map titled I Want to Go to the American Bar, but Public Transit Fails Me, 
American bar is my favorite bar in Belfast, which is where I live. And um, we have a tricky public transit situation. Here. So I wanted to use this map to communicate all my frustrations and declare my love of this pub. Um, and just to get everyone up to speed, this is American bar and what it looks like if you're ever in town, I would absolutely recommend checking it out. Let's get into it. Um, I'd like to first distinguish between what I mean when I say space and what I mean when I say place and why I chose to italicize and have that word larger in my title. Um, when I'm talking about space, I am often talking about um, a location with a clear X and Y coordinates. So space is measurable and it's functional and it doesn't change depending on, on who you ask. Um, an example of this could be if we're talking about a hospital, the address of that hospital would be space. You would be able to measure that um, and you'd be able to use that to give people directions or you could give relative directions to tell someone it's across the road from something else and it will be the same depending on matter who you ask. Um, whereas when I say place, I am talking more about how we relate to those spaces. So our perception of place will often be informed by our feelings and experiences and identities. And they also vary, they depend who you ask all of our feelings and experiences will be different too. For that same example of a hospital, um, your perception of it would change if you had a child there or if you lost a loved one or if you're a medical professional who started training there. So those kind of experiences refer to place. Another example of this I quite like is the question of where are you from and where is home for you? When we ask people where they're from, the answer you get is quite often a fact on their score, it's where they where their family is, um, or there's usually a documentation to go with it. Whereas when we ask someone where home is for them, that will be informed by our experiences and story. Uh, if you're interested in, interested more in this distinction, I have a couple of sources listed at the bottom. Feel free to check them out. But let's go back to visualizing place. So as we said mentioned, um, I was partaking in third day map challenge this past November. And the theme for day seven was navigation. And I wanted to think about what navigation would look like from a space point of view and what it would look like from a place point of view. And for space point of view, um, I came up with a screenshot on the right, which is what you get in Google where you put my former address. So don't worry, I'm not giving my home address there. Um, and the directions to my favorite bar. So you get a lot of facts there. You get the time it takes, you get um, traffic information you will get different schedules and that won't change no matter who you ask. But what I really wanted to get with this map is what does this look like from a place point of view? So why do I make the choices I make when I'm trying to get to this bar? And what are the factors that go into this? And how could that be visualized in the map context? Around the same time, well, I think a little bit before actually, I came across this data wrapper blog by Lick on sounds and paths crossing Mrs. Dalloway's London. Uh, Mrs. Dalloway is a book by Virginia Woolf. And when I saw this, I immediately thought that's actually a really good way to visualize place because you get a lot of flexibility in terms of adding annotations to guide readers through what are all these feelings and thoughts. And even sounds could be a part of that placial experience. Um, and you can also, play around with styling these lines to add importance or choose certain colors to communicate certain feelings. So I was quite inspired by this map and Luke's success. So the next thing I wanted to do is I wanted to create one of my own. So I went into Data Wrapper and I started to create a cater map and I found all the answers to my questions when I toggled the import line and area markers. And I came across some documentation from Data Wrapper on to do step by step, and also a link to a tool called GeoJSON.io, which I'll talk a little bit more. Um, but if you're interested in doing something with this, I highly recommend going into GeoJSON.io, which looks like this. You get a map and you get a side panel, and highlighted in red there is the line tool. You can click on that, and once you draw a line of your choosing over the base map you get what that looks like in a GeoJSON. And all you have to do after that is copy that information, stick it back into Data Wrapper, and you have a line that you can stylize and annotate and use in a way that is suitable for your purpose. And that looks like this. So what I did with using that tool, I went in and drew all the different ways I could get from home to American Bar with a car, um, with a bike or walk, with a train, and the other, I think, is bus, but this must have been my work in progress one. 
Um, and after I've done that, I ended up with this final map where I showed up four different routes. Um, the most important part of that was reflecting on all of these different routes and thinking about why I choose to take them and why not. And just a couple of examples of that is, for example, with the car example, even though it's the quickest one, um, it doesn't quite make sense to go to a bar with a car because you have to think of getting back home, so not a desirable option. With a train, um, from where I start, it's a one-stop train ride, but you have to walk 25 minutes to get to that, which can be quite frustrating. Um, and with the bus, um, I was mainly complaining about um, infrequency of public transit in Belfast, where you sometimes have to wait a long period of time to connect two buses. So even though that could be a good option, the way things are, it currently isn't. And I can walk option is my absolute favorite. Um, it is a lovely little path through the river, so it's quite pleasant. But I do live in Ireland, so rain can be quite a frustrating factor that comes into my decision when I'm trying to get to the American bar. So what I did with this month after I had created it is I shared it on Twitter as a part of the challenge. And I was quite pleased to see that I wasn't the only person feeling this way. I had some recommendations to share this with my local councillors and bring their awareness to this issue. And I also found that some people felt quite similarly. So this is an issue that a lot of us are affected by and feel similarly about. Um, and with that, I hope that you have taken away two things from this talk. Um, one is visualizing individual experience can be insightful and fun, and maybe that could be applicable in research and newsroom environments. And data art is a tool that you can do, use to do that with using custom GeoJSONs and annotations within the locator maps. Thank you so much. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, that was super, super interesting. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat, everyone. Um, I think it was interesting that you made this distinction between the objective space and the subjective place. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. think I've heard it before, like so clearly communicated. Is there, like if I want to learn more about that or our attendees, where would be a good place to start? Hmm. Um, I'd say the, there is a book called Space, uh, I called Space and Place. I think it's quite straightforward. It's an older book by Yi Fu Chan. Um, it's the one that I listed at the bottom of that slide once these talks are live. Uh, that would be a good starting point. I think he's one of the earliest authors to make that distinction. But since then, I think it's a conversation that's been quite loud in cartographic sphere, um, especially if you've heard of terms like um, counter mapping or mental mapping. Um, there's a lot of interest in mapping things that are not so easy to map. Uh, so mapping relations, mapping senses, um, sounds, that, those sorts of, sorts of things. Um, so I would say looking up those terms will lead to quite good sources. <laughs> so interesting. I think I've actually done some mental mapping without knowing that it's called like that. So it's, it's quite to put like a name on that. That's good. Um, as I guess, I mean, you're a trained cartographer. You know lots of map tools, I would say, um, like QGIS, maybe, or ArcGIS. Um, like, these are more complicated tools for, for creating maps, but why did you choose DataWapper for this map and not, not one of the more advanced uh, mapping tools? Yeah, um, I think one of the really good reasons is that like seeing Luke's map was actually, I think, one of the first things that triggered how I wanted to do this. I was like, well, there's a tool. It's possible how to do it. But I think also in the context of third day map challenge, uh, it is a really fast paced challenge. So my priority there was creating something that I feel good about and proud of on a short term, but quite a high pace. Um, and I think with those slightly more complicated tools that can take a bit longer. Uh, another thing is um, the, like, the range of choice you have with those tools is a curse and a blessing. Like if I could sit there playing around with everything, I could spend way longer than I needed to, whereas with the wrapper, those restrictions were actually quite helpful in terms of getting something quickly that I feel good about. I see, thanks. Um, and I guess the last question I have, I'm not sure if you've mentioned that and I missed it, but what is actually now your preferred mode to go to the American bar? What, what do you end up doing? Um, so I moved but it actually didn't really make my life any easier. It's quite pretty similar. And that's the question, I love this bar, but it's so hard to get to. I often won't go to it unless I'm going from somewhere else. 
so I'll quite often only go to it if I'm already in the city centre and then I only need to take one bus. Um, so it's a very serious problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I really hope they um, improve the public transport in Belfast. Um, well, thank you so much, Sharon. Um, that was a great, great first talk of the day. Thank you. Thanks, bye. All right, let me bring up to the stage the next speaker, Philip David Priest. He's from the German publisher Epen Media. And when we started organizing this conference, I knew I had to ask Philip if he would be up for giving a talk. I mean, his team creates these super highly customized, highly designed, dare I say, like crafted locator maps. Uh, and Phil and his colleagues uh, really get everything out of Locator Map that's possible. So he's the perfect speaker for this blog. Uh, and I've been much looking forward to this talk today. Philip, welcome. The stage is yours. Thank you very much for the warm words at the beginning. Um, I already see my slides, so I think we just can begin. Um, so very much welcome to my talk about Locator Maps and about exploring new territories, how I called it. So this is not a keynote or something, but I want to show you six maps, like six projects and six hacks, how we uh, tried to achieve it or really to, uh, uh, we really achieved it. Um, first one word to me, I'm Philip, a German data list based in um, Munich. Um, and I work for Epen Media, which is one of the biggest uh, German networks uh, of uh, publications. And um, the Germans might know the, German, the Munich Merkur or the DZ uh, or the Frankfurter Rundschau, and the international audience might know uh, BuzzFeed Germany. So yeah, let's just begin and so a bit about me and my team a bit later. So question is, what I'm talking about? And the answer is, let's talk about six maps and hacks um, in the next minutes. And I really want to invite you to a bit of a journey um, to yeah, locate the maps a bit beyond uh, the, the horizon. The first is about uh, markers and how to improve them. Uh, the second is about to uh, integrate mini charts for more context to your map. The second is um, better map keys or more beautiful map keys. Um, the fourth is um, from raster to vector map um, into locator map. The fifth um, hack is about uh, grid maps. And uh, the last thing I want to talk is about um, maps as infographics. So this is all about, um, and so yeah, just let's begin. Um, and um, first of all, um, one word about who is talking about to you right now. You know I'm a journalist, great. And what's more about me, just a very bit. And this is um, what I want to show you. So I thought like what could explain me and my team better um, when it's all about locator maps. And the answer is show it on the locator map. And so this is uh, uh, me and my uh, fantastic teams. Shout out uh, at this place, um, data journalism team in uh, Munich. Um, you see, we are in the middle of Bavaria, Germany, and um, we are. Uh, our office is like um, between the Oktoberfest, which is all about beer, and the Hofbräuhaus, which is all about beer. And we are somewhere in the middle, but um, yeah, our drug is, is not beer, but our drug is data. And we really love to work with uh, data wrapper and locator maps and trying to push the borders. So if you are in Munich, just come along. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, about uh, data journalism team. And now just dive in in the first example. And this is how to first example. And uh, my first example will be the one about invasive species and how we achieved it. So first, first example is uh, you see here on the right, I will always show um, the, the result of our work. 
and then we go through some steps uh, in how we made it possible. So on the right side, you see a locator map, which is about invasive species, uh, which uh, like uh, crowded uh, through uh, Germany. Um, and this is what we wanted to show on a data visualization. Um, and the thing was, we had some kind of interactivity, which we wanted to highlight because people often don't grasp the point. There is some additional interactivity. And the second, second thing is that we wanted to show um, like a bit more data trans transparency in this case, but we don't want like to let the text flood all over the data viz. And so it's not um, uh, that the map doesn't have any place anymore, uh, space anymore. Um, and this is what we did with like the info button you see on the left top side and you see on the top down side, oh, there's a emergency car just passing by. Welcome, good work. Just waiting a second. Okay. And on the very uh, top um, down and uh, right bottom, you see um, this call to action, which says, uh, uh, click me for more information um, to give some like um, call to action feature on this side. And this is how we did it. Um, first of all, we host uh, the hand and the info image asset for ourselves. So we, uh, we don't use the, the data wrapper icons here, but we use our own design ones um, and host it on a public server. And therefore we are able to um, integrate it into a data wrapper. The second thing is um, we uh, use a new marker with um, um, opacity zero, so it's not visible, but it works, still works that you can like hoover it. And the second thing is um, some HTML and CSS code to make it possible. And how this works in the reality is a small snippet on the next slide. So here on the um, left, you see the text field code um don't blame us we are not front end developers at all if it's not a perfect snooky but it really works <laughs> um and the middle is about the tooltip field so these are the two fields within the data wrapper marker and you are able to um customize code here in fantastic ways we'll show you more later and the result is you can hoover over uh, this um, um, info button here, how we call it, or info marker, and you get additional information, additional insights, something we want to uh, tell the interested readers um, about the locator map um, on the like on the on the first interaction. Um, okay, so this was the first example. And now we are just on the second map and the second hack. And this is, has been one chart about um, the people in the hamas Syrian war. And we wanted to show, and the challenge was like to yeah, give uh, like a, a, a more insight about how the people live there and how much how people live at a special place and like grasp a bit of insight about what's about this um this terror prone region in this kind um and our we ended up that it's not enough to just show man one map we uh we needed more and this is why we utilized um we always call a mini charts and um, you see it here on the bottom of the data visualization. So you see here, um, it reads um, where the people in this region uh, really live. And uh, um, we show like bar charts and some figures about the um, three countries um, on the map with some more context and a bit more context like uh, assisting the main map approach is um, something um, which we find very crucial because um, our maps are always embedded in um, lots of articles about Israel, for example. And so um, the data visualization must give enough context on itself. So even if we don't have like two or three other visualizations in place. 
And how did we do it? First of all, it's very much important to identify um, the, the data or visual idea to support the map. And our answer was here, uh, like you show on the bar chart. The second is you utilize the notes field for custom code within data wrapper. So the, just, just the um, usual um, um, notes field, which you usually use for, for yeah, additional text or something. And you can inside uh, insert <laughs> or hijack how to say it, um, HTML and CSS um, and yes, lots of it. So here, um, it's quite a bit of um, code, as you see, but the result is we have a small, sneaky mini chart about the Israel war. And on the next page, you see some more mini charts we already um, uh, produced. So they are always on the bottom of the main map, um, and they also uh, give more context or try to give more context for the um, for the main map. For example, you have here something on the on the left side, like something um, like a, a chart within the chart, so to say. Um, we have like a, a ranking. We have something about forest fires, uh, wildfires, and the comparison um, and um, some more ranking. Um, and this is just with um, data wrapper. This is only data wrapper, just with HTML and uh, CSS. Um, it can reside in something which, yeah, is somewhere in it's a small front end project, so to say. I show you on the next slide. Um, so on the um, top right, you see um, the uh, mini chart, how it um, resulted in the end. So it's about um, coups uh, in, in Africa and when they have been successful and when not. And you see the, um, the source code um, like in data wrapper for this. It works fine. It works um, fast. You just have to build up like your library and um, have an idea of uh, the, the visual idea, like um, what your goal of this mini chart shall be. And then you can make wonderful, nice, uh, at least I uh, find them um, beautiful <laughs> and hopefully insightful um, to um, enrich and contextualize your map by this mini charts. Um, this have been um, now mini charts, and now we are on the third map uh, hack. Um, and the third map hack I want to talk about is about map keys. Um, in a lot of cases, the, the default data wrapper map keys are uh, great. Um, and in some, we have the feeling we need more um, a more customized approach, um, an approach which um, is, um, yeah, more related to the uh, key map matrix. And you see it's, uh, two examples on this slide. And the first one on the left side is about um, the um, renovation of German railway um, in the next years. And each year has a specific color code. Um, and this is what we already um, yeah, like coded, so to say, with HTML and a CSS to make this possible for um, this data visualization. Um, and on the right side, you see something about the, the, the flood in Germany uh, at the beginning of this year. And we customized this map key um, to um, to yeah to make to make the the inside um, more um, like uh, graspable for all uh, the readers. Um, the thing is, one advantage is that you can like integrate the map key inside the uh, the the core map, like the main map, and therefore you have more space for it 
Yeah, you don't need like space on the top or below the map or something, but you can really like use parts of the map which just would be gray or not um, insightful um, and use this space for your um, uh, key map metrics and therefore the, your better uh, map key. And these are two examples for map keys um, um, from me and my team in the last uh, month. And I want to show you some more on the next page. So here you see um, a protest map with like weeks of protest on the left side um, and uh, coded with uh, different colors. Um, and some uh, two smaller examples, which is about the gender pay gap from um, 0 or 4% to 22%. Um, and this third, the, the third example is about this invasive species again. And this is also just CSS and HTML and um, is our approach like to customize um, map keys. We don't like code it from the scratch for each map key, but we have something like a code library right now. So we um, can use them over and over and again and just customize it myself after we build it once. And so these are map keys. This is my transition slide when it comes to the next, because uh, right now we talked about three maps and hacks which were like um, improving the map components. We talked about markers and how to improve them like with buttons. We talked about um, the um, uh, mini charts um, for more context to your web um, visualization. And third, we talked um, about um, the map keys, which is also like, which also like is, um, assisting the, the main insight um, of the map. And now we're here because we really love locator maps and we also wanted and still want uh, to push the borders when it comes to the main map. So really the main map storytelling um, in locator maps. And this is why this slide is all about, because for us it works with a combination of data wrapper and a bit of map pre-processing, which sounds complicated, but it must not be complicated at all. I will show in the next slides. So this is called about um, um, QGIS and um, other map processing tools like MapShaper and, and um, the mentioned uh, JSON-IO. Um, and I want to show you what is possible yeah, beyond the classic locator map um, functionality. And so we just start with the first example. This fourth um, data visualization is about the flood in Libya. And you see here on the right side, it shows the precipitation um, in litters, which um, uh, took place in Libya at a, a certain time. And we wanted to show you um, the readers um, um, and like give a, get a grasp the, the, the feeling about um, what it's all about this um, event. And the and challenge was that um, this data like precipitation and lots more um, comes um, often comes with uh, satellite data from NASA and Copernicus and European institutions and stuff like that. Um, and this is a raster image and raster data. And of course, you cannot import raster data in locator map. It just says, hey, please give me a vector and or a GeoJSON or something I can like cope with. That's completely fine. I know why. <laughs> and so our uh, challenge is um, to convert this raster image 
into something data ripper likes and locator maps like and um, is able to display it. And this is um, how we did it. First, we obtained the raster satellite data. So uh, in this case from uh, NASA can be uh, other sources. Um, and then you mainly use a function which is called raster to vector. And therefore you're able to have this, just this raster image like a TIFF um, and make some pre-processing like saying, okay, the, um, um, the, the black um, squares um, mean high precipitation and the gray mean lower precipitation, um, kind of this. And you convert, convert it into layers, into seven layers, so to say. Like the map you see here on the right consists of seven layers. And um, if you converted it into um, these geodations, you're able to style it with data wrapper. And then you have a wonderful um, map in locator map above this um, flood in Libya. I show a bit you more about you here, uh, like behind the scenes. On the very left, you see a, yeah, a traditional raster image. You can just download by a lot of sources. In the middle, you see the vectorized image, like you see the different uh, precipitation zones. Um, we, we converted with Cubis in this case. And on the right side, you see the area markers um, which we imported. So for every precipitation zone, one locator map marker, and afterwards we styled it. And um, yeah, the result is this um, Libya map. So great, great way for um, storytelling when it comes to a specific scope of data. So next is grid maps. This is my fifth example. Um, and you see here on the right side, boom of barbershops it reads. So we wanted to display the, um, like the occurrence and the existence of um, barbershops in Germany as a boom, because it's much more than, um, than before. You see my beard here, it's barbershop made, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and our approach was to display the barbershops in Germany. And after we analyzed the data, it, it was, um, we had like, I think 2000 coordinates, um, like, um, yeah, single, single markers. And as you know, with locator maps, you cannot import more than 100. So it was virtually impossible to get them into locator map but we wanted to show the barbershop boom with locator maps. Um, and therefore our challenge was um, to, to display it. Um, and we wanted to display it with a better representation than administrative districts, because you know, um, there are small German cities, there are big German cities. We have like uh, big districts and stuff like that. So, um, you 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 lose some focus um, in in this special case at least when you when you try to um, display it on a yeah for example a choropleth map of German districts, and this is why we like um, tried the approach with um, a grid maps, and this is what I want to show you now. So. Um, the first thing is we imported a white base map. So this is our custom approach. This is just a geodeson just covering the whole world and makes the rest of the base map just invisible. <laughs> uh, and therefore you just see nothing in the first hand and then you can um, apply other um, maps, so to say. And the second thing is, of course, I cannot go in very much detail here right now, but you join the, the coordinates uh, of this 2000 barbershops with a grid map data. And um, afterwards you have, um, for every um, category, you have one uh, marker again and um, import it into locator map. 
and then you have a grid map within locator map. There are uh, three small panes. I want to be transparent at this point. Um, there is a small distortion which results to the coordinate reference system. Um, is fine for Germany, we think, but it doesn't really work when you have too close and too too much detail on this. Um, and the file size, I think it's more than one uh, megabyte. And of course, um, yeah, this can be so much of a topic if you must be really important. But these are grid maps. The result I'm very happy with, and you're able to do storytelling with a different approach. So my last example is about maps as infographics. And you may be a bit of shocked like of this, because of course, this is not our real world. Um, but this is world like customized do-it-yourself world, because these are in this uh, um, QGIS um, um, screenshot, and you see um, some European countries we just applied on this map. And why do we do such a thing? Um, you see on the next map, because here you see another example for this maps as infographics. We um, had a project to display the seven kingdoms, like seven royal houses uh, in Europe. And um, the challenge was like just using a usual choropleth map would not be fine because, mm, yeah, they're very, very much far away to each other. You would have lots of space unused and we just really want to have focus on this um, and uh, therefore we customized here um, still this uh, white maze map workflow again and then we created a new um, a cubis layer um, and therefore we like um, arranged the countries uh, you show here on, on a QGIS map. Um, and we styled it, and this is a result in the end. So we um, like um, customize um, maps here that we can use as infographics to, yeah, because we, th uh, we think it suits the, um, the message best here. So just coming to the end and a quick start. We talked about um, six maps and hacks, like on the um, big picture. Um, and um, I want to, don't want to leave you uh, behind <laughs> with some um, tips to a quick start at this point. And these are five things. If you now think, okay, locator maps is cool. I knew that, but it can be even cooler a bit and how you just could like go out of the office right now or your home and or stay at home and take your um, your MacBook um, and just start with um, your uh, next locator map project. And these are um, my would be my quick start tips for um, your next locator maps. So first would be uh, find a place to self-host your image and icon assets. As you know, right now, it's not possible to customize them. Would be a nice feature request. Uh, looking at you, Data Wrapper team, uh, love from this side. Um, and um, from now, it works fine for us if you find a um, public, um, public web server or your own web server and host your icons and your images on yourself, and it can make your maps better at the first second, uh, from the first second onwards. The second tip is um, mini charts. Why not finding an approach to uh, enrich your um, map data with um, some visual nuggets or patterns? Um, the th third is not a no-brainer, even after one year. Use AI and GPT-4, especially the OpenAI Plus, uh, like the Code Interpreter plugin, is extremely good in front-end coding. And even if you're not a front-end coder, and we are not front-end coders at all, um, you're able to um, 
code your own HTML, CSS projects, and um, yeah, um, bring all your visual ideas to life within um, Data Wrapper. The fourth would be uh, QGIS uh, or other geodata tools. If you want to make uh, some parts of um, map um, um, projects um, and uh, support some map ideas, uh, you need a bit of uh, map preprocessing. And this would be my first approach. Uh, other tools, always just free and um, open source to just start. And just start is um, like my maybe most important um, next step, start small, because even minor improvements like map keys can already boost your map for um, uh, me to say. So coming now to the end, um, thank you very much. And um, hopefully I uh, was able to provide some tips and insights about uh, we um, produce and make locator maps. Um, and so now thank you very much and happy hacking with locator maps. You're still on mute, Lisa, I think. I am, yes. Thank you so much, Philip. That was super interesting to, to see. And I believe the audience really liked your maps too. We had like uh, some good comments here. People really liked the mini charts. Um, yeah, and everybody thought it was amazing. We do have some questions from the audience. Uh, Demona Grot wants to know what tools you use to reduce the size of the GeoJSON files. Um, there are several approaches. The easiest one is just using MapShaper, which is a free um, software tool um, and a web tool. And therefore, you can really like it's called simplifying. Um, and therefore, you can really and you you just click through the through the um, to the scale of simplification. And you really see the result in the end. You see when your your um, dehydrations um, break or don't look appropriate anymore. And therefore, and you can just export it as a geojson anymore. So very simple approach is um, map shaper. Um, and then uh, there are advanced uh, possibilities like, as I mentioned, QGIS, which has also more advanced um, mechanisms for simplifying. Um, and if you want to do it on the very, yeah, the hardcore way, so to say, there are co uh, tools called Minify um, uh, GeoJSON, uh, GeoJSON Minify, like typical uh, canoe, it's called. And therefore, you can like um, kill the the last um, numbers of each coordinate, and even make your GeoJSON smaller if you probably won't need it. So it's like um, simplifying and trying to reduce the amount of um, the, the like the length of coordinates, and in the result you can really, really highly compress um, the the geojsons um, and have more possibilities and more horizon for like um, getting them into uh, the locator maps. Thank you. We have another one from Taylor Johnson. Will you provide code somewhere for some of these examples? I would love to look behind the scenes. Maybe a blog post or something upcoming? Yeah, good good, good question. Um, I will uh, just um, write, write it down. And maybe this uh, could be something like a, um, a blog post um, which um, where I would have like a bit more space and time um, and give some more detail. Yeah, great idea. I agree. All right. And the last question from the audience. I imagine you mostly use the data wrapper API to publish these maps. Raphael Cox asks, given how much pre-processing you need to do. Um, yeah. To be honest, yeah, not really, uh, <laughs> because yeah, I mean, um, yeah. it, it depends. So um, I showed, yeah, yes, we use the data wrapper API, 
Um, the examples I showed you right now are like a customized um, uh, one timer, so to say. We just like update with the um, more current data from time to time. These are like the, the ones for real storytelling on um, articles, on the home pages of the websites, um, and the apps and stuff like this. Like, this is our really our storytelling approach, so to say. And um, then we have, of course, the different approaches, um, like when it comes to dashboards or um, yeah, more, more um, frequently um, updated data. Um, and then we, uh, or we have like, we have live map for, um, for Ukraine and Israel. So we have like an automatic nightly workflow, which updates our um, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian and Israel um, locator maps. And this is where we um, build scripts to um, update them via the uh, data rep RB. I mean, thanks. Uh, thanks. I have one last question because I'm, I'm really wondering these, Maps are so designed, but you're part of a newsroom. There must be some time pressure, right? Like how much time does it take to create these maps and how do you balance maybe time pressure deadlines with creating these beautiful maps? Yeah, this is always a balancing because of course, especially if um, the story type or the, the mini charts, for example, if we do have to develop it from scratch, of course it takes uh, longer and you just cannot like take it from from anywhere and use it again um the thing is it's um it's a, it's a mixed mixed thing here so if we have like um a breaking news situations like first day on the israel war or ukrainian war uh, for example of course you sometimes have to like um um Re rely on your your more your standards or your mini charts you already developed or something um and um then there are projects which are not so time related or it um you can like um plan it for the next week or something and then of course we have a bit more time um for doing this uh, the um the, the point is like really we try to um, gain time by building our own code library um, and our coding standards um, and so for the yeah always the next visualization um, which really has a deadline you can be somewhat fast or faster at least and get on a, sp a specific sp uh, pace um, and um, yeah, then we have a bit more free room, uh, free uh, space, like for uh, exploring new possibilities. And because we don't want to stand at the point we are, but uh, right now, but of course we want uh, have a lot of other days uh, and ideas um, to uh, get even further with lovely locator maps. <laughs> It sounds nice. We're looking forward to that. Philip, thank you so much for, for joining us and explaining us everything about locator maps and answering our questions. That was super insightful. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Um, that was the sh very short locator map session, one hour locator map block uh, with talks by Sharon and Philip. Next up uh, is a bigger block about the creative use of data web uh, hosted by Gregor, who's the co-founder of Data Rapper. Um, we still have two minutes. I want to give us a short break, two or three minutes. Um, I'm going to start the music and we'll be back in two or three minutes.
Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so, uh, before we get started with the next block, I have to say, wow, what a conference. Um, so while I have the opportunity to speak here, uh, I want to say how much I enjoyed this conference so far. And I want to just shout out a big thanks to everyone involved, especially to Lisa, uh, who did most of the organization. And um, yes, and I am very excited to be hosting this next block on uh, creative uses of Data Wrapper. Um, Although to be fair, we've already seen a lot of very creative uses in, in the other sessions. Um, there will be six speakers in this block um, and there will be a lot more hacks and tricks for getting uh, more out of Data Wrapper. Um, yes, uh, organization-wise, uh, Lisa already mentioned, we have a bit of a longer buffer time after this block, so we don't have to rush through the Q&As. Um, um, please, uh, as always, write down your questions in the chat. Uh, we will collect them during the sessions and um, bring them up after the talks. Um, our first speaker is Patrick Stolz, uh, who works at Der Spiegel. Uh, I think he's been working there for over eight years now. And since last year, he is uh, co-heading the data and visualization department. Um, he has a big research background in city planning, and uh, I really enjoy his team's outstanding work, uh, for instance, related to climate change or uh, energy adoption in Germany. Um, and I'm really, really looking forward to his talk. And um, uh, the stage is yours, Patrick. Thanks a lot. Thanks for, introdu for the introduction. Glad to be here. And yes, I can see my slides. This seems to work. Um, I want to talk about satisfying data wrapper workarounds. Uh, what I mean by that, I'll, I'll get to it in a bit. But first, uh, a few words about me. Uh, my name is Patrick Stotz. I'm a data journalist and I'm a data viz and cartography enthusiast. So that's how I got into data journalism in the first place. And I'm using data wrapper since 2019. So I already have quite some experience with the tool. And what I'm going to show today is not only my work, uh, but the work of this whole uh, fantastic team I'm co-leading. Uh, this uh, is the team you see on the picture. This is our department of data and visualization at Der Spiegel. Um, okay, so why data wrapper workarounds? We at Der Spiegel, we use data wrapper for our print and online publications and we produce a lot of charts. It's roughly, I've counted uh, a few days ago, roughly 50 charts each week. So on the top right, you see um, like our current archive is 12,500 charts, which sometimes is overwhelming if you're looking for something that we try to organize it in a way that you can find your charts again, uh, sometimes successful and sometimes not, but that's not what I want to talk about. Um, that's just how much we produce. Um, and in general, if we, if we start with the project, um, of course, our first question is always, what's the best way to visualize something? We don't start thinking in tools that because that limits uh, limits you to what certain tools can do, and it's not the way you should think about visualization. So the first question is always, what's the best way to visualize something? But then the second question for us always is, can we solve this in data when we've got an idea? Um, if we can solve it in data wrapper, we say, yes, go for it and do it in data wrapper, or at least try. And if we can't do it in data wrapper, then we use the other tools we got at hand, which is Adobe Illustrator, which is AI to HTML, QGIS, Mapbox, Velty Blender, and others. And uh, while doing so during the last uh, yeah last years, um, we found quite a lot of uh, satisfying workarounds uh, how to do things in data wrapper that we didn't think or hadn't hadn't thought that would be possible. And that's what I want to share with you today. Um, it will be seven examples and it will be from like small, uh, not very complex, simple uh, things to rather complex and sophisticated solutions. Um, the first one is something uh, that is useful uh, in every reporting, everyday reporting, and it solves the problem you've got here at hand. So this is uh, a chart uh, maybe with a sample headline and it is a survey you want to show a chart. Um, and uh, you got uh, the results of the survey and the subheadline. The, pre the precise question is important for the chart, but maybe you also want to include some notes on the methodology. Um, and this text is already quite long, it's getting longer and longer. 
And there might be more information that is not key, but you want to include as well. And if you do it like this, uh, then you can see, okay, this is getting quite cluttered. It's not looking good. Imagine it on a small mobile phone and it's something you don't want to read, but you don't want to see. Um, but there's a solution for that. And the solution is uh, this here, using additional hidden nodes. Um, you can move uh, the information uh, we've had in the subheadline that was too long into the node section uh, and include it in an additional node. Additional node means uh, you're going to see this chart as it is on the left when you open up the, and it's loaded on the page. And as soon as you click on the small arrow, the section expands and you get everything that you see on the right below the, the triangle opening up. And you can, uh, you can include information that is not key in this section. Um, it is hidden by default, can hold a lot of information. You can write text, you can even include symbols and other elements, which I will go get to in a bit. Um, and uh, yeah, hide it by default, make the chart, uh, make your chart compact, but also have this additional information right at hand. So how does this work? Um, this is the code behind this uh, example you've just seen. It's just a very small block of HTML code. It's, um, you see it there in the, in the black section. Um, and this code uh, goes into the uh, into the notes field data wrapper. Um, and actually, this is not a data wrapper feature at all. It's an HTML feature. It's called an HTML summary tag. Um, and the HTML, HTML has the functionality of um, displaying this kind of information and expanding it when you click on it. So that's what we are using here and including it in data wrapper. And there are two more additions which are quite useful in my eyes. Uh, and the first one is to improve visibility a bit, because normally if you hover over the small triangle um, and uh, you, you read there's additional information, you've got your pointer, your ordinary cursor, um, but it's better if you have a pointer because the pointer indicates that there's something you can click on, something that expands. So if you do the CSS style cursor pointer, you can turn the whole HTML summary tag into something that's uh, at first sight uh, clickable and interactive. So that's a small, small thing here. Um, uh, in the style section of the of the HTML tag. And uh, as mentioned before, you can not only use it for text, but you can also work with HTML, CSS, and so on um, in this notes section. But that's something we will see in the next example. So that's our second example, how to build custom legends. And I want you not to focus on the chart that's in the middle. That's something you're probably, a chart you're all familiar with, it's the warning stripes. Um, you can do them in data wrapper. This is a data wrapper chart. Um, I didn't invent it myself. There's a blog post by data wrapper, which is super useful, uh, which gets, which, which leads you through all the steps to build the uh, warming stripes, the climate stripes uh, in data wrapper. So that's not what I want to focus on. I want to want to focus on this section here, which is the custom legend I've included in the, in the warming stripes, because warming stripes, they don't come with a legend most of the time. They are understandable without a legend, but maybe it's nice to have one. And it's just an example. It's uh, it's usable and applicable for many other chart types and situations as well. So how is this done here? Again, it's just a small uh, piece of code. Um, again, it's uh, HTML code, uh, and uh, it loses uses HTML symbols uh, like the black dot, uh, which we are using here, or you know other HTML symbols like the copyright symbol, and there are stars, and there are even like um, areas with hazards and various types of HTML symbols. If you Google for them, you find a lot of them. Uh, they work in all browsers. Sometimes they look different browsers, so that's worth checking. Uh, but you can you can use them for many occasions in data wrapper. Um, and you can also color them. And that's uh, how we achieve the look we've got here uh, from the blue uh, to, the, to the dark red, depending on the temperature. And this color uh, comes from the CSS style and the CSS style is uh, here in the span style sections, the colors in hex codes, those are the, this is the, the place uh, where the, the color comes in. Um, and then you got one point uh, after another in the beginning, in the end, you've got our, uh, our Celsius as written as text. Um, that's already quite it. And apart from that, you can also um, use uh, more custom CSS, um, which is font size, line height, and, uh, things like margin. Um, this is just uh, the, the, um, the point where you're trying or playing with styles and doing small adjustments until everything looks perfectly right as you want it. 
Um, but the basis here is uh, the basic here is uh, using HTML symbols to improve your legends and to yeah improve readability of your chart. Um, this comes with a caution because uh, these kinds of HTML uh, symbol legends. Uh, they work in dark mode, uh, but they need some extra work. Those uh, two charts here actually are not mine. It's a screenshot from the data wrapper blog where it's all explained. Basically, um, when you're uh, when you're including CSS style as here, for example, uh, with the text field before in the chart, the text field before uh, has one style um, with a CSS class of height and dark and one style of the CSS class of height and light. Um, and depending if you're dark mode or light mode, one of the two is hidden, the other is visible. And in this way, you can uh, you can, you can uh, make sure that in the one chart, the text is white, the other is black, and that you can get a lighter gray and a darker gray, depending if you're in light mode or in dark mode. So if, you, if you're using HTML symbols and colors uh, and the like uh, in CS, CSS styles, Make sure to check your dark mode if you're using it and make sure the colors uh, are not only translated in the correct way in the chart, but also in your HTML or in your, in your CSS styled uh, legend or subline. Okay. What if you get um, situations where you build maps and you need even more complex legends that you go beyond that what we've just seen? So these two examples here, are maps that we've published uh, during the last uh, years. And uh, I don't want to focus on the maps themselves, actually, but I'll focus on the legend. So those two legends you see here uh, below the maps, they are, uh, as you can maybe recognize, they don't look like data wrapper maps because these kinds of, of legends uh, cannot be generated by data wrapper, but they are custom made. But still, they are integrated directly uh, into the data wrapper chart. As you can see here, there's a header, there's the map, there's the legend, and then the map footer. Um, so everything is within the data wrapper chart. How do we do that? Um, again, uh, here's the code. Um, what we are doing here is using HTML again. Um, and in this case, is using the HTML background property. So to explain everything that's part of the legend, it just starts uh, with a bold text. The bold text is the heading of the, of the legend. Um, then there's a, um, an, another HTML block, which could be a diff as well. I don't know why it did use a B tag in this case. Um, and this uh, element holds, uh, holds the, the background image, actually. It's the property background uh, URL, and then the background URL you're including a link to, could be anywhere on the web. This is the address where we are hosting our own uh, images. So you can publish them yourself, host them yourself on your server. And by using this uh, workaround background URL, you can include them below or above or anywhere in your chart. Um, and the rest you see around it, like the floating width, height, and uh, the back background size, background repeat, margin top, those are the other CSS properties you have to play with to make sure it works for uh, for your website, for your positioning, for your orientation, depending on mobile on, or on desktop. Many things are possible. This is what we came up with that worked uh, in this case if a legend's got a certain aspect ratio between height and width. Um, so that's uh, that's pretty much it. And uh, yeah, loading an image from a URL and playing around with positioning and size. And it, it, uh, it highly... Um, it makes it makes it much more you get much more possibilities to use custom legends for your maps. Uh, speaking of locator maps, we've just heard a talk of Philip with, who showed uh, some examples which are similar to what I want to show in my fourth example, um, and that is how to use locator maps as color breath maps or as line symbol maps. So um, if you look at those those two maps uh, here. Uh, no, that was too fast. Uh, those two maps here, uh, they are data wrapper locator maps, but they are not used like locator maps are normally used. So show cities and uh, point, points of interest, uh, small location information, but uh, they are used to show more complex data. Uh, the one on the right is, uh, is um, traffic situation, traffic analysis for Barcelona, um, how the traffic changed in certain areas, certain roads. 
and one on the left is public transportation around Hamburg. Um, Areas around Hamburg you can reach within 30, 45, and 60 minutes around the central station. And this is called uh, actually an isochrome map because it shows the areas which you can reach within a certain period of time. And both of them are a data layer put on top of a locator map. So how do you do that? Um, in this case, the, uh, the important thing or the little, the little uh, secret is uploading one layer at a time. So if you got your traffic analysis done, you've got all the roads and every road is in the category and has a certain, in this case, reduction um, um, or in, in, an increase in traffic. Um, you cannot upload them all at one time to data wrapper. If you do that, you get just one line marker. One line only have one color. So that destroys the idea of showing different streets in different colors. So what you have to do is separate them uh, in your uh, in your geospatial software. For us, it's QGIS, or it does, doesn't matter actually in which software you are you are working. You have to export your geospatial data as different um, as different and import them one at a time. Uh, in this case, we imported all those lines. I think it's like nine different categories. You see four of them with the different shades of blue uh, here in the view. There are more with shades of red. Um, and we get two more, uh, two more, which are areas, actually. This one is this, I think it's a market hall. It's, it's a building. I think it's a market hall. Uh, and the other one is an highlighting for a certain section of the road. So those are areas put on top of the map, working with some from transparency. You can all style them individually with color, with outline, with filling. Um, and in, with, by doing so, you can choose some kind of a mix between a location map, because you're using the location map for the background and for the inset map on the top right. And a data map, a data map which in this case is a line symbol map, and showing the results of your analysis uh, on a data wrapper locator map. Uh, next up, this uh, is a chart which, uh, on the first uh, on the first view, you wouldn't think is a data wrapper chart. Um, it's a stacked area chart of the share of uh, the area of Germany that suffers from drought over time. Um, over five decades, starting in 1970 or 1971. Um, and each of those uh, sections you see here is a, an ordinary state area chart, but everything together is made in data wrapper and is combined out of six different charts. I, I'll advance one more slide and you see what we did there. Actually, we stacked state area charts. <laughs> Um, we use one chart uh, for the legend. Uh, so the first chart is only the legend. Uh, there is data in there, um, but the, the data is empty. So only the chart, only the, the legend is included in the first chart. Um, then you get five more charts, which are the stack area charts, uh, ordinary simple data charts. And all of them are combined in our content, combined in our content management system. They just uh, added one after another without any interruption or break or spacing in between. Um, and that's already quite it. Um, important is that uh, you use the legend separately, because if you don't, the legend is part of the first chart. Um, and you want to have a, a specific height for each chart. Each chart needs to have the same height, so the data is scaled properly. If you include the, the legend in the first chart, um, it's part of the height calculation. This legend gets pretty long on mobile, so it destroys the whole idea of every section having the same height. So that's why we exclude uh, the header from the first chart. And also, this is why we didn't include a legend, um, another legend uh, footer, a footer with the source, which we have at the end of our charts, we did not include because it's the same thing. It would be part of the calculation of the height. If we exclude it, we can make sure it's all the same height and we can all combine these five or six charts into one big stack of stack area charts. Example number six, um, how to fake a chart zoom effect. Uh, probably most of you will recognize this chart, even if you don't speak German. Um, that's the that's the work most of us or many of us spend uh, the last years. It's infection numbers, COVID infection numbers, starting from the beginning of the pandemic until we finally stopped updating them, which was in March 2023. Um, and over time, this uh, the period gets very long uh, within the data, uh, within the chart, and it makes the chart hard to read. So we wanted to have a zoom effect, and we wanted to work in data wrapper still. 
because uh, it was just easier than to to, co to code it um, by ourselves in a custom example, which we did later on, but still we found out it's possible in, uh, in Data Wrapper. Um, and that's uh, how it works. You've got this small magnifying glass, and if you click on it, uh, you're going to zoom to this section of the chart and see the chart how it is on the right. If you zoom again, uh, if you click again on the magnifying glass, it zooms out and you're back at the full uh, view of the, uh, of the chart. Um, and uh, how does this work, this little piece of magic? Um, actually, those are like two separate charts. So you've got one chart with the whole period and one chart with the last three months or six months. Uh, I can't remember anymore how, how we did that. Um, and they are connected uh, via an icon. And this icon includes an HTML link to the other chart. So it's just H10, href with the URL of the other chart. Um, important, set a property target self. That means if you click on the link, it will not open in a new, uh, new window. It will open in the same window. And it leads you to the other chart. Um, the other chart has a reference as well back to the original chart. And you can include this small plus and minus symbol to make it sure the readers can um, which is zooming in, which one is zooming out. And we are highlighting in gray, which is the area we're going to zoom in. Uh, and both of, this, both of these together are two separate charts that look like one chart and which have a zoom effect, which of course does not exist in Data Wrapper, but you can build it. And that's already quite it, uh, but I got one more thing. And this is something I find really funny because I didn't, I wasn't responsible for the whole project, but I just got the beginning and it was really, really excited how it turned out in the end. Um, so this here is the, um, the, the thing we wanted to build. This is not a data wrapper chart. This is what we what we had as an example. Um, is a, those are passing passing maps or passing charts. I don't know how, how, to, how they are called by their, by their common name um, with NFL data. And for different quarterbacks, uh, they show from quarterback position, if he's uh, passing the ball, how high is his uh, success rate um, throwing the ball to different sectors of the football field? Um, the darker the color, the better, the, the higher the success rate. And you can also see how many attempts there are, how many were successful. And this is really insightful if you want to compare um, football uh, quarterbacks in football. But how to do that in data wrapper? Um, our first try was, well, this is a heat map actually. Um, or not, not much different than a heat map. Why don't just try a data wrapper table with heat map columns? And well, it kind of works. Uh, you got this table here. It's not pretty at all. Um, you got the information in there, but actually this is nothing we would like to present to our readers. Uh, a lot of them probably wouldn't understand it. So we were not really pleased with the result. We, did, we wouldn't have published this version of the of the visualization would have chosen something else than data wrapper if this was all we could have done in data wrapper. Um, so that was the first try. Um, then we experimented some more and we found out this solution here. So uh, the, the, the heading of this uh, chapter is hidden powers of custom maps and that's what we use there. Um, this is a custom car graph map in data wrapper. So we created a geo-chason with the shape of a football field or the, the sectors of the football field here. Um, we were lazy, or the colleagues that did it were lazy. They asked uh, ChatGPT for their help and asked ChatGPT to generate a geo -chasing file, which the which should given uh, dimensions, upload it to data wrapper, um, and then use labels, text annotations, and an arrow as a line, an arrow without an arrow in the end, so it's just a boring line to show the line of scrimmage where the, where the ball gets thrown into, into play and the name of the quarterback in, in text. And you get the, the, the text annotations and labels of all the data and you get a tooltip. So this is really, yeah, it's it works. It's this chart here uh, turned into a data wrapper version of it. And I was quite pleased and thought, well, that's that's really cool. Uh, turned out nicely and I went to, I went to a vacation and during vacation, the article got published. And when they published the article, um, oh, I'll skip that. When they published the article, it looked like this. And this, uh, the emojis were my reaction when I saw it. And I thought, uh, well, how did they do that? Um, and what they did actually is they turned a, a custom corporate map into a corporate map with 3D effect. 
um, and which is, I think it's kind of insane, but it, um, there are three steps involved. Um, one more, one more than in the example we've seen before. Um, and uh, it starts with Illustrator actually, because the colleague who got involved then, uh, he's got a graphic design background and he thought, well, ChatGPT can draw a GeoJSON, a boring GeoJSON, but I can draw a GeoJSON with a perspective and I can make it more look like a, like a football field. That's what he did, Illustrator. He exported uh, the file from Illustrator as a DVG file, which is normally used for CAD, so for construction work. Um, but still, you can export it out of Illustrator. You can import it into QGIS. And one thing, once it's in QGIS, you can export it as a GeoJSON, load it into Data Wrapper, and from there on, it's ordinary Data Wrapper work. And you can join the data depending on the ID of the individual fields. Um, and I'm going to show you, so you believe me, it's actually the way we did it there. And it's actually a data wrapper chart. I'm going to show you the, the steps that were involved. Um, this is the football field as my colleague uh, sketched, uh, sketched it in uh, Illustrator. So just some rectangles with the perspective, um, which is shown in gray, having the numbers 1 to 12. That's, and you're opening them in QGIS and you have a, a map uh, there in the background. You see that the center of the DVG file that you imported is at, uh, at zero. Um, the zero coordinates <laughs> where Null Island is supposedly. So it's just west of Africa. Um, and from there on, you can export it as a GeoJSON. Um, it looks like this in the import dialog on your custom map. You still got the idea and with the, with the ID, and with the ID, you can join data. And that's how we did it. We did it for 10, 15 quarterbacks. I don't know. So you could do it by a script, automate it. You could even update it every week. You could make a permanent project out of it. But that would have been more than we dreamed for. This project had this beautiful maps, uh, which looked maybe even better than the example we had in hand at hand when we started with it. And we were able to do it all in Data Wrapper because I forgot to mention for this project, we did not have much time. Um, it was necessary to do it within a few days. Um, we could not start coding ourselves, designing something very, uh, which takes a lot of time, but we were able to use uh, Data Wrapper, use custom well. We are quite pleased with the outcome. Um, and now I've talked a lot. I've talked quite fast. I hope not too fast, but uh, I thank you a lot for listening. Um, and I still got time, or we still got time for questions, I think. Yes. Thank you, Patrick, so much for your talk. Uh, I am really uh, uh, impressed by the use of custom custom base maps for this. I've I would have never thought of this. Um, we have about seven minutes for question, uh, I've been told. So um, uh, let's see. We got a couple in the, in the chat. Um, one, let's. Well, maybe I start with one that I that I have myself because it's a curious. It's curious to me. Um, you said the first step in your in your decision making of whether to what tools to use for your graphics is uh, the question: Can we do this in Data Wrapper? But you yourself showed that this is sort of like a, a a tricky definition. Like, I mean, you can do a lot in Data Wrapper if you include custom base maps and all the scripting yeah. that that can get involved. Like, was is there like a how do you how do you decide like what is the the amount of effort you want to put into doing it with data wrapper rather than starting with a custom solution right from the start yeah it's a lot of gut feeling i would say and experience for the for the football field example we were sitting together as a whole team with people from different backgrounds uh, some of them data journalists some of them graphic designers we were speaking about a certain project and what we had in mind what we wanted to achieve and we had the restriction, we didn't have much time. So we thought about, okay, that would be cool. Uh, this is the outcome we want. Brainstorming session, can we do it? And how can we do it fast? And then uh, in this session, someone said, okay, let's try let's try Data Wrapper first, if we can do it in Data Wrapper. Um, because it's quite, we will see the outcome or if it works or not within one hour or half an hour. So that's how we tried the, the, the table solution. The scatter plot we tried quickly as well. And we tried Try the very first rough version of the of the um, custom car breath map, and we, we've seen okay that might work. And from there on, we thought okay, how much how much more time that will cost to make it uh, look perfectly or the way you want it to look. 
Um, so it's step by step using data wrapper first uh, for for testing it out and then making a decision to to go on with data wrapper or not. But of course, you have to have in the back of your mind how much time will the uh, solution in one software or another cost. And um, of course, if we don't decide uh, data wrapper first, but data wrapper within a few hours first, of course, those data wrapper solutions that take that take days. Uh, they themselves are not very fast, and are not the first choice if you if you're out of time. Yeah. I see. Thank you. We got one question in the chat that is about um, how can you add? Uh, it's from Maria. I hope I pronounce this correctly. How can you add filtering functionality to the custom legends that you make? Filtering functionality. Um, I don't, I don't think we really use filtering. Um, you, you can, maybe she means the, the light mode, dark mode part. Um, I'm not sure. The light mode, dark mode is... Uh, I'm, I mean, perhaps it's about this, like uh, when, the build -in, when you use a built-in legend, legends and you, you hover over the legends, then some, sometimes things uh, get like highlighted in the charts or maps. I, ah, maybe it's about okay. this. Have you tried if to, to do that? that then you can't do that anymore. No, that's a functionality right. that comes to standard, uh, standard yes. data wrapper legends. As soon as you do the custom legend, there's no interactivity between your legend and the chart itself. That's something you have to, uh, yeah, you have to, uh, to get more. Well, you can't use anymore as soon as you use a custom legend. Yeah. So there was one question about the uh, the city uh, switching in in the ex in your fourth example. How did you uh, uh, do this? Like, is this also yeah. using these link links or? No, that's like a custom piece of code we developed over time. So we've got um, a little tool uh, which we can use for a tab selection where you combine can combine three, four, five different tabs uh, for different data wrapper charts. You can even do a combination of data wrapper charts and other elements, iframes, HTML, AI to HTML elements. So you can uh, navigate through different charts uh, or elements via tab bar. And the same thing also you, uh, exists with the dropdown op option. So you can use it for like 10, 20, 30, 40 options in a dropdown list, uh, but that's a uh, own coded solution, uh, which just references data wrapper charts. So it's built by ourselves and just, it's one level on top of data wrapper. Mm, let's pick this one. This, I think it's about the same chart and it's about uh, uh, for the city line chart, it's from Nandor. Um, from VDR, how you, uh, you import and styled all those markers manually. Um, did you did I hear that right? Um, and it sounds super tedious for iterating mm -hmm. on designs and wondered how you had any tips regarding the workflows for this. So in, in projects like this, we do the style in QJS. So we have one layer in QJS. We style it uh, by category, define all the different colors, and then there's an option, option in QGIS to export with one export uh, to export every feature or every feature category into a separate layer. So it's just one export and you end up with, in this case, seven or nine different layers. Load those nine layers manually and you, uh, ju you adjust the colors manually in, in data wrapper. That's right. Um, if it was a project that would be that you use regularly, that would maybe be the option to do it uh, with the API to automate stuff. But if it's just seven, eight, nine layers, just do it by hand. It doesn't take that long. OK. Uh, we got uh, two more questions about the custom base map. Uh, one is uh, someone asked, uh, Taylor Johnson asked, uh, how, how was the prompt that you entered in ChatGPT for this? Was yeah. it complicated or just straightforward? Mm, actually, my colleagues did it. I didn't do it myself. It was along the line of, uh, imagine I want to draw a football field uh, as a geo-chasing. Um, it has to start at coordinate 0.0, .0 go to 100, 100. It has to have 12 fields with uh, dimensions of 10 or 20 or anything. And please write the geo -chasing file with the geo -chasing, uh, specifications. Um, that is quite it. Uh, it should work. Maybe give it a try. Um, this, these kinds of things, ChatGPT knows how a geochasing has to be formatted. Uh, it should be easily doable. And then the last one uh, from Patricia. Um, is there a way to hmm. omit QJS? Um, Probably. You just need a, you would need a piece of software that translated DMG file into a geochasing file. There should, there should be other solutions. Uh, just, just Google for, uh, uh, for yeah. 
Google for that, Tur turn a DMG into a GeoJSON file. I, I bet you'll only find other software solutions as well, and not only, Q and not only QGIS. Okay. Thank you so much, Patrick, for your time um, and for My the pleasure. talk again. Uh, and we're now uh, heading over to Lalo and Sander from uh, TATS and NDR, NDR a, a German broadcaster. Um, yes, he's been working at TATS for a very long time, over 14 years, uh, and has been focusing on data journalism for, uh, since uh, 2020 or something. Um, I'm very uh, curious to hear about your uh, uh, your custom tool, the, the custom tool or custom tools that you build around Data Wrapper. Um, like as a tool maker, we are always excited to see when our users build their own tools uh, around Data Wrapper. So, um, without further ado, uh, stage is yours. Uh, yeah, I I hope you can hear me now. Uh... I'm having a bit of trouble with my internet connection, which I've been having all of this week. And uh, so I've just switched to a mobile hotspot. I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, so um, assuming that you can hear me, uh, I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes presenting a very, uh, very simple tool that we created to solve a problem that's, um, not a very big problem, but it gets very tedious. Um, it's related to code and HTML buttons, and um, this is what we did. <clears throat> so the the problem that we had is uh, sometimes you have very similar charts that uh, you want to sort of present together, but uh, Data Wrapper doesn't really uh, really allow you to do this. Uh, the example I've got here is how. Uh, renewable energy uh, systems are being expanded in Germany. Uh, one chart is for solar energy and one is for wind energy. And we wanted to link them uh, link them together so that uh, they look like they do in the next uh, in the next slide uh, with this little button and the, in the top left uh, where you can uh, switch from wind to solar uh, as you like. And so this problem isn't one that uh, really exists because Data Wrapper has already. I'll try and unblur my um, my background. Um... I actually can't find the uh, find the setting at the moment. Um, so we're going to be looking at a bunch of code in here. Um, please don't try and uh, uh, try and screenshot uh, the code um, because uh, I'm going to give you a working copy of the code that we use uh, later on, and uh, and then you're welcome to uh, to just copy it and use it. Uh, this is um, uh, so this is what the code looks like. Uh, that data wrapper um, suggests uh, that that you use. So the um, the end effect I think Amanda showed yesterday is a chart like this, where you can switch between Spain, Germany, Italy, UK, France, and Europe. Um, and basically, this is what we're what we're working with. Um, this is a set of um, HTML uh, links uh, which are put into the in, into the description box in your data wrapper chart. Um, the details really aren't th that important. You can go uh, look them up on the on this um, on this blog post on the Data Wrapper Academy to see um, uh, to see how how to do this in detail. And uh, so ba basically, each one of the each one of the charts needs its own button, and it's uh, basically the same HTML code every uh, each time. And there are three things that are varied. One is the chart ID of the, the chart that you're linking to. One is the label, um, like the, the piece of text that says Spain or Italy or Europe. And uh, in some cases, or you could if you wanted to uh, vary the color of, of the button that you're creating. <clears throat> um, and once you have you've made this code, you just add it into this description field for each of your charts, and then basically you have this um, the, this sort of chart where um, where you can click through from one uh, one to the other. 
uh, the only problem we had uh, with with the solution is that all of these uh, these buttons look the same. So if uh, if we're looking at this chart, we don't really know which one of these uh, which one of these charts we're looking at, except if we start reading the title and we uh, we see oh uh, this is Europe. And uh, if you've been using buttons on computers, you know that there's a very sort of intuitive way of doing this, ma making it look like the button's been pressed or somehow differentiating the, the button that, uh, that is currently active uh, from the other ones. And, um, and another problem that, uh, that arises over here is um, each, all of the buttons are clickable. So even the one, uh, even the one uh, for the chart that we're looking at, so if we click on that button, um, uh, basically it just reloads, uh, reloads the file. The problem is if you want to have a different button for each of, if, for each of these, uh, or if you want to have a different uh, different look for the button whenever the chart is active, you actually have to start varying the code for each of these buttons. So the, 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 the code for the active button needs to look slightly different for each of the other ones. And that means you have to go through all of these charts and change change one button for uh, in in the HTML code each time. And uh, this is actually a very good example of what's really really annoying with creating these buttons. Then is that you have six charts which each have a unique set of code, and in each of these uh, bits of code, you need to vary uh, different parts uh, uh, parts of the code. And so basically, you need to um, in the worst case, write 36 bits of HTML uh, link code to create this. Um, and uh, when you start doing that, you start getting into, into problems like you forgot to change the label. So there's Spain twice, uh, but which one is the correct Spain and which one is, uh, is actually Italy? Um, you forgot to change the chart ID. So um, you have Spain and Italy, but both of them are, sh are showing the same chart. Um, and you need to find out which one's the correct chart. Um, the chart ID and label don't match, so you have a button for Spain and Italy, but uh, the Spain button is showing the Italy chart and the Italy button is showing this Spain chart. Um, people like me who don't do a lot of uh, work in HTML um, have the problem, they messed up the HTML, but which bit, I have no idea. I need to go look through this whole thing again. Um, I fixed uh, I fixed something in one chart. Um, the the link were the uh, like a uh, link that was swapped out. I, I fixed it. Um, now I have to do it in all of the five other charts. I need to go through there and uh, and fix the uh, the link swap there as well. Um, I want to exchange the order, so I don't want uh, Europe to be at the very end. I want Europe to be at the at the front. Uh, I need to go through the code for all six of these charts uh, to to move that from one end to the other. Um, so the, the, I'm going through this uh, just to sort of try to give you the feeling that I had um, when uh, when I came across this problem while, while trying to link a bunch of a uh, bunch of charts. And uh, what I thought then was um, this really isn't something that I need to be sitting down and doing for like an hour. Um, I can write code uh, that can loop through this and write this for me. Um, in the correct way for each of the charts that I want. And as we saw earlier, um, as we saw earlier, there are actually only three things that I need to vary on on code that looks very, very similar. <clears throat> so this is the solution that we came up with for the NDR. Um, the Tuts who I work for, they have a, a similar solution or we uh, basically implemented a similar solution at Tuts first and then at, uh, at NDR. Um, and e each of these um, sort of use the the, uh, the style guides for each of the uh, for these organizations. Um, this is a chart of election results. So each of the buttons is uh, is colored to match the color of the um, of the party being shown. Um, there's a vi visible queue um, uh, showing for um, for which chart is currently being uh, being shown. Uh, the uh, the chart for SP SPD and um, each of these eight car, uh, each of these eight eight charts now has its own unique HTML code because in each of these charts a different button is being shown as the active button. So um, so this is an example for when we really sort of test the uh, or where we really appreciate the tool that we have because it, um, as I said earlier, um, if you have 
six buttons, you're writing 36 uh, pieces of code. If you have eight buttons, uh, you're writing 84 pieces of code. And there are so many ways to uh, mess up um, label, uh, label, chart, and colors um, in these. And then you have, you're debugging for like ages. We need three, uh, three inputs to automate this. We need to know uh, we want a list of charts in the order that we want to link them. We need a list of labels. What, what, do they need, uh, what do we want to call them? Europe, Spain, Italy, and so on. And we need a list of colors um, in case we want to uh, change around uh, the colors for each button. But we can also just like repeat the same, uh, re repeat the same color if we want to have the same color button for, for each of the buttons. And then basically what a piece of code does is uh, loop through each of the charts and uh, loop through them again to create for each chart a, 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 the own, its own particular combination of active chart buttons and not active chart buttons. So the active chart button basically generates the button uh, for the chart that is currently being shown and the not active chart button uh, shows all of the um, all of the um, other buttons, and uh, it basically it's uh, it's two loops within each other, and it go uh, and it runs through this and um, uh, and creates the buttons for all of them, and then uses the data wrapper API to push that that HTML code into the description field, and uses uh, uses the data wrapper API to republish that um, uh, that chart. Um, the, this is code that uh, you'll get at the end of the talk, so um, you can screenshot it, but you'll uh, you'll also get it like as a working uh, piece of code. Um, so what? Uh, so I usually use Python for everything, and uh, what Python has is a library called Streamlit, which can be used to make uh, a sort of simple uh, simple form web app uh, using the library called Streamlit, um, and there's also a platform where you can host these. Uh, these apps. So basically, what we have is uh, our button tool um, on the open internet, um, where where you can add the uh, the chart IDs, you can add the labels, and you can uh, choose uh, choose various different um, different colors which match up with our um, internal style guides. Um, and you can uh, you can also add some uh, some um, some extra text for the description field. Um, you need a passcode because, um, as I said, this uh, this app is on the open internet, and we don't want anyone to just go in there and start linking our charts. Um, you get the passcode uh, when I show you the when I personally show you the uh, how to use the app. Um, so uh, so basically, only only users from within our organization can can actually use it. And basically, what happens is when you filled all of this out, you press at the at the bottom. It says um, click here when when you can uh, when when it can start, and uh, and then it runs through this. Uh, like I think the the eight buttons that we just looked at, uh, they get generated for all eight charts within maybe 10, 15 seconds. Um, and uh, and basically at the end of that, uh, all of uh, all of the charts are republished with all uh, all eight of these buttons. Um, it's extremely fast compared to uh, to having a human uh, do all of this. Um, with the web app that we uh, that we use at the end, you don't really you have, don't need any knowledge of uh, HTML or Python, and um, there are very few errors that you can make. And if you do have errors, you can uh, you can correct them by just rerunning um, rerunning the app again with the correct inputs. Um, what we have is we have hard co coded styles and colors. So um, if you look at uh, look at this, you can actually see that there are actually a number of shades of each of these colors uh, at, uh, in use here. You only add the red, but it it'll add a transparency layer to the red um, for uh, for. Um, for the uh, the center of the button, um, and when it's the non-active button, it'll actually be a slightly different different color of red. Um, it does all of those calculations by themselves, so you don't have to sit there and uh, and transform your hex codes into RGB codes and add transparencies and stuff like that. Um, um, you can correct uh, mistakes and make changes in seconds. And what we can also do is. 
um, uh, standardize other things. Like we started noticing that um, we don't want buttons like uh, buttons which have multiple words uh, to uh, uh, to be on two sides of a line break. Um, we want them to uh, to break uh, completely as as one button. So you can add things like non-breaking spaces and non-breaking hyphens, um, which are hard coded into um, into this app. Um, uh, so you can you can enter your uh, your um, labels with with us. Um, with a space, but it, it'll be uh, uh, converted into a non-breaking space. <clears throat> so um, I've prepared a, a Google Colab um, notebook, um, which coder people who use Python among you can sort of open up and um, and look at the code and recreate the code using your own styles if you if you like. Anyone who's not a coder can will actually just see the form over here, which uh, which works exactly as I described our our app. Uh, you basically need to uh, add the add the inputs uh, at the top and then run and run both cells with Shift Enter. <clears throat> um, Colab uh, Colab is. Google's way of hosting um, hosting uh, uh, coding notebooks. So it works a bit like sharing a Google document. Uh, you uh, you basically copy it into your own drive, and then and then you can start writing in there. Um, what you need to do uh, to use this uh, to use the notebook is generate a data wrapper API token. Um, it's not safe to to keep your API token in your Colab notebook. Uh, even though it's in your drive and so on. So create create an API token, use it, revoke it after using it. Next time you use, uh, you use this, um, uh, create a new API token. Um, this is set up uh, in a way that it, uh, it'll produce the, um, the buttons as shown on the data wrapper um, tutorial blog, except that non-active buttons will be in uh, in gray and the active buttons will be in the color that you define but you can also just like go into the code and change the html if uh, if you like uh, and if you have uh, python developers on your teams uh, you can ask them to create like a streamlit app or something but mainly um I'd uh, love for data wrapper developers to steal my code and uh, make this into like uh, a function on uh, on like the data wrapper main product because then I don't have to maintain the sloppy code that I wrote for my teams, and uh, you can do a lot of uh, other stuff um, wh which might make it better. Just uh, like having a preview as uh, as you create the buttons and so on, or maybe not having to hack the buttons into the description field, but having your own uh, having an own uh, button field or something where uh, where those buttons could appear. And uh, that's my talk. I hope it saves you a lot of time uh, in future when you want to um, uh, where when you want to link link up uh, charts. Thank you so much, uh, Lalan, for your for your talk. Um, the, the struggle is definitely real. Um, um, we are a bit behind of time, uh, so we have to skip the questions, but there haven't been any questions so far. But I still want to show some of the some of the comments uh, quickly. Um, so we have, uh, I hear you, Lalon. I did all of this by hand. <laughs> um, so, um, and um, I feel these examples so much. So, um, and I, I myself also had to do this uh, manually and, um, great tool that you built. And with this, we're going to head over to Ben Cates from the Urban Institute. Uh, hi, Ben. Uh, hi. Urban Institute is, I think, a think tank based in Washington. Uh, ben has a business administration background and also co-hosts the DataVis meetup in Philadelphia. Um, and I just hand it over to you now, Ben. Awesome. Thanks, Gregor. Uh, thanks everyone for having me. Really excited to talk about extending data wrapper tooltips with Svelte. Uh, this has been a, a, a joy of mine to put together. So uh, I'll go through the content relatively quickly. We'll have time for questions at the end. Uh, I'll introduce the project and what the Urban Institute is. I'll talk about chart interaction events. I'll talk about Svelte as well as the basics of sending data wrapper events to Svelte along with some closing thoughts and even a template repository for you to check out at the end. 
Great. So the Urban Institute, uh, like Gregor said, is a policy research institute in Washington, D.C. Uh, we have over 700 employees, uh, tons of researchers looking at policy areas from health to economics, tax, racial justice, really uh, tons of different areas. And our data visualization team builds custom data tools and features to communicate this research. Uh, we're a team of front-end web developers that use Svelte, D3, and Mapbox to build these tools, but we also support the Urban Wire blog team that uses Data Wrapper for communicating research insights. I'll be talking about this project today. This is a project where researchers at Urban were looking at immigrant families in North Carolina and looking at their demographics, since immigrants notoriously have a hard time accessing what we call safety net programs like uh, medical assistance and nutrition assistance. The requirements for this application were to have a map showing population by county, along with lots of demographic information right below it. So things like, are there English proficient speakers in the household, uh, the country of origin for immigrant families, things like that. We decided to use Data Wrapper for this project to cut down time on developing a custom map in something like D3. So uh, the technical setup for this, uh, there's the Drupal CMS, uh, shout out to our web development team, and then we iframe our Svelte application on the page. In the Svelte application, this is made up of a bunch of different components. The data wrapper iframe is in its own component, and then there are many information display components right below it. Now the question that I'll be answering in this talk is how does this happen? Thankfully, the data wrapper team has provided a number of chart interaction events for us to leverage from the data wrapper iframe. Using this browser API, the post message method, we can access different kinds of interaction events within our data wrapper chart. The team has also put together an events JavaScript file to make things easier. And what this looks like after you've loaded the JavaScript on the page, you can add a listener for a specific type of event and then make use of that data in the browser. Now, you might be wondering, what is that event.data that comes back? Well, it's actually all the data that you've loaded into your data wrapper chart in the back end. Here, I've only provided a, a few pieces of information, and you'll see how more information gets loaded into the app later on. As far as the visualization events, the interaction events that are available, it's most click, mouse enter, and mouse leave events, although there are events for if you click on the social share button or the source of notes below your data wrapper chart. Great, so now that we know about interaction events in data wrapper, let's talk about Svelte. Um, this is by no means an introduction to Svelte or web development, but uh, definitely encourage you to uh, go Google. I'll give you a definition. I feel like the cool thing to do in conference talks these days is to ask ChatGPT for a definition. So Svelte is a modern JavaScript framework that compiles your code to highly efficient vanilla JavaScript during build time, unlike other frameworks that run in the browser. This is akin to like React. This approach results in smaller bundle sizes and better performance. And this is my favorite part down here. Svelte also uses a reactive programming model, allowing developers to write declarative code that reacts to changes in the underlying data. This is the special sauce of Svelte. A Svelte file or a component file looks something like this. First, you have the JavaScript section, your HTML, and your CSS. It's sort of like a mini application all in one file. And then uh, for example's sake, I have here a, a component that has the title next to some visualization. What this might look like in a very basic example is our title and our data loaded in the script area using that dollar sign colon, that's that special reactive syntax, uh, as well as rendering out the uh, those variables in the HTML section. Now, one of the best parts of Svelte here is that we can iterate through our data using this each block. This is really a declarative programming style where we're producing the information we want to be rendered on the DOM right in the code that we're building. If you're used to vanilla JavaScript or D3 and writing imperative code, uh, this is a pretty different paradigm for, for creating uh, web applications. All of this is compiled into JavaScript, HTML, and CSS at build time, and then you can deploy that to a server. If you want to build a full stack web application, you would do so with something like SvelteKit. Uh, the data wrapper product is actually built on SvelteKit. 
All right, so what are the basics of sending a data wrapper event to the Svelte app? This is our project once again. We're just gonna be focusing on two main components, the data wrapper iframe component, as well as one of the information display components. You could see that you would replicate the data display component again and again for, for the different uh, sections. A little architecture here. Our app.svelte parent houses our two main components. And then we go, and every time there is an interaction event in data wrapper, we set what's called a writable store. This is Svelte's secret sauce. This is, this is the reactive store functionality of Svelte. This will house our selected county from the map. Then our current data, our readable store, will take in that county information and display all of the information that's in that external tooltip. And now you might be thinking, well, if it wasn't in the data wrapper chart to begin with, where is it? Well, it's actually in a JSON file in the application itself. This JSON file looks something like this. Our primary key houses the unique identifier for the county alongside all the information we want to be displaying in our external tooltip. In our store file, we import our writable and derived store uh, functionality from Svelte. Then we import our lookup data, that JSON. First, we export a writable to the rest of the application. That's that selected county. And then we export a derived read-only store. And the special part here is we're looking up in that JSON data that we imported, we're finding the relevant information based on our selected county store. Our population.svelte file, the, one of the files that displays the data, um, here we're importing the readable store and as well as some helper functions. Now from here, it's just HTML all the way down, right? We're, we're just creating some basic HTML here, but we have our reactive variable that's being imported and uh, referenced and dynamically updating every time that uh, read-only data comes through. Then in our iframe component, we're importing that events JavaScript that the data wrapper team has provided, as well as the event dispatch functionality from Svelte. This is a way to expose events to the parent. In this case, we're exposing uh, events to the app.svelte parent of uh, the parent of this component. What that looks like is we first create an event dispatcher, and then we use that data wrapper event listening functionality, in this case, region click, and we're dispatching a similarly named event uh, to Svelte. Of course, at the end, we have to import our iframe. So that would be uh, sort of all everything you get from the data wrapper interface, and you're used to importing into your web pages. OK, cool. So let's bring it all together. First, we import the writable store. Then we import our two components, and we put them on the page. What I'll call out here is where we have our dispatched event, region click, where we're setting the writable store to that FIPS code. That's that unique identifier that we have in the North Carolina map. As soon as you do this, everything is now wired up and interactive. And so confetti time, right? Like this is, this is it. Um, this is really the core functionality of this application. So just some closing thoughts and resources. You know, I sped through that pretty quickly. Um, you would repeat this process for more data display components. Um, we decided to add a dropdown for accessible navigation. In this application, you would bind that writable store to the dropdown. Some things to watch out for. Um, you could pass all of that lookup data via the data wrapper interaction uh, event data, but be careful of bloat because you will increase the load time of your data at wrapper iframe if you keep adding more and more data to it. On the other hand, if you have a lot of data locally in your application, you might want to consider doing some fetch requests to an API or a database. And reminder that in this project, this is a one-way data flow. We're not controlling data wrapper visualizations from outside the iframe. In the future, I'd love to experiment with the same approach, but with also a dropdown to switch between an active data wrapper map. Um, love to use, utilize the new data wrapper web component. 
And thanks to the Der Spiegel team, they talked about that patch method that they're experimenting with. So that's something I really want to check out. Definitely need to thank the project team, Brittany, for creating all the wonderful designs in Figma, and Wes, the, the writer on this project. Thank you both, and Jenny Hamatal, the research team. So what I'm going to do now is paste in some links. And the GitHub repository for this project is, let's see if that comes through. OK. Um, the GitHub repository for this project is publicly available, but I've also created a workflow template for getting started here. Um, this is actually a Svelte Kit application that I am hoping uh, sort of follows more best practices with JS doc type implementation, as well as prettier. Uh, I think in the next few weeks, we have a data at Urban blog post coming out about this. This is our technology blog at the Urban Institute. And you can find me on LinkedIn or the Data Visualization Society Slack or the Unwrapped Slack uh, for any questions that you might have. Um, so yeah, I hope you get your hands dirty with some external tooltips in Svelte. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Uh... I'm really excited to see this. Uh, I, I remember when we built these uh, custom events and we sort of did it uh, out of a gut feeling that it would become useful someday to someone. Uh, and I'm, re I'm really glad that it was useful. And I uh, just want to say if, if, uh, if there's any other like things in Data Wrapper events that you want to get, uh, get updates on, I don't know, because we, we didn't really have a, a like, Besides the obvious, someone clicks on a bar or someone hovers over something. Like, if you have more ideas or anyone else, please share them with us, um, and we will add more events to see more of these uh, custom uh, uh, extensions of of data over charts. So um, we have a bit of time for questions. Um, please post them in the chat. Let me see if there's anyone in here. No. I mean, I, I've prepared one question that is like, uh, I wonder if you have experienced uh, or if you have tried out the um, the web component embeds in 12, but you said that's something you've, uh, you uh, we want to be exploring in the future. Yeah, I'd like to see how this interaction event uh, API uh, works with the web components. In my initial testing, it was um, a little less straightforward than the iframe. I think just to, based on how Svelte renders out components, um, it, how Svelte renders web components in Svelte components, which I think it's just a little weird with rendering. So still more work to do there. Yeah. And I guess we can also, also uh, see if there's ways to uh, use the direct contact with a uh, web component uh, embed as opposed to having this iframe in between, um, yeah. something we will put on our radar as well. Um, so uh, if there are no more questions, wait, let me see. There's, uh, there's some some praise. Uh, great stuff. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> and uh, someone wants to try this. Raphael wants to try this in view as well. I guess it will work the same. I, I yeah, know. yeah. Um... You know, I've used React a bit. I could see it being relatively straightforward in React. Haven't used Vue a whole lot, but same thing. Um, you're really following the same workflow here. You want to extract the event and assign that to a piece of reactive state in your application. So however you do that in the JavaScript framework of your choice, um, you can get to the same result. Yeah. There is one question, I guess it's not to you from Natasha, but it's to the data wrapper team. Any chances extending the same events uh, to other map types? Um, as I said, we, we are happy to add more of these events um, uh, if they're useful. So I, I'm, I'm just gonna say reach out to the to the support team, uh, support the data wrapper and uh, tell us about like what you would love to, uh, what sort of events, user events you would like to listen to and we will, see how we can fit it in. Um, and uh, oh, there's a question from, from, our, <laughs> from our development team. I, I can see where this is going. Uh, so Antonio asking, uh, what made you pick Svelte over alternatives? 
Yeah, so most of the time our data features feature uh, custom visualizations. Um, we find that Svelte is the best tool for creating data visualizations on the web. Um, for the reasons I mentioned before, the declarative code paradigm is really uh, exactly where it's at. Obviously, the data wrapper team agrees in using Svelte. But um, yeah, in just keeping with the same paradigm uh, or using the same JavaScript for this application, we didn't want to uh, go with a completely different technology, even for a project like this one where we weren't creating any custom visualization. Yeah. Um, maybe last question from uh, Simon. Simon Jokos, uh, thanks for the talk. Is, he's wondering if there's documentation on how to do this with web components. I mean, we've talked about this a little bit. Um, I actually don't know the answer, but I've, I know that there are some people from our support team in the chat. Uh, and they will. I, I'm sure they will dig out the link if there's any. And if not, then uh, I'm sure we will look into it um, to see if we can make this event uh, uh, connections uh, easier in web components as well, in the web script embeds as well. All right. Um, again, thanks so much for your talk. Um, and I guess we hand over to the next uh, session. I'm very uh, happy to have CJ Skinner uh, as the next uh, as the next speaker. Uh, she's the director of uh, the graphics and data visuals at the Star Tribune, uh, a local newspaper from Minnesota. Um, but I looked it up; also one of the ten biggest papers in the U.S. So um, she will talk about the creative use <laughs> of our scatter plots, uh, which I'm very excited about. Um, uh, we've also seen a lot of. Uh, love for the scatter plots and all the things you can do with them in, in, in some of the talks in the past days. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to what you will show us. Um, have at it. Thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> I, I have a little bit of a rough voice, so you guys will have to forgive me. Um, in fact, actually, Gregor, I'm going to try to share my screen instead. Is that OK? Instead of using my slides. Oops, hold on, hold on, hold on. Ah. Okay, can I get a confirmation that people can see these? <laughs> or can I make them full screen in some way? Oh, uh oh. Playing with my window size to get no black border. Okay, okay, we're just running with scissors here today. There we go. That's a little better. Okay. Um, yes, I am here to talk about scatter plots. I'm going to talk about um, about four that we um, have done here that uh, didn't look like scatter plots, really, not the traditional way that you might think of them. Um, <clears throat> so yes, I live uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which for some folks who don't know where that is, I made a little uh, data wrapper map to show you. Um, but yeah, we're the largest local newsroom in the upper Midwest in the US. Um, and our team of about five graphics reporters and then a handful of other data and developer folks use data wrapper um, probably like every day um, to uh, for a lot of different things. Um, but my favorite hobby lately, actually in the last couple of years, has been trying to make as many different types of unusual charts as I can <laughs> in there. Um, and so that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. Um, so I'm here to talk about scatter plots. And this is kind of the traditional thing I think we think of when we think about scatter plots where you've got two meaningful numerical quantitative dimensions of a data set uh, that we want to compare against each other. And we're looking for trends and correlations. And scatter plots are really great for that. But this is not the kind of scatter plot I'm going to talk about today. Um, what I'm going to talk about is how we've used the flexibility of that tool to make things like calendar grids and timelines um, a lollipop chart, and then this lovely colorful one in the upper right there, um, which is sort of like a souped up column chart, uh, which we used to show individual songs in Taylor Swift's uh, song catalog, which was sort of a pet project of mine uh, last year. So I won't go through all of these, but uh, these are just some, some examples. Um, and actually, the Data Wrapper blog, which is fantastic, I'm sure other people have talked about it, 
uh, was the first place that I saw some of these unusual uses of the scatterplot tool, including this one, which is um, a periodic table of elements. And then uh, this one, this was the one with all these dots kind of aligned on lines with the ELO rating kind of along one axis that made me kind of realize something very key about what you'll hear me say probably multiple times today, which is um, it's just a grid. <laughs> and this was kind of a revelation to me that if you kind of arrange your data in a way that creates coordinates out of the data, and then you remove the axes, you just end up with like this blank canvas to play in. Um, so I'm going to cover, I'm going to try to cover four of these uh, kind of different charts that we've used this blank canvas. Um, and I'm just going to spend a few minutes on each one. So bear with me. Hopefully we'll get through all of them. <clears throat> okay, so this was probably the first chart that I did um, to experiment with this. And as you can probably tell based on the topic, which was COVID cases in Minnesota, um, this was looking at data for the first year of COVID. So this was about three years ago, exactly, um, where we wanted to show that first year of cases and sort of the rise and fall um, in Minnesota. And I really wanted to do it in some kind of calendar type of view, but I couldn't really quite figure out at first how to make this work. So um, what I did is I, this was the data, and this is the data in Data Wrapper. Uh, and so we had the, the date, you know, month, day, year. And what we did is split them out into the year, month, and day columns. And then you'll see that the case is on the right. Um, and the, the days were pretty straightforward. Those are just the, the day of the month. But the months ended up being a little tricky because we were starting in the third month, March, and then going four, five, six, seven, you know, and then it would circle back around to one. So we had to convert these into some kind of other number to sort of be a proxy for the month. And because I wanted my calendar to start at the top and go down, I just started to actually start my data at zero and then go into negative numbers. So zero, what you'll see here for month were, um, was March, and then negative one for April, negative two for May, et cetera. <clears throat> And then the cases, the daily change, were each of my dots. So this was how we set the axes with uh, the day on that horizontal and the month on the vertical. Um, and when you do that, just by default, what you get is just this lovely grid of dots. You know, we've got our axis on the bottom, our axis on the left side, um, just a bunch of dots plotted in a grid. But what really changed this for me was just turning off the axes. So turn them off on both. And in this case, which in hindsight, I'm not sure that I really had to do, but I also turned off the grid in the background. Um, and just doing that uh, kind of opened up this, um, like I said, this sort of like blank playground where then we get this empty slate of, of dots where I can kind of control the positioning and the spacing based on the size. Um, so that was kind of the, the realization for me that I thought, ah, this can work. So then of course we can adjust the size of the dots for the number of cases. We reduce the opacity so that we got controls for the overlaps and the circles, and then did some color adjustments there. Um, but then we, uh, we use the annotations to kind of replace all of those default labels. And then you can have like a high amount of control over what they say, how they're styled and the position of them um, in the grid. So instead to kind of replace the grid and have a little more control over where I wanted it, we use the highlight ranges tool. Um, but you can see here that instead of using um, for the in days of the month, you know, like the five, 10, 15, 20, replace them then with annotations that um, were a little bit more almost like human readable, logical, like the fifth, the 10th, the 20th um, of each of each month. And those were just um, text annotations. So you can see here where those annotations uh, live. Normally we think of annotations really only in those kind of highlighted um, dots on the chart, like the November 14th and the March 21st with the pointers. But we found that using the annotations, even just to replace labels, is actually also a fantastic use of these of this tool. 
Um, the other nice thing that I'll say about the annotations, if you've used them before, and this again took me, I think, a little while of using annotations a lot to sort of figure this out, but because those are placed based on the X and Y coordinates on the canvas, um, they can match up exactly to the coordinates in my data. So I didn't really click and drag them around the canvas and just sort of hope they would look close. Um, I actually set the X and Y coordinates for each one to align exactly with each month or day, exactly where it would fall um, on that canvas so that they would be very precise and aligned. Um, this one was a project that we were uh, doing on um, arrest and suspected uh, teens in um, a particular type of crime, carjackings, which were uh, we had a bit of a rash of a couple of years ago in, in Minneapolis. Um, and this was a really similar concept, so I won't go too in depth of how we did this one. Uh, but this one, the difference here is that we had those dates along more of a continuous X axis along um, from left to right. Uh, but then each of the lines this time are individual people. So we're converting each person into a number, basically assigned a number from one to, I think, about 40. And then we also wanted to have a line at the top that would sort of act as a key, um, which you kind of see there at the top. So um, you'll see this come up again later. But um, what we did there is actually add a little bit of almost faux data into our data set so that we could have that render in the same canvas and then again used annotations as um, our date labels. This one was actually for that same project um, where we wanted to show racial disparities for teens who were <clears throat> either put in or failed out of these juvenile sort of recovery programs. That's what the EJJ is here. Um, and a lot of times for uh, racial disparity type charts like this, we would use a regular bar chart. But um, for this, that wouldn't have allowed us to use some of the really helpful annotations that we have on the chart. Um, at least at the time, I think annotations for bar charts weren't as available. Um, so we decided to try this sort of lollipop uh, chart approach, uh, which is sort of like a version of a bar chart, I guess. So again, this is one where I could kind of envision and the data had already one dimension that I could sort of leave as is. And that was the percentage, the X there, column C, the, um, the percentage of each of these categories for each of the racial groups. But the Y axis was more of this qualitative category that we needed to convert into some kind of number so that they would be placed in the canvas in order. Um, and this can really, I think, be sort of arbitrary as long as the relative distance between each number is where you want it. And sometimes this actually takes a little bit of um, trial and error, but you can see how <clears throat> for each of the racial groups here, the distance between each sort of subcategory is just one. So it goes 28, 27, 26, 25. And then when I get to the next racial group, I'm actually skipping a few numbers. So we go to 22, 21, 20, 19. So just building in a little bit of space there between the numbers actually is part of what helps us then relatively sort of build these hierarchical spaces between the groups um, when it renders on the canvas. So from there, um, here you can see I've adjusted those axes again, I've turned the x-axis off and added a color for each category. Um, so this only plots the dots, right? This places them, places the dots on the canvas, um, but it doesn't give me the lines, the like the lollipop handle, I guess, as it were. And that's where this fun feature that I have started to use a lot in data wrapper scatter plots comes in. And I love that they still call this experimental because um, it's been around for a while and I think it's, it, there's nothing experimental about it. Like it works really well. Um, but uh, the lines on this chart were drawn with this. So this takes a little practice, but in effect, each of the lines <clears throat> um, have a pair of X and Y coordinates that correspond with the start and end of the line on the chart. So um, the, zero, the zero line at the beginning and then the percentage where my dot was placed and then a lot of copy and pasting for the color and width since I wanted them all to be styled actually exactly the same. They all just get their black and they're a very slim um, 0.5 pixel um, width. So you can see here, at least for these bottom ones, how these sort of correspond to um, how they line up with the lines on the chart. So they all start at zero um, and then zero, one, zero, two, zero, three, zero, four, zero, uh, zero, four. <laughs> um, and then the second 
pair of numbers there is what corresponds to my data. So the 13%, 14%, 14%, 20%.、Um, and actually, when I was doing this, I had my data in Excel or Google Sheets or whatever up in one screen and data wrapper up in the other so that I could very easily either sort of copy and paste or、um, you know, quickly say, this, you know, here are the percentages where I want them all to kind of land.、Um, but that's how we drew.、Um, Lines. And then once again, I use the annotations、um, to position these kind of category labels exactly how and where I wanted them、um, off, to the, off to the left side there. So that's,、um, that's that one. Let's see, we've done two so far. Let's try to squeeze in a couple more. Okay, moving on. So I have two from this little bit of a crazy project where I tried to predict. What Taylor Swift would play during the acoustic set of the Eras tour when it came to Minneapolis. And、um, these were songs from her past shows in Minneapolis that I、um, downloaded from setlist.fm. And these were songs that she had not played yet on the, on the tour. So the idea here was sort of like a bee swarm chart, except without the sort of like forced randomness that a bee swarm chart typically has. Like this one, this is a sort of traditional. Bee swarm that we had attempted once in Data Wrapper, as you can see here, and it didn't quite work as well as we wanted. That's much harder to figure out how all those plots should be arranged if you're not using code to do it.、Um, so, the data for this one was actually really simple. On the x axis, we just had a date, and then on the y, again, I sort of assigned each song a value either above or below zero so that they would sort of stack、um, in each direction. So, you can see there, there's like negative one, one. Negative one, one, two, three.、Um, so it was a little bit arbitrary. Again, takes a, took a little bit of trial and error to figure out how that, would, how that would go. But then tell me if you've heard this one before. I removed the axes and the labels, <laughs> or I kept them in just select places, but、um, removing them just gave me more control over、um, the final labeling. And then, of course, we added the color by the album or era, as, it, as she says, and then、um, sized it by the number of times it had been played. And then we use annotations for the labels. So I bet you're sensing a theme here of how we've done this.、Um, but yeah, that one was pretty simple and、uh, ended up being sort of this kind of fun, like linear little timeline of her, of her past songs. All right, <clears throat> last one. This is one more of those Eras Tour ones. And I think I'm saving this one for last because I think it、um, kind of brings together a lot of the things. That I've already talked about. So you'll notice we don't have an axis or a grid in the background here. There's a custom key in the top right corner、um, that is actually part of the data. And then a custom line there, kind of on the right, which you, it's pretty, pretty pale. You may not even be able to see it, but、um, that was sort of to delineate her records from other records she's appeared on. Um, and then we used a lot of fun emoji in this one too. But the idea was basically to show all the songs in her catalog, what she had already played.、Um, because the whole, if you're not familiar with this whole thing,、uh, she had said that she was、um, only going to play every song once throughout the tour. And so we were trying to track sort of like what has already been played and what's left.、Um, so I had kind of envisioned. This one, like I could see it in my head before I even started getting the data for it. I was really thinking about how we could achieve this and how the data would have to be structured to do it.、Um, and when I was doing these slides, I was like, ooh, do I even want to show them how the data is structured? Because it's a lot. But basically, every song is a row. And then all the columns basically are a number assigned to each album in chronological order. And then、um, they ascend sort of on the y axis depending on. Whether it was part of the set list or had been or was like already unplayed.、Um, and this, I think I said in somewhere else that it was meant to be a, a tracker, but it's not really a tracker because we actually just used it as like a snapshot of sort of the state of play right before her Minneapolis shows. But we very easily could have made it live updating, and that actually would have been really fun.、Um, I actually should also say that I did not compile all of this data.、Uh, I found a lot of it on、um, Reddit, actually, in some fan threads, and then sort of just adapted the data to fit the needs of the chart that I wanted to build. So here's a little bit of a snapshot. And actually, a lot of this is not for the charting itself, it's for the tooltip, which included a lot more information that I just kind of happened to have in the Reddit data. And I thought, well, let's use all of it. Um, so, the size column you see there,、um, so that, sorry, the album number and the error count, which is sort of far, far to the right, 
um, is what is kind of defining each of the axes technically. And then the size column is what I had to add later once I tried to figure out how to do that legend. Um, I realized that I wanted the legend to be smaller. So I had to set sort of like some kind of size parameter and I just grabbed 15 um, for all the charter uh, charted songs and then to find a smaller size, about half the size for all of these legend items, which also appear in the, in the data. Um, so they're just more dots uh, or diamonds, I guess, in this case, plotted on the canvas. But since they're half the size, that gets defined um, here in the data. And then I can pull that in on the, on the front end. Um, so the last thing was uh, the labels. And you, again, text annotations here helped a lot. Um, and one thing I do a, a lot with this kind of thing is because this was going to get really tight on mobile, we did different labels for desktop and mobile. So they were similar. Um, where the desktop had sort of the full name of the album. Um, and then on mobile, we just showed the emoji, which um, is definitely not like uh, accessible really for, you know, some for some people, but um, it was sort of a, a fun way to do it. And, you know, the audience for this was probably people who kind of uh, already could, you know, put that together anyway. Um, so the, the axes here were pretty similar to what I've kind of already shown where, you know, we had the album album count on the horizontal axis, the, I guess, what did I call it in the data, the error count on the Y, and then removed all those axes so that I could just sort of like play only with the annotations and sort of the, the color palette that we had defined. Um, and then even all of the little pointers for, let's go back to the next one, even all those little pointers for the legend up in the upper right, like those are all actually just annotations as well. Um, but that's about it. That's uh, that's how we made this little rainbow masterpiece. <laughs> um, so that's that's four. Uh, that's about all I've got, and um, I'm happy to take questions. Um, down there in the lower left is my uh, where where I'm at on most socials, uh, and I'm happy to you know respond there, have a conversation in the future um, about that. So I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, CJ. Really impressive work. Um, uh, please leave your questions in the chat. Um, I have one uh, that I'm very curious about. Um, in in your pre-conference interview, you said something that I found really interesting, uh, is that a, a good graphic uh, should be either immediately conveying a point or uh, should be visually compelling, or ideally both, of course. And uh, I feel uh, in the past days, we've heard a lot about the, the first part, especially in, in Amanda's talk yesterday, how to, how to convey a point using font size, et cetera. Um, but I'm curious about this, this other part, this visual compelling. Like, is there anything that you, like maybe, maybe to phrase it like this, if there's one thing you could change to make this easier to make uh, these custom, um, custom charts are more compelling? Or is there something in the way that you would you would like to uh, see change? Like if you could just uh, wish, make a make a wish for something. For the for the data wrapper product? Yes, yes. Oh my gosh, you're putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I don't, I don't know that there's anything that would be changed about the product because to me a lot of the things that make something visually compelling are things like a lot of the things that Amanda talked about like um, the type heart hierarchy and even th like design things like color and um, and stuff like that which um, Data Rapper already has and um, I think there's something sometimes you just have to wait too for the right data to be available, you know, to, to so that you can put it into a form like this that makes it visually compelling. And it's just like unusual enough to people with some annotations or, you know, like Amanda was talking about having verbs in your headline or some kind of way to draw the reader in and say, okay, beyond just seeing sort of the, the point you're making, I really, I want to dive in a little bit and like hover over this dot. And we don't, you know, we don't do hover stuff, um, 
all that often because so many studies have shown that a lot of people don't use them. But there are cases, I think, in which someone wants to find themselves in the data or they are a really big Taylor Swift fan and they want to see every song. Um, and so then, you know, the nice thing is Data Wrapper allows that when you have the opportunity to do it, you have the data to do it. There are ways to leverage it already. So I'll, I'll think more about that, Gregor, and I'll get back to you if I think of anything. But um, right. right now, I think um, that's what I love about Data Wrapper is it's like... Mm got sort of a low barrier to entry but actually it is a super flexible tool in that way yeah yeah i also found very funny this experimental experimental feature that has been sitting there for seven years <laughs> <laughs> maybe we should change that change that label at some point <laughs> um there is one question by uh john dutchneski i hope i pronounced his name correctly um about uh mobile adjustments to these custom scatter plots like uh, do you make uh, mobile adjustments or what is you talked about the annotations already is there anything yeah, else that's that probably is... the biggest one i mean there are some little toggles in there for um you know reducing the size of your dots for smaller screens and sometimes we do that um but the biggest one is probably uh just adjusting those annotations and doing like a desktop version and a mobile version if we if we need it um so that we're adjusting those for different screen sizes um, that's probably the biggest one that I can think of, or, you know, sometimes reducing the number of grid lines for mobile, um, that we're showing or, or something like that. You know, there have been definitely times where we create something for desktop and it looks beautiful. And then I, and then, and then you go, oh, we should preview it for mobile. And like, oh crap, there's definitely some stuff we have to fix here. Um, or, or sometimes it just doesn't work it all together and you know maybe we do a different version for mobile that turns it 90 degrees so that it's more of a vertical um, experience rather than a horizontal one hmm. um, and sometimes we'll write a little code to just display a different chart on mobile um, so we've, yeah. done that. we've done that too yeah that uh, is a good uh, uh, segue to this question um, do you use any like code or sheet formulas to make these like like computing these areas for the scatter plots or uh, annotations to make that uh, go quicker? Or is there anything? Yeah, I mean, what's funny is like a lot of the sessions before me have talked about Python and the APIs and all of it and Svelte to leverage some of this stuff. Um, sometimes for these custom ones, I'm the kind of person who likes to see it so that I can understand what it's doing. So probably the biggest thing that, um, that I could recommend is I use in Google Sheets or Excel, if I know that I want a tooltip, uh, like the tooltip language to, to be in a certain format, especially if I want it to be in a sentence, I will often use um, like the concatenate function in, um, in Excel or Google Sheets to sort of pre-create exactly what I want that tooltip to say. And then, um, and then I can make some little adjustments if I need to individually. But that is kind of one way I've used to sort of pre-populate in the data um, exactly what I want. Or similarly, you know, if there's if I need to convert something that's a qualitative data dimension into a number, I have used um, like if statements in Excel and Google Sheets to look for certain categories or something like that and um, create them into numbers. Um, so that's probably, that's probably the closest one for these. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's another interesting question about the aesthetics of these uh, charts by Yuriko Schumacher. Um, how do you come up with those unique chart designs? <laughs> do you have your own system of trying different types or? Does the design come to you in your mind? To magically? my mind, magically. <laughs> I would love to say that it's magically. Although maybe, I don't know. I think I've been uh, <clears throat> doing this for so long and using Data Wrapper for so long that it is a little bit magical. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I can just see it and I uh, in my head and create it. But um, yeah, I mean, it's very typical, especially with some of our bigger projects, that if we have a lot of data, that we will go through many iterations of different chart styles and different sort of levels of summarizing charts before we land on just the right one. And um, we often do that in Data Wrapper. 
um, you know, especially if we can just sort of toggle very simply between like a line chart versus a column chart versus a bar chart, sometimes to get uh, them to work just right, we do have to go back and sort of reformat the data or disaggregate it or re-aggregate it in a different way. Um, but uh, it's a lot of trial and error. It's a lot of, I think, practice in using this tool and understanding um, what what data works for a custom chart. I think for the key, I think with these kind of custom scatter plots is that you do have to have pretty disaggregated data because ideally you want lots of sort of points on the canvas um, to make it look rich and compelling. Um, and sometimes that's just hard to find or you don't have that in your data. So, um, but I think probably to me, the, um, uh, you know, probably the easiest way to try something like this would be with a timeline where you can sort of align all your dots just along an axis with one, you know, numeric, you know, maybe it's just a date. And then like that to me is, is maybe the, the, um, the most common situation in some, where something like this would, would be useful. Um, mm -hmm. kind of get your feet wet. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have another question myself is that when you remove the axis from a chart, uh, how do you make sure that the, that the annotations you put on as, as like an alternative axis, uh, like, do you have any kind of system to double check them or to make <laughs> sure that you're not accidentally putting in? Um, we're just being very careful. Uh, <laughs> um, I will often have, I don't remove any of my data from the spreadsheet like I don't overwrite it the raw original data is still there I'm just not displaying that field if that makes sense so I what I will it. often do is like I uh, I think I mentioned like I'll often have my data up sort of on one screen and data wrapper up in the other so that I can sort of cross-reference them very easily and mm. make sure like okay this one this one is August am I sure that this one is also August um yeah. But I think that's where those X and Y coordinates come in handy in making the annotations because um, if you're if you're putting those in aligned with the actual data, it will it will appear in the right spot. Like the 2009 is not going to appear in 2012. If you put it in yeah. as 2009, it's going to appear at 2009. Yeah. That, I don't know if that helps. <laughs> yeah, um, there is one question about the hover interactivity. Uh, by Ria R. Um, is, can you turn on the inter, uh, the hover for just some points, like in the in the tooltip uh, in the legends? You don't want to have the hover, but in the data points, you want them. Yeah, that's a good question. <clears throat> I don't think we can we can't turn them off for some data points, but what we can do is just leave that field blank, so that there is um, so if there's nothing in the data for those kind of for the key it's not going to render anything. It's just going to look blank. So it's not that we can turn it off or on for some. It's just that there's no data that it's pulling in. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a good feature good. request for you, Gregor. Yeah. <laughs> Selective tool tips. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, or, or how about automatic uh, legends for custom scatter plots? Mm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, there's one interesting question. Um, by Patricia, uh, how many, how much time do you spend on a project like the Swifty one? Well, there's a little bit of a story behind that, which is that um, I had knee surgery last year around the time that this, that I had this idea. And so I was spending a lot of time on the couch away from my day job to begin with. Um, so that's part of the reason that I was sort of, I was looking for something that would occupy my time. That would be like, just really fun. And um, so the data collection and kind of, uh, cleaning up the data to fit this type of chart was actually the most time consuming part. The building of it in data wrapper was the fastest. Like once I had the data there, it just sort of, you know, all came together. Um, and so, you know, how much time did I spend on that project? I mean, a few weeks, but also I wasn't working on it totally for full for three, you know, for a few weeks, it was like, I would kind of work you know, first on the data and then on the chart, and then we would sort of adjust as we got a little closer to publication time. Um, so the actual charting of it and doing all of the, like the annotations and the colors um, 
probably didn't take too long, maybe in total like a day. I don't know. But that's also because that's, I'm that's... I'm I'm very adept in it. And I think if you you know, if you're starting, if you're a little newer to the tool, it would probably take a little longer. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. Um, this it's a good uh, there's one question about the data collection also for the Swifty piece. Oh no, that one we take. Oh, we're last. gonna get to that one last. Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is, uh, did you collect the data uh, for the surprise song predictions? <laughs> um, like, I got none of them right. <laughs> okay. I went 0 for 4. Um, none of my predictions were correct um, because I think in hindsight I had a, I had a bit of a, 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 an oversight in my methodology. Uh, yeah. So I did yeah. not. We did discuss whether we should update this chart to show like, you know, going forward or like what happened in the Minneapolis shows. Um, but we decided to just leave it and sort of leave it as like a little time capsule um, of like for the shows. But yeah. I was not correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I was confused by this question at first, but then I saw in your background, you have this. Uh... Forgiveness so when... permission. Yeah, do you rather ask for permission or forgiveness? forgiveness you know i think there's you can look at an experimental data viz and um this is the great thing about editors or like showing other people you know they might look at it and go like i don't i don't get any of this and like it doesn't make any sense to me okay well maybe you've learned something and you maybe it's not for public consumption but um you know we definitely look for opportunities where there might be an opportunity to try something new and um or different or sort of stretch the audience and make them think a little bit. And there are definitely opportunities to do that. And we sort of ask for forgiveness over permission, I would say. All right. Thank you very much for your time and for, for showing your uh, amazing work. Um, Thank you. Um, yeah, maybe you can stick around in the chat if there are more questions coming up uh, for a little bit. Sure. And we are heading over to Kiko Janeras. I hope I pronounced this correctly. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, Kiko that's... is the director. <laughs> uh, the, Kiko is the director of engineering at El País, uh, one of the largest newspapers in Spain, based in Madrid, and he's also the author of uh, of a book called Pienso Claro or Thinking Clearly. About uh, I haven't read it; it's only in in Spanish and. Uh, but it's about practical shortcuts and common traps uh, when working with data. I hope I, I summarized this somehow correctly. And uh, yeah, today uh, Kiko will talk about how they are using R to uh, code custom charts and data. But I'm really curious to hear about this. Um, the stage is yours. Hi, hi, Gregor. I think it's a good continuation from CJ CJ work. So. So I will I will just just start. So yes, um, as my name is Kiko Llaneras and I, I'm a, I have a background in engineering. I, I spent ten years. I'm an, an ex academic. I spent ten years in, in academia. I get my PhD, but uh, around 2015 I I changed my my, my career. I start. I started. Well, I was writing as a blogger, but this this started to I started to spend more more time doing this 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 blogging thing. And in 2016, I moved into journalism full time, and I had been at at the país for for eight years now. And so there, okay, I have to okay. This. At the país, I'm, I'm leading the visual and data team, and we use a lot of tools, but probably the main two tools that we are using every day are data wrapper and R. R is the, the programming language we we use we use for our, all the analysis and, and and so I'm going to talk about how we uh, how we, how we combine these two tools. How we use R and data wrapper to produce uh, to do different things. I'm going to talk about two particular tricks. Uh, the first one is how we use this combination to create quick charts. So basically, we work uh, with R for all the data stuff. So we typically have 
some data here. You have some data about the World Cup last year. And we are in R doing the analysis, doing the scrubbing, doing the combination of different data sets, computing our, our analytics, and all, all, the, all the work around data, uh, we, we do that in, in, in R. And the thing is that we can then uh, create a chart with data grader using the APA and using uh, a one liner, in, in, in fact, using this one liner data to chart and with identification from a chart in data grader, we can send the data from R into the chart and create one, one of these charts that you all that you all know that we can create with, with data grader. And so this is this is the first setup. This is a very simple way of working, but this is very very useful for us because because we can create the, the, the chart directly from the from from where the data the data is, and well, why we like this or why, why I like this, this approach a lot? Two reasons. The first one is that it's it's a way of having very good charts. You know that data report charts are very good. They are very clean. You have a lot of options. Uh, they are responsive, so they work very very well in, in, the, in your mobile phone, etc. So all the all the benefits of of the top reference charts we have we have it, we have that. But I also like uh, the workflow, how the process works, because it's a very quick way of having a chart that we can publish. So from the code to the to the to the chart that we that we published is, is you only need a one click. No? So it's very that is very very quick and very convenient. Very convenient in two ways. It's very simple to reuse the chart, and in particular, I like that it's very easy to edit the chart once it, it has been published. So if we use Adobe Illustrator or, or JavaScript for making a chart. If there is a type, if we, if we have to change anything in the chart, we have to talk with someone who has the files, we have to edit the files, we have to update them, we have to upload them. So the process is somehow, somehow, you need some time for, 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 for doing that. But if, if the, the chart is a data grabber chart, and many people in the team can go to the chart and edit it. For instance, we have a translation team that sometimes translates all a story from El País in English to, to our international edition. And they can, of course, translate the, uh, the story. And I have to talk with them. But they can also translate the data grabber chart because they know how to duplicate the chart. Then, then they know how to edit uh, all the text. And they can translate the whole story. And I don't have to be the loop. So this is this is the this is the, the benefit of the process I was I was talking about. So, so how we how we, this can be done? No? The the most important part is the data grabber API, but also this uh, this package from R, which is data grabber with no e, that basically allows you to do everything that you can do with a data grabber chart from R. So this is at the core of, of, of the work I'm going to, to explain in the following. So this was first, the first case used, how to do very quick charts, very good charts from R. The second one is how to create some good charts with R and, and data wrapper. So the approach is very similar of what CJ just, just told you, but we are doing this from R. I can start with an example. This is this is the example. This is a this is a um, particular custom chart. It's not a template chart from Data Grabber because there, yeah, you have the columns, but there is some median lines. You have two boxes for each column, well, and you can see you can see the the things that are not standard. This this chart is basically a um, some a box plot, but it's a particular kind of box plot that I like. That I like I like more than a box plot. It's simpler than a box plot. If you do, you haven't seen a, a box plot any any time in your life, you can understand this chart. 
And this is a, a chart that is, uh, is done in data graver, but it's not a standard, no? So how we did it? Yeah, you have the, the pop-up, as you can see. It's, it's just, you have all the, all the niceties of, of data graver, but how we did it? This is a scatter plot. Scatter plot is the team plating data graver that allows you to 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 hack it. It is the it's the best one for for hacking. So this is a scatter plot. But basically, if you show the the, the scatter plot, you, you, there is nothing to, to be seen here. The only thing that is data as a standard the data graver chart are the pop up. In fact, the pop up are an invisible dots, bigger dots that allow us to have a, 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 a pop-up. But all the columns in the chart, we added this as custom lines. This experimental feature that I hope you, 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 you never, never remove from the app because we use it a lot. This experimental custom lines and custom areas. This is how all the, all the columns and all the lines that you can see here, this is, uh, this is how we add it. We add all the, all, all, all the elements, the principal elements of the chart we added at, 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 at as custom lines. And then we use, we use annotations for all the text and even also the, the labels in, in, in the columns, PP, PSOE, Vox, Sumar, all these, all these, the name of the parties are also, are also annotations. So, so this is the chart. The chart is a scatter plot with, with all these uh, strange elements. But the thing is, we didn't do this manually we do this all of this by by coding in, in r so this is the this is the code the code for the for the chart these are like i don't know 200 lines of code or less so we have some preparation for the data we have an id for the chart then we have some code for adding the columns some code for the pop-up and some code for the for the labels but this is not a lot of code but but but, but somehow it is and i i wrote this this code a long time ago and i'm not exactly sure how every element works or, uh, because i wrote it i wrote it i don't know three four years ago and i haven't used it a lot by copy and pasting so this is one of the nice features of this approach I'm not writing 200 lines of code every time. So this works as a template. In fact, I have been using this chart a lot for recently. I don't know. I used it, a version of this chart in a couple of weeks ago. We have elections, regional elections in Galicia. I used it this, uh, last year in Spain, in UK, in Andalusia, in Italy, and in France the, the year before. So, so this, this, this is one of the benefits of this approach. We are somehow building our own templates. And it's not, of course, it's not completely auto, uh, automatic when I want to use the chart again, but basically you have to copy the chart, copy the code and edit here and then to, to just uh, have this working. And yeah, we are using this a lot with different, with, with different variants and why we like it. You have the, the same benefits I was talking about uh, so a few minutes ago. These are good charts. The process is very good. But now we have custom charts within R. That is very convenient for us because we are always working with R. And of course, this is, these are somehow templates, and I, I love it. And we use this a lot. For instance, these histograms are, have been done <clears throat> with the same, exactly the same approach. These are scatter plots with all the columns very small columns in this case, you have the dots and all, all, all the stuff, but this is the, exactly the same approach. This is, this is again the same. It seems to be different rows, but this is not different rows. We are in the, the lines for each of the, or each of the histograms. We have done some ex combination for the stacked areas with dots. This is in Spanish, but uh, I, uh, I can talk about this in, uh, after. And also some Borja Andrino, which is a, a colleague at, at, at El País, has done the same approach to build uh, these charts, these radar maps that are, again, scatter plots uh, that we publish from, from R. This is, these are, are, are very nice and particularly tricky. 
because you have to keep the proportion when when you are working in a mobile phone but they, they work and also he has worked with 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 this worm that are uh, also 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 very useful so so this is this is our chat and finally if you want to to learn how to do how to do to do this i have some some very short advice first advice is starting by reading the documentation for the data grapper data grapper api it's very complete and it's, it's the core of, of this approach the api is what allows us to do all this then you can read the um, or install and read the data wrapper uh, R package and that basically allows you to communicate with the api um, within r it's it's it, it works very well and somehow a trick i think it's very useful to start working with this to use this function this function this retrieve start metadata that basically it gives you all the metadata that you can change in a chart so you can select any chart that you are working with and you can see all the metadata and this is a very convenient way of of inspecting the data and trying to change a parameter and and, and, and observing how the, the how the chart is, is is changing and it's a way to 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 understand how the process work and finally when i work, when we are working on one of these charts the process is a just a process first try an, an error so we work in a chart uh, uh, after uh, looking for the for the results we want and then i think it's interesting to add a second step that is now that the chart is working I spend some time in the code for factory set uh, how to to prepare the code to be a template so you can make relative the margins for instance you can uh, clean the code you can document the code and it's very it's very useful to spend some time some time here and that's basically it's all so we just love data wrapper and we also love are and it's very nice to combine both and it has been very useful for us so i'm glad to ask any questions you have thanks thanks for for the for attention wow kiko <laughs> very impressive <laughs> uh i would have never Thank thought you. that this is possible this is possible um <laughs> Wow, it's a lot of a lot of work you put into uh, creating these templates. Really, uh, thank you a lot for sharing this. Um, uh, by the way, do you how do you how do you work with these templates internally? Like you you have a repos repository for them. Or like how, how big is the team working with them? Because I feel like you you always need some developer as the first step, right? Yeah, the thing is, ba basically, I think we have. Each of these templates has an, an owner. Uh, typically, it is an owner who, who is the person who, who first developed it. And then we typically uh, use this, these people to fine tune it. So all the electoral, the electoral charts, uh, I, 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 I do a lot of work uh, in elections. So these are I, I my charts in some, in, in some sense. And I can prepare them for, for other people, but basically, this is um, somehow something that I typically I typically do, and for instance, all these radar maps or all the sports uh, the sport charts, Borja Anderino is the gatekeeper here. So if I I want to to use the the charts, I typically say, oh, Borja, uh, can you prepare this for me? And this is how how how, how we do it, because we are somehow a small not that a small team, but we are like thirteen people. But we have different specialities. Not all of us are working with R, uh, so so this is typically how how, how we, we, these templates are not so completely automatic. So this is not something that we do for everyday charts. It's somehow in between something that we do for the day and a development that we use JavaScript. So we are not going to to spend a week working with javascript but we have this team so it's somehow in, the, in, in between um there's a question from the chat from amy scott german that is related to this is uh 
she would love to hear more about how you build out the script templates and uh, how long the tweaking of this code takes for each new iteration from the template. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about the first development. I think not that much time. It seems more difficult than, than it is because, so when, when, I, when I did the first one, I didn't expect to do 10 of them, but I, I, I discovered that it was quite efficient. So I was, I was surprised that, that uh, I started working on, on the first template and, and in, I don't know, in a few hours I have, uh, have the result. So, so this was not that a lot of, a lot of, a lot of work. Because basically you, you only have to, you are putting rectangles and lines, you have the coordinates, but it's not, it's not, if, if, you, if you are familiar with, with our, our code, if you are coding our every, every day, this is very, very easy because the, the, the API is, is quite flexible. And, and then the tweaking, the tweaking part, this, this is not a, not, not a lot of, not a lot of work neither. So, and this, these charts are always done in projects that are quite data, uh, data rich. So I, when I work in elections, I'm working in, I have a, I'm typically publishing a poll of polls or a prediction, elect, uh, a prediction model. So I'm now spending a few days fine tuning the model, making predictions, gathering the, the polls and in, I have this setup, and this setup is is, is, is is a template by itself. And the part of the plotting, the, the, the plotting chart is just part of part of the part of the project. So I have to fine tune in the colors and the names of the parties. I have to adjust some margins because maybe the parties are not between zero and twenty seats. They have one hundred seats because the election is a different one. And I have to change some some small details, but this is a thing of I don't know maybe half an hour of tweaking per 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 chart, no, not more than that. There there was a follow up question by Amy that I think a lot of people have, uh, including myself. Is uh, do you have by any chance a public Git repo for these uh, scripts for these templates for for learning more about the custom we lines or? We haven't, we haven't, we haven't done it. Uh, we are not that uh, secretive about, about this. I put it in, in the in the in the slide. So, but what happens typically with the repos is that you never find the time to to document your code and to share your code. And there are things, uh, for instance, I'm not I'm not publishing or prediction models. I, I'm very often asked about. Uh, and I'm not publishing that because it's a lot of work and it's very easy to replicate and, and, and I cannot, I think I cannot, I cannot share the, the, the model. I, I'm very transparent with the methodology, but I cannot share the, the I am not feel comfortable sharing the code of the, of the prediction model. But with the charts, I'm not that, that, that secretive because I think it's, it's not that difficult, it's not that, it's not that difficult, it's not that difficult uh, as it seems. So if someone is, familiar with R and spent a, a couple of days working with, with, with these ideas, they can build these templates and many others. I think there is a lot of, a lot of different charts that can be done in a, in a similar, in a similar way. So these charts mm -hmm. that, that and, and, and another direction for this is I think one of, one of the, uh, people that uh, speak uh, before me talk about this. You can do something similar with maps by tuning the shape files. You can then ask a, a, a custom shape file that is not a map anymore, but then there are dots and and, and 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 different forms and whatever into into the server. So uh, I'm glad of, of of sharing some of these or asking any questions if someone is is interested. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad of doing of doing it. Yeah. Um, that's one more thing that I'm interested about is uh, 
like there's a lot of code that you spend into positioning all the rectangles and pu putting that into the data uh, uh, API. Um, uh, I wonder what your thought is about um, like. When well, where's the line where where the it makes more sense to actually just make the graphic using like JavaScript or D three or using a, a front end framework rather than using R for this, or what are the benefits of still doing it in de in this uh, R to data wrapper workflow? I was thinking about this uh, when preparing the when preparing the uh, the presentation. On the one hand, uh, I think it depends. On, on the people. So uh, the, we, in the team, we have people that is uh, our masters, that we, the people we, that work, work with, with R every day. Meaning I, this is my case, but I'm not, the, I'm not the only one. So for me, it's very, 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 very more, more efficient to, to do the chart in R because I'm not that good in JavaScript. So JavaScript implies involving another person. So this is yeah, this is already uh, a barrier for, for, for me. But if I can work with the developer and R, I can't make things that are somehow difficult. So in some sense, this this depends on the people. Other people in my team who are very familiar with, with JavaScript, they probably don't use this, this solution because maybe they don't they don't they, they, they are, are not able to write the R code. So it, this depends on, on, on your toolbox. But in general, the second, the, the second factor I think to, 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 to think here is I like that when I publish a data wrapper chart, this is already published in the sense that, for instance, if someone is reading my piece and there is a typo in the chart, anyone can go to the chart in the wrapper, find it, correct it, and the story is already already correct, and that is quite powerful because otherwise you have to find the people who owns the files of who can find the files. And then you have to make versions in Adobe Illustrator or, or maybe it depends on, on the solution. But there is not it's not so so, so simple to find a, a, a reliable solution. So this is. This is somehow in, the, in, 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 in between. Okay. Um, yeah, last question, someone, uh, Yuriko uh, is asking if you think if there's a benefit of using R rather than Python. There is a Python library for R, uh, for data wrapper uh, as well. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I, I think that it, the magic of the thing is happening in the in the API. So if you are familiar with Python, Python is the is the is the way to go for, for you. I think the same process can, can be done for sure. The, this depends on and probably some people with JavaScript can also use the API from from JavaScript. So um, Python for sure and and, and maybe. You will, Using observable or, or or another solution can 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 also be workable. Cool, uh, thank you so much, Kiko, again for sharing your your scripts and your your workflows. Um, and we will move on to the last uh, uh, session of this block. Um, Erika Raudio, I hope I pronounced this good. Um, uh, Eric is working at the library of the Finnish parliament. Uh, very curious to hear uh, about um, what you're doing with data wrapper. And um, I think it's about some tricks uh, for getting the most of our tables in this last session. And uh, yeah, please uh, feel free to start. Thank you, Gregor. Yeah, thank you, Gregor. Uh, greetings from rainy Helsinki. Um, and thank you for this opportunity to give this talk. It's uh, it's nice to be a part of the first uh, unwrapped conference. I hope there's will there will be more in the future, as to, there has been a lot of uh, inspiring talks uh, before me. Um, but strict to the point, um, my short presentation will uh, uh, focus on two 
uh, rather technical details uh, and how to use them to customize tables. Um, I want to show these to exemplify the, uh, the versatility, uh, versatility of data wrapper, although at this point of the conference, it's become clear uh, even to those who haven't used this uh, tool beforehand. Uh, and both, both of these uh, details are based on a single user case, user case um, the absence statistics. Um, it's, I believe, needless to say that uh, there's always great interest in what politicians are doing uh, all around the world. And Finland is not an exception from that. So uh, the 200 members of the Finnish parliament are under great scrutiny by the media, by the voters, and in order to answer that need, that information need, the parliament publishes various statistics on um, what is happening in the parliament and how the MPs are doing. And one example of these statistics is the absence from the plenary sessions or sittings that happen uh, basically from Tuesday to Friday. And uh, previously, these statistics were collected manually with Excel, putting the data in Excel sheets. And when they published them, they converted it in, into PDFs. So, and now we have uh, built a pipeline on the other hand, on the other hand, and uh, on the other end of the uh, pipeline, there's R, which is used to uh, mining the data and tabulate the data, and then pushed into data wrapper, uh, thanks to the uh, API that's already mentioned many times before this speech and before the uh, before the one. Um, so basically, it's not uh, it's not only a huge leap for my colleagues who have been doing this manually, but also for the accessibility of this data. Um, next, I'm going to show you what this statistics looks like. I hope this works right. It's a, um, perhaps a little small print, but basically the statistics is a double view. Uh, table view. The one showing now is we so-called report view, where, where there's every sitting of the term, the parliamentary term, uh, uh, and who of the MPs have been absent, what are the group, and what is the reason for the absence. And you can, for example, you can switch the date to newest to oldest, or Vice versa, you can search for a specific uh, MP or the political group or even the reason uh, for reason type. And also you can search for uh, a certain date or a date of the sitting. So, so uh, this is report view then there's then there's this actual uh, statistics view where the actual numbers of every MP that has been at least once absent from any sitting of the of the term and here again you can uh, sort or, or reorder by personal reasons if, the, uh, if there's no reason for the absence or absences. And um, here the bars are in uniform uh, range. But when I was building this pipeline, there were some challenges uh, I countered and uh, two of them, uh, one of them had to do with the plenary dates or dates in in general, uh, when you upload dates into data wrapper and they are usually recognized as date format, they work fine when you want the report or the rows be reordable 
uh, from to oldest and to newest or vice versa but uh, in the uh, if the in the dates there isn't possible to search for a specific date so is there anything you can do you can switch the dates into text but then again the ordering of rows wouldn't work so there was a problem to be uh, solved the other challenge was in the statistics view uh, by default the bars have an independent range uh, although you can change them into uniform range but how can you keep uh, keep the range up to date when you have live updating data so you have to kind of the uh, the maximum value is a moving moving goal uh, luckily for these both challenges uh, solutions could be found and uh, for the for the problem number one the solution was reformatting the date and um, when i contacted data wrapper support with my challenge uh, i was given this uh, quote secret workaround uh, i believe it was elana back then when told uh, that there's a secret workaround uh, to tackle this problem and the, uh, the solution is uh, that the date itself needs a little reformatting uh, and what you have to do in this case for example you have a dates uh, you make it the double and um, add uh, two at signs in the middle and this works like uh, this works so that the date uh, before the two signs is the one that is visible in the date that's in text and also that works for the search and the latter date uh, uh, the tool understands it as an order of things and uh, and sorts the rows uh, on on that case and the double uh, the double at signs and anything after it won't be visible in the table and this is very useful because well there's a couple of examples how you can present the date with double digit or one digit only but you can also if you want to use um uh, month names or aberrations like january february in the date you can use it use this one in the uh, former former date and use the latter as as an example and you can also use this in other di uh, data types so you, you just uh, need to know that the um, text data is before the double ads and the order of things is the latter and this is very useful for example uh, in text cases where there's an intrinsic uh, order of, or order for the words and for example uh, in the statistics i have the name of the mp in order of first name and then the last name of the mp but if if i would like to uh, give the order uh, to go from last name to first name, you can. I, I could make this same into the name field. Uh, and once more, it wasn't that secret uh, workaround at all. I hadn't find it from this uh, Data Wrapper Academy uh, articles, but there was uh, uh, this very helpful article on how to do this in different types of data so solution uh, problem one solved and then there was this other problem uh, i show this uh, part of the chart again to ex um, to show how uh, what kind of problem there is if the uh, if the columns have independent ranges like like here uh, although the actual numbers on how many times uh, one mp has been absent uh, the bar length looks like uh, similar to each other and um, maybe for someone who is just looking uh, fast or skimming the view may make you uh, may have a false impression on how how different uh, things are in proportion to, to one another 
So the bar length should be proportioned to max value. So how to do this with live updating data? Uh, luckily, there's always the API. Uh, I use R and data wrapper package uh, to update some of my charts and tables. And uh, with the R package, at least, you can all, um, access the metadata uh, or properties by the, uh, through the API and with the help of the package. So everything you do in the uh, in data wrapper uh, uh, software, you can also change in, in the API or, or through the API. Uh, there is a developer documentation uh, on how to use the API and where there's a, a guide to, to all these properties. The, it it's only states that it's impossible to uh, in detail uh, tell every single property from over 20 uh, charts because the properties vary in, in all the uh, visualization types. So, uh, I advise you to try this one out. Uh, this uh, uh, this screenshot is an example where you can find where I I found the actual bar length uh, uh, property, and this doesn't even show all the different things you can uh, change within the uh, properties. So you just have to uh, dig. A little uh, deeper into into the data you can uh, get from the from the interface. Uh, lastly, this is how it's done in R. So basically, I have this maximum value that I want to in, uh, put into these columns bar range. As uh, Kigo just showed, there is this. Uh, uh, um, comments how you can uh, retrieve chart metadata, then you have to find it from, from that uh, a list or a bundle of lists. And then when you edit, edit a chart, you can uh, choose that you want to uh, the metadata put back into the chart. Uh, actually, this is the basically how we uh, first have been using uh, data wrapper in a live updating data. Uh, I haven't used this uh, automatic way uh, in that many other things. So it's been very uh, insightful to see how uh, people from different industries use this um, tool and also uh, are in order to keep their tables and charts in order. Uh, to sum thing, uh, to summary or to sum up uh, my pre uh, presentation, I do love how um, versatile and uh, uh, powerful data wrapper is, uh, is as a visualization tool, uh, and also this uh, philosophy that although there are some limitations on how can how what what can you what you can do uh, in the tool there's always or at least a whole archive of different secret or hidden workarounds if you just uh, had time to take a good look into into the academy and and the blog posts that are that are quite plenty so thank you for this um, tool it has been a great uh a great relief in the parliament for doing uh less manual work um thank you this is it uh i'm happy to uh answer any questions now or later in social media thank you thanks so much erica um it was very interesting to see what you've been doing. Um, we uh, successfully managed to use up all of our buffer time for this blog, as Lisa asked us to. Um, so we're going to have to move the questions into the chat um, or social media, as you, as you said. Um, 
I want to thank again uh, all, all the speakers on this blog. It's been really interesting. Um, and this is not the end. There will be one more blog about uh, the data of API and how to use, uh, use it to do all kinds of things. Um, uh, theoretically, it would be, uh, the next blog would start now, but Lisa and I have just talked about it. We want to have like maybe five minutes or three minutes of a break. I don't know. Uh, um, to give us all a little bit of time to breathe before we start with the next session. Um, so I'm just going to say we're going to start five past half with the next break, um, uh, with the next session. Thank you.
Hi everyone, welcome back. I am Shaylee. I am a, mem a member of Data Rappers Customer Support and Success Team, and I am very excited to be your host for the API block today. Uh, we're gonna cover a really wide variety of topics and uses in this block from tried and true API workflows to examples of using the API in different programming languages in R and Python, to how to automate processes and batch create charts to reach multiple locales. So we've got a lot of ground to cover, even though we did have a little bit of a break. Fortunately, we do have a little bit of a buffer after our session, so we will have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end of every speaker session. And as always, please do drop any questions for our speakers in the chat as they come to you. I'll be keeping an eye out there and collecting them for the end of their respective talks. So collect them as they come to you. That said, all of our setup details said and done with. I'm really excited to introduce our first speaker of this block, Matilda Davies. She is a data journalist at The Times and The Sunday Times, who specializes in creative data visualization. And I can attest the scatter plots that she shared with us that were featured on our blog were impeccable. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing about the compelling, uh, the process that she and her team used to create such compelling creative charts. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn the mic over to Matilda. Hi everyone. Um, it's so great to be here today. Uh, yeah, my name is Matilda Davies. I am a data journalist at The Times and The Sunday Times based in London. And the I've been on the data team for uh, about two and a half years now. Um, and the team's gone on a bit of a journey uh, as the team has grown, particularly in terms of our workflow and how we work with the wider newsroom. Um, so that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. The transformation has allowed us to as we like to say, spread the data gospel across the whole newsroom. And in doing so, upskill the workforce and free up the data team to work on more in-depth data investigations and make bespoke interactives. So a few years ago, we were working in a really siloed, separate way. The data team was responsible for all of our data wrapper charts, visualizations, and data analysis for the entire newsroom. And so we're a small team of seven, uh, soon to be eight permanent data journalists. So this meant a lot of our time was taken up with making basic charts and maps, like simple line or bar charts, uh, sometimes the same ones over and over again. For most of our reporters, the data team felt quite separate. So we were kind of the geeks over in the corner um, and they didn't really understand what we did or what we were capable of. Um, and changing that required a few key ingredients. So we wanted to get the whole newsroom to see data as part of their daily roles, not something specialist or separate from them and that they didn't need to be experts to start using data in their reporting. So we started training up teams, um, showing them how easy it is to create basic charts and data wrapper that not only increase engagement and dwell time on their stories, but help them see where trends emerge, where records have been broken and what the bigger picture is. We utilized our graduate data journalists by uh, embedding them on key teams like business, sport, and property to show those teams what data could do um, and how they could start using data and charts in their day to day reporting. And to make it as easy as possible for people to start building charts and improving their data skills, we implemented a custom theme from Data Wrapper, which automated a consistent design and style across all of our charts. So the changes from this approach became cl clear pretty quickly. Um, in 2018, more than half of the whole company's charts were being created by one person. Um, and as you can see here, as more people have developed their data wrapper skills, it's really spread the load across the newsroom. Um, so we've increased the number of people making charts, which has increased the number of charts that we can make as an organization. And in turn, that's really freed up the data team's time to 
do what we do best, data investigations, more complex analysis, and bespoke interactives. So I see our workflow as kind of four levels of knowledge. So we'll start with what we expect everyone to be able to do. Um, at this point, now almost all of our journalists that work with data, even in the most minimal or tangential way, can paste data into a data wrapper um, to create a basic line chart, column chart, bar chart, or table. Hey folks, I think Matilda may have gotten disconnected. There she is. Hi, sorry about that. Um, it just booted me out of the room. Uh, can everyone hear me and stuff? I'm going to assume yes. Um, and <laughs> I'll keep going. Um, so here we've got an example of a chart showing Bitcoin's price after each halving event, um, which was created this week by one of our money reporters. Um, we also encourage individual teams uh, to learn functions that are useful to them specifically. So here's a chart that was created by one of our sports reporters this week. Flags are particularly important on their desk and they now often re incorporate those into their daily charts. Uh, and as you can see, the custom theme comes in handy here. Our reporters can really easily make charts that fit with our house style and use our color scheme without needing advanced knowledge of data wrapper or graphic design. But we also have additional oversight just in case. Um, so we use data wrappers Slack integration for our channel uh, called DataViz Review, which posts every time someone publishes a chart. Um, so that way we can keep an eye on what's going out and make tweaks or offer extra training where it's needed. So as we've rolled out this basic training, we found that some reporters were keen to experiment with what Data Wrapper can really do. All of our graduates, whether they're news reporters, sub editors, picture journalists, um, they all do a secondment on the data team where they spend a few months with us learning what we do. So uh, with more time to play around with Data Wrapper's functionality, a lot of them became interested in making more creative charts. Uh, we also found this when we embedded data journalists on other teams like money, um, when they realized just how much it could do, a lot of the reporters were excited to learn more about it. So this is a chart that was made by one of our health journalists this week after he was dispatched to India to report on the world's largest vaccine factory. And having reporters in data heavy areas like health or crime uh, with advanced data wrapper skills like this really lightens the load for the data team. Um, and means we have more time to train up other journalists and work on our own projects. This chart was built this week by a graduate who's temporarily on our team uh, called Jess Sharkey. Um, and training up young journalists to be date wrapper pros and then sending them out into the newsroom has been really key to upskilling new teams and, as I say, spreading the data gospel. Um, and these reports still lean on the data team. Um, we have Slack channels, uh, and obviously we're there to support in person with analysis and to check the final products. So other people we found were less interested in the creative possibilities of Data Wrapper, but we're excited by the technical aspect of it. Um, some of our journalists had tried to learn coding before or know a little bit, but weren't sure how to implement it in their journalistic practice. Um, and there are lots of areas of our newsroom where the same data sets get reused and recharted uh, kind of month after month and year after year, um, particularly in areas like politics or health or the environment um, or some of our more bespoke products like the Sunday Times Rich List. Um, so we've now automated a lot of these using Data Wrappers API. Um, so we have R scripts that pull and analyze the data, which then plugs directly into Data Wrapper um, to update the charts that we use time and time again. Um, and it's a really good place for journalists that are interested in coding to get started. When I 
first started learning R, I got used to the process by running scripts that other people had built. Um, and then I could figure out what each line of code was doing until I could create those scripts myself. Um, so we train people to download and use the basic functions of our studio uh, and access the team's GitHub repository um, so that other journalists can do exactly that. Uh, and then they can start learning R in a way that's directly applicable to the work we do every day. Um, so using Data Wrappers API, we've now automated all of our election polling trackers, uh, which is going to be a godsend in a year with so many elections, um, and lots of our charts on the environment and climate change, um, and those other key data-heavy. Looks like we are starting off this session with a few technical difficulties, but I think that Matilda will be back in just a second. Sorry about that. Hi, sorry. I'm not sure why it keeps booting me out. Um, but let's pick up where I left off. Um, so I was saying, yeah, we've automated lots of our charts now uh, using the API. So our politics charts, um, our election trackers, lots of our environment and climate change charts um, and other kind of data heavy issues that um, get reported on again and again. Um, as far as we see it, the more people that uh, have these skills in R and can run these scripts, the better, um, because the more we can automate as reporters apply those skills to their own beats um, and it makes their lives and our lives easier simultaneously. So then we have the experts. Um, everything I've talked about uh, so far about upskilling the rest of the newsroom and redistributing the workload means uh, that the amazing data team that I'm super lucky to be a part of um, gets more time to work on bespoke projects and investigations and in-depth analysis. Um, so my colleague, Venetia Mingus, recently conducted a data-led investigation that uncovered uncovered the anxiety drug that has the fastest rising death toll of any drug in the UK, pregabalin. Um, my colleague, George Willoughby, uh, mapped the shocking spread of Japanese knotweed across the UK uh, over the past 100 years by combining QGIS analysis with Data Wrapper's amazing mapping features. Um, and I've been used, able to use my extra time to experiment with new data wrapper ha hacks to tell um, equally hard hitting stories like how successful every Taylor Swift album is or how many recycling bins people have in every corner of Britain. Um, so encouraging people at all skill levels to get more involved with data analysis and data visualization has been pretty successful. Um, we're still spreading the data gospel and teaching people how to use data more effectively uh, and utilize data wrappers, incredible functionality and incorporate data more into their daily work. But what we're ultimately striving to achieve is to make the newsroom not view the data team as the geeks in the corner um, or even as an editorial support desk, but as specialist journalists in our own right. We're still always on hand to help our colleagues when needed, but using data and data wrapper in particular, we think should be a part of everyone's job every day. Um, yeah, and that's me. Thank you so much for listening. It's been such a pleasure to be involved in Data Wrapper's conference and the other talks have been brilliant as well. Um, you can get in touch with me here. I'm more than happy to answer any questions or link up after the conference. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions now. Um. Thanks, Matilda. Um, we have time for one question, uh, but I did want to say excellent talk. It was very interesting and well thought out. And thank you for rolling with the punches. Um, yeah, I'm sorry I kept dropping out. <laughs> no, not your fault, I'm sure.
We do have one question that I wanted to talk about. Uh, this one is from Yannicka Borg. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and they say, how and why did you get the buy-in to invest in upscaling the whole team? Uh, that's a great question, Yannicka. Um, as I say, it all kind of started from the way that we were spending our days. It just so much of our days was spent building kind of the same line chart over and over again. Um, and I think a lot of the data journalists got a bit frustrated with it because, you know, we're journalists with our own ideas for big projects and things like that, that we just didn't have the time to do. Um, so that was kind of the spur of it. And the more of those projects we were able to get out and kind of prove what we could do, the more receptive uh, their senior management were to us kind of changing the way that we work and, as I say, upskilling people in individual teams as well. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how we started it. Fantastic. Makes sense. Um, well, thank you once again. Uh, and now I think we are ready to move on to our next speaker. Uh, I'm happy to welcome um, Markus Finn Ham Hamana uh, and Surin Müller Hansen. And I'm very sorry about my accent there, um, but I very much appreciate both of you coming through. Both of these speakers are data journalists at Süddeutsche Zeitung. Uh, Surin's focus is on in-depth election uh, coverage climate change and public health reporting. And Finn's work is in data analysis as well as large scale automated stories. Um, very excited to hear about from them about how SED uh, covers current stories uh, with the API and uses it to get the most out of data wrapper. So Zorin and Finn, if you're ready, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Um, as I just said, we're going to briefly talk about how we use the data wrapper API from if, for everything for, from quick prototypes to charts that play basically all the bells and whistles. I am Finn. I freelance with Süddeutsche, and this is Sören. Yes, hi. And sorry for our names, which are really hard to pronounce, especially mine and Süddeutsche Zeitung as well. Um, but, well, that's the way how names work here in uh, Germany or in uh, Scandinavia, where my first name is from. But uh, let's move to the talk. Thank you for having us. Um, and we want to show you four things, four key uh, things you might take away from our talk. The th uh, first thing is that, that you should forget about a copy and paste and use the data wrapper API whenever it's possible. Um, the second one is how data wrapper fits in our automated pipelines and that you should use that too if you can. Uh, the third one is that it's even possible to use data wrapper to fake interactive dashboards. And uh, the last point we want to make is if you don't have time for custom chart front ends, then just use a lot of data wrappers. And um, we want to do a little shout out to Benedikt Witzenberger, who uh, worked with us some years ago at Süddeutsche Zeitung and created this data wrap R package, which we built our work heavily on. Um, and it's very helpful. But uh, don't be afraid. All these examples we show here are in R, uh, but are of course transferable to other code coding languages you might use. All right, um, and on to our first point, um, the almost heretical, I think, uh, point that you should forget data refers core main selling point to just copy paste data into data wrapper and you have a chart in a couple of minutes. We say sometimes forget about copy and paste, use the data wrapper API to create your charts. Why would you do that? Um, 
what we often do is we create a chart in the user interface, uh, copy the ID from, from our URL, paste it into our um, development environment, our tidyverse pipe, directly in our analysis, and then design um, our chart in, in DataRapper, uh, basically refresh the browser window and go pick a scatter plot, um, change the size to the variable. Um, then we have our first prototype and can go on um, either doing other charts or why we do this in the first place, the profit in what comes afterwards. You can continue using the pipe in your notebooks, which gives you a synchronization between analysis and charts for free, which gives you reproducibility. Um, or even for automated data updates, you can expand your pipe or the script around it to also update the metadata, for example. And uh, soon we'll talk more about our metadata in our automatic pipelines. Yes, thank you. Um, I think this is really great to do half reproducible code because I sometimes forget where my data is coming from. I did maybe a year ago or two years ago. And um, to build on the work I did previously, I like to have it somewhere uh, in my code. And that is something we, we also use to do a lot of automatic pipelines because we have tons of charts which we update on a daily basis uh, during the COVID pandemic. We even did uh, updates several times a day. Um, and that's all possible using the Data Wrapper API. Uh, one thing, or the first thing I want to show is the most simple one that we can just upload new data to our charts using the API, like Finn already showed us. And um, what we then always place in our chart is some kind of date because we want to know when the chart was last updated. Our readers should know that uh, and that's something we put in there. And you can also use uh, the API to change, for example, the color or the width of lines if that's necessary. Um, some more advanced things are, for example, text annotations, which we use and even move where we need uh, these text annotations. One example here is um, the Republican delegates for uh, the primaries now, how many delegates are already elected, how many are missing. This is what the chart here shows. And we want to uh, lead our reader's eyes to that point we want to make there, which is that uh, 1,354 delegates are now elected. And um, on the left side, you can see the data wrapper front end where you can put in your text, uh, put in the exact position where you want to have that label and all that you can find, can also find in the metadata file. And uh, that file you can adjust using the API. Here is some uh, um, of that metadata in our studio where you can find this X field, the Y field. So all the coordinates, you can find the text and you can adjust all that. And that's uh, something we show on the next slide. There we just use that part where we have the text annotation, uh, the X and Y axis and where to put that uh, label. And we just exchange it every time we uh, publish the chart and push new data there and then can just easily uh, create a chart with um, great annotations. And to show you some more examples why we need that is especially to lead our readers' eyes. On uh, If we publish charts on a daily basis, we want mostly want to highlight the current status of the data. And that's something we can greatly do with these uh, text annotations, which we push via the API. Um, one last thing, which is also possible and which we used during the COVID pandemic, were these trend arrows. 
where we wanted to highlight in which direction the pandemic is leading. And um, that is something we once figured out how this SVG code has to look like, like to create these errors. And uh, then we could put them in here, mark this markdown, parse the markdown um, button in the data wrapper um, field. And then we could use these errors even for our print version. Um, and that was very helpful. Um, and now I'll talk how we can use all that to even build interactive dashboards uh, with Data Ripper. Um, some of the speakers before us already talked about HTML buttons, which can be introduced into charts to build some fake interactivity, or it's interactivity, but to fake uh, loading new um, charts. And we can also use that and adapt that using the API. The example here is uh, a map of the risk of infection depending on group size and vaccination status for all counties in Germany. Um, this was close to Christmas time and we wanted to show how risky it is to meet smaller or bigger parts uh, or groups of people depending on uh, their vaccination status. And there are just four simple, quite simple steps to create such uh, interactive dashboards with Data Wrapper. The first is just create a chart as we already showed in Data Wrapper, customize it as you need it. And the second step is that you can build in these fake hyperlinks um, that's shown on the next slide, I guess. And um, on with these buttons, yeah, there it is. Um, we used a lot of code um, provided in this uh, Data Ripper Academy blog post and just adjusted it to our needs, adjusted some colors to highlight which button is selected at the moment and um, which chart it should, uh, the link should lead to. And we built this first with some fake hyperlinks and then we copied the chart. This is the third step and repeated that. And it's definitely better to do that using the API because then you can easily store the ideas and what it should show directly in your uh, code in a data frame. And the third, uh, fourth step is then to uh, insert the correct data and exchange the hyperlinks because you can find this intro field where all these uh, HTML buttons are um, written into and write in there whatever you need and exchange easily the IDs, I, uh, the colors and so on for every chart. And if you need to change something, it's quite easy to do it in your code and you don't have to get manually into every chart and change that. All right, thank you, Sia. Uh, the uh, last and slightly absurd point is if you don't have time to program chart yourself, uh, you might just get away with just creating lots of data wrappers. Um, our challenge was in our election reporting, we had one article per election district. Um, and we wanted to show a scatter plot showing all results in all districts, but highlighting the current district. So the district uh, um, that uh, was written about in the page the data wrapper chart was embedded in. We did not have resources for a custom program solution because our resources that could have programmed it were busy programming the 300 articles um, and the infrastructure for that. So what did we do? Uh, we created a data wrapper prototype and scaled it up. Uh, we had one prototype and copied basically 300 times with the same settings and st style, but different annotations in each chart. We had a custom view on the data for every, every chart. What you can see here, for example, is the results of 
uh, the conservative party um, in comparison. Um, so we have the amount of uh, votes on the uh, x-axis and uh, wins and losses on the y-axis. We really like this view on the on election results, uh, but it it gets a bit overwhelming, so we want the annotations. Uh, and you can see here um, the chart versions for Munich East, Munich North, and Ingolstadt. And you can see very different positions for the Conservative Party in uh, the same cloud. Um, and of course, we don't only have to do this for three or 300 districts, but also for each party. So here you can see the same uh, repeated for the SPD, for the Social Democrats, for the AFD. Um, <clears throat> Germany's more right-wing party um, and not shown uh, even more parties. Um, and um, then, of course, we created a chart showing all parties. And here again, you can see annotations for on the left bottom Munich East, one for each party in Munich East. Uh, on the top, we have Ingolstadt again. Um, and on the bottom right, we have Munich Nord. Uh, and that's, of course, not the end. We also had to connect those charts with buttons um, so that you could uh, our users could uh, decide what um, what party they might want to focus on. Since it's such a complicated chart, we did want to provide different views on the data. All right. So that's already the chart with all the bells and whistles. Uh, what did we need for that? Um, we needed an overview, of course. We had to create all the charts and have had an overview of all chart IDs and what content is supposed to be in them. We had to have labels, um, text labels and annotations depending on the selected districts, which CERN has shown before how you can do that. We had to align the limits of each chart so the transitions between the charts um, kind of worked out. Uh, we were lucky that we basically chose limits that um, before the election that worked during election night, but we could have fixed that using the data wrapper API as well. We faked the dashboard using the HTML buttons, um, as uh, Laman Sander in the comments uh, noted that there are Python examples from his previous talk um, as well. And um, we actually published the first versions of our election night articles without the scatter plots and only slowly filled up our 2,100 charts and then added them to the articles because we wanted to be nice to, to the server, especially we didn't want, because we didn't want that it's of a team um, that we would do this. Uh, not that we had any reason to doubt the service because it, everything went smoothly, but uh, no one wants that additional risk on election night. All right, would we do this again? Um, it's complicated. Our most current version is a custom graphic created by our visual desk. At, uh, in the next election, we did have some resources um, and we could have a custom graphic that was just past uh, the district ID and which parties to show. Um, we had those over 2000 data report charts as a workaround for a lack of um, development capacity, but we of course, we'd do it again. It's not the first choice, but if it was the choice between no chart because of no capacity or um, this hack, which we would take the hack any day. Um, yes. So. Thank you, Finn. Um, so just uh, to wrap up, let's uh, repeat the key takeaways you should uh, take away from our talk. Um, first, don't use copy and paste too much. Use the data wrapper API if it's possible. Um, use 
the data API to automate pipelines because this can help a lot uh, to report on current topics. Um, use data repo to fake interactive dashboards if that's uh, necessary. It's uh, very helpful. On the last part is don't hesitate to build lots of data repos. That's especially possible with the data repo API. Um, so if you don't have time for custom chart front ends, then use this solution. Um, and that's it from us. Thank you for having us. If you want to reach out, you find our contacts here. You can write me an email or visit uh, Finn's website. And yeah, thank you for listening. All right. Uh, thank you both for such a wonderful speech or talk. It was great to get a peek into the process on your side and see what features are helpful, uh, what kind of hacks you've used. Very interesting, especially uh, the faking a dashboard. Um, I do want to encourage all of our audience to drop any questions that uh, may have occurred to you in the chat. I think that this one was probably a very thought provoking one. Um, and I do have one question of my own, uh, just, I, I have a couple of questions of my own, but I want to lead with one of these. Um, the idea of putting up a dashboard for those uh, vaccination rates in counties in Germany, that map looked very intricate. Um, and you mentioned it went up right around Christmas, which I, I think was not that long after vaccination started. How long did it take for that process to go up in terms of start to finish, if you remember? Uh, the time we needed to build that uh, chart I think it wasn't that much time because uh, we already used those buttons before and uh, well, we built heavily on the um, Data Repper Academy blog post um, and that helped a lot. So we just had the idea that we wanted to show the risk of uh, meeting different groups of people because it depends a lot uh, how many people you meet, um, how big the um risk of infection was and at that time we had some rules in germany how many people you might even be allowed to meet at the time so um yeah, i think it was just from the initial idea to the end of that story it was maybe two weeks but to build that chart it was uh a day maybe i'd say i mean incredible um and i think to be clear it was about a year after the first vaccinations in germany so okay um, the vaccination Thank rates you. were were relevant at the time um but yeah it was not yeah. like we have the first vaccination in two days we need to <laughs> already need a data story on that yeah makes more sense i i got my dates wrong uh Corona, I like to block it out, but <laughs> um, I also did want to ask, um, Zoran, you mentioned at the top that you use this pipeline method to maintain and keep track of data that spans back years. Um, are there any specific projects that have been that long running that you'd like to mention beyond the usual co Corona projects? Well, um, in my work, it's most of the time it's, it's uh, climate related data because uh, this comes up again and again. And sometimes I want to build on some reporting we already did a year ago or two years ago. And um, well, there are a lot of um, data sources out there. And to remember where my original data is from is quite hard. So I tried uh, to write that always write that into my code and then use that information if it's possible even to download the data in the code then push it to the chart and uh, work that way so it's greatly reproducible and that's uh, what I try to do it's not always that I do that and I um, think that's quite bad that I don't but uh, I try to do it it's definitely a best practice from the sounds of it. Oh, sorry, Marcus. Oh, good. Um, I think the other long-running um, 
dashboard like article is a um, natural gas um, status of natural gas uh, in Germany, um, which also was where many of the screenshots from of our examples came from. Fantastic. Yeah, both very relevant topics. Well, fantastic. I think we're right about time. Uh, thank you both once again. It was a wonderful talk. Um, and now I am very excited to move on to our third session of this block. I'm pleased to introduce Jared Whalen, who is a visual journalist, designer, and web developer at the Axios Visu Visuals team. He'll be speaking on how batch chart creation and automated workflows to help Axios reach multiple cities, each with their own unique relevant versions of a particular visualization based on the same data set. So I'm thrilled to hear about this process. I'll cut right to it. Um, take it away, Jared. Thank you. Okay, so um, my name is Jared Whalen. And like I said, I am on the visuals team at Axios. And today we'll be talking about how we use data wrapper to create charts and batches. So a little context, if you're unfamiliar with, Axios is a short form content, um, is, sorry, Axios is a newsroom that is focused on producing short form content for both the web and for our newsletters. We have about 50 of those and every week we are sending out hundreds of newsletters. So it's quite a bit of content. A large portion of that content comes from Axios Local, where we currently have micro newsrooms in about 30 cities each with its own reporters and its own daily newsletters. The Axios visual team helps support every single one of these cities. So it's very common that if we say, make a map for our Texas newsletters, within a few hours, we'll get a bunch of requests like this for other cities wanting us to make versions for them. And as Axios local grows and grows, we are just producing more and more batches each week and the need for coming up with a good solution becomes more evident. At first, the team was making batches one chart at a time. And the obvious problems with this workflow is that it's not really a great use of anyone's time. It's more prone to mistakes and inconsistencies between charts. It makes updating batches a nightmare. And it also has the unintended consequence of everybody being sad and having a full of self-loathing. Our solution at Axios was to create a command line based workflow that leverages the data wrapper API and R. The idea is that one template and one data set can equal dozens of charts. To start a batch, we always begin with a template. This chart and all of the styles would then be copied for each of our locals and the underlying data will be updated. We can also update text and styles using a dynamic text template pattern. For example, in this case, we have this series ID in the headline and every for every chart that is going to be updated with whatever that series ID is, whether it's a state name or a city. We then structure our data the same way that you would see it in data wrapper. You see that we've also added a series ID column that represents each um, chunk or each section of data we want to split into. What that, what that column allows us to do is we can then split this big data set into chart size chunks that we can then pass to our template. So once again, all we're really doing is taking a data set, splitting it into pieces, one piece for each, is it, sorry, we're taking that data set, splitting it into pieces, and for each piece, cloning the template and updating the data along with any text and style properties we've configured. We bring it all together into a Git repo that contains all of the files used in this workflow. For each batch, we pull down a copy of this repo and replace the data file with our batch's data. We can then run all of the commands for this workflow from the terminal using a utility script that prompts the user for which process they want to run, whether it's a chart or a map. It asks for the template ID and then a folder for where you want to store the charts. Once all the charts are published, the embed information for the batch is automatically saved to a Google Sheet that can be then shared with anyone in the newsroom. This means that nobody has to go through and manually collect them. Rather, we can just write from the terminal, copy the outputted Google Sheet, and send that to whoever needs it for their stories. The repo includes workflows for both charts and maps, 
and is flexible enough to pretty much handle any of any type of graphic that data wrapper supports. So you can see here that we have maps, we have some pretty um, stylized scatter plots, we have um, column charts, and really anything that um, takes like rectangular data, we can then um, automate the process. If you want to take things one step further with some code customization, you can even go deeper with the API and update things like base maps and annotation positions. For example, here are a few beautiful maps created by Erin Davis, where she extended those R scripts to update the map with custom topo JSON. A generalized version of this repo is publicly available on the Axios Visuals GitHub, along with instructions on how to set it up for the team. If you found any of this useful, please take a look and use whatever works and pretty much get rid of what doesn't make sense for your newsroom. And I just posted a link to that in the chat. So what's next for the way we use the API and leverage data wrapper? As batching has become a bigger and bigger part of Axios Local's mission, we've continued to find ways to improve this process. One example is we made a simple tool to view all the charts in a batch at once and at different device sizes. All you have to do is take that Google sheet that gets exported, paste it into the input, and it will automatically load all these charts. This allows for faster editing and sharing a preview with reporters. Another big example of how we're improving this workflow and something that's kept me very busy recently is we're actually converting that R-based command line tool into a SvelteKit GUI that fits into our internal tool ecosystem a little bit better. In addition to making batches just more approachable for those who are not comfortable working in the terminal, it has allowed us to build in support for things like dynamic annotation placement and conditional property styling using menus and GUIs and things that people can actually manipulate rather than relying on flags in the command line. In summary, the Data Wrapper API and a bit of planning can go a long way in helping you and your team save a lot of time and save some of your sanity. If you're interested in using Axios Visual's R-based workflow as a starting point and have any questions about that repo, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you for listening. Awesome. Thanks, Jared. That was fantastic. And every bit as interesting as I thought it was going to be. Uh, Perfect. Very, uh, I love the um, text variables. I don't know that I've ever seen those in action like that. So kudos. All right. I don't think we have any questions in the chat. Oh, yet. Lisa's just posted one uh, question, opening for questions. Um, I have one. In our blog post where we announced you as one of our speakers, you mentioned that one of your number one tips for people working with Data Wrapper and wanting to kind of get better was to reach out to the data wrapper community, look around and see what other people are doing. I wanted to know where do you look for data wrapper community kind of mindsets since we've talked about Twitter is Twitter or X now and these places, these kind of third spaces in the tech world are kind of vanishing. Where do you look for data wrapper specific community like that? Sure. So a great space is like if you're familiar with the news nerdery Slack channel, which tends to yep. be a lot of people in the news space, but there's also people there who are just information tellers. And like you said, as things like Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it um, become not as useful, places like that that are a bit more focused um, tend to be a great spot. Another thing I would say is just as data wrapper gets used by more and more newsrooms, you can go to places that maybe used to rely on custom graphics teams for everything, now really relying on data wrapper. And many times you'll look at a chart and you're not quite sure if that's data wrapper and you right click and look at inspect it. And sure enough, they managed to really make that fit their style. Um, and from there, um, it's really just kind of digging around into how they do it. Um, obviously the data wrapper blogs are a great way to um, find some tips and tricks and hacks. Um, but it really is just one of those things where if you see a chart you like, try recreating it in data wrapper and see what's possible. Excellent tips. I love all of it. Um, and shout out to our comms team for the great blog and to the news nerdery Slack. Uh, great ideas. 
We do have a couple of questions up in the chat that are a little bit more related to what you talked about today, so we can pivot a little bit. We have one from Emma Rubin. Uh, can you speak more to dynamic annotation placement? What challenges have you had adding annotations to multiple an uh, automated charts at once, and how have you solved those? Sure. So the way that we are handling um, pl um, label placement, especially in the GUI, but this is possible with the R workflow as well, is whether it's in your data or a separate data file, just some way to associate that series ID. Like let's say it's Philadelphia, court, basically making sure that that value links up with um, however you're storing that those those annotation placements. So for example, a chart we did recently, um, we wanted to move the annotation up and down the, the Y axis, just depending on that series, that, that locals peak value. So for there, um, I'm pretty sure the workflow we did for that was we just had a separate um, data frame, essentially in R that um, pulled it for Philadelphia and said, okay, this value is 500 or so, and then pass that to the, I think it's metadata.visualize.text annotations or whatever that part of the metadata is, um, which again, I think as was said earlier, you just got to poke around and dig around that API. Um, but it's just a matter of trying to target it in there and do that update the same way you would update the text or any other property. Yeah. And Great job on that metadata key right off the top of the dome. That's impressive. <laughs> uh, we have another question from Katie Couch. I hope that I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, they say, how difficult is this to implement for a very beginner R user? So if you're referring to the, the repo that I shared, ideally following the instructions, you should be able to get it up and running with very little R knowledge. The question comes in, does that actually work for your workflow? Because for Axios, we're producing it, which is very specific to how we need things to run. Um, that being said, hopefully, with a very with a, with a base understanding of R, you can kind of understand what the, the functions are doing and then um, modify as needed. So it shouldn't take a, a super deep level to get started. And then from there, it's just as a matter of how customized you want to go. Fantastic. Okay. Excellent advice. Um, and thank you so much for sharing that repo. I'm sure that a lot of people in this uh, in this whole conference will find that very useful. It's definitely something that we get questions about. Um, and I think that we still have a couple more questions if we want to wait for any further questions to come through in the chat. Looks like we have no more questions. Everyone uh, is saying thank you, though. So excellent presentation. Thank you so much for the time. Um, and thank you all for the engagement, the questions. And now we are a little bit ahead of time. Is there anything else that you wanted to focus on? Or did you want to speak on any of the complexities that you are facing as you're going into the uh, creating that uh, GUI that you were talking about? Sure. I think the biggest complexity they were facing there is it's easy to understate when you're working with. Um, just scripts like our scripts that just they work either they work or they don't as opposed to a a user experience where you just have a lot more room for error um and errors tend to actually like crash the whole thing and like we're building this thing um so that way it lives on like a netlify server and it just has a lot more complications to it um so the reason why we are building that gui is because we do this so often we're easily doing five, six, seven of these batches a week. So anything to speed up that process really helps the people doing them. If you're like, that is like a very blue sky thing that we were able to make work without for several years. Um, so I show that as like a fun thing that we're doing with the API, but by no means feel as though that's where you would have to use. And also a real benefit of doing the R process is when it's a GUI, if somebody wants to add a feature to it, they have to go through the maintainer, who in this case is me, and we have to, to see if this makes sense to update. As opposed to the R workflow, every time every time you have a new batch, you download an instance or a, a copy of that repo, and you can customize to whatever your needs. So for example, in those cases with those um, beautiful maps with the top of JSON uploads, um, Aaron fit, fit basically took her existing R script for her analysis and kind of pipe that into that workflow. Um, so whether it's R, whether it's 
whatever your background is, um, learning how to just kind of take your existing workflow and funnel that into the API is very useful. Yeah, that sounds exactly right. And it definitely sounds like the guardrails there of the GUI will uh, benefit Axios. So um, thank you for elaborating and thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Uh, it was great to hear from you. And now I believe we're ready to introduce our next two speakers. We are going to be hearing from John McClure and Ben Welsh, both from Reuters. John is the EMEA editor for graphics at Reuters in London, and he also works on their custom built pipelines that publish hundreds of data wrapper charts each week to a global readership. And Ben is the news applications editor at Reuters in New York City. He has led the creation of an, creation of an entirely new system for automating charts with the data wrapper API. So they're here to speak on the automation framework that they use. It's the very first time that they're revealing this process. And in the interest of not delaying our peek behind the curtain, I will turn it over to John and Ben. Hey, thanks for having us. Thanks for coming, everybody. It's a real honor to speak at this excellent conference. I've been tuning in as much as I can over the last couple of days, and it's been super impressive and, and inspirational uh, to hear. Um, should we get into it, John? Let's do it, Ben. All right, I think we they already this. got the intros. They know who we are. We can buzz those. John, you want to tell people what Reuters is? Uh, Reuters is a uh, newswire service founded in 1851. Um, we're a big place. Uh, so there's about 2,500 journalists in around 200 locations. Um, what other factoids do you want me to pull out from all of that, Ben? Why don't you tell me? I mean, it's a huge place. I've only been here a year and I've learned so much. And I think really maybe no one knows everything that happens at Reuters. But there's three kind of big pieces to the company that the outsider might not know. One is that service that John talked about that's so famous that sends photos and breaking news to more than 2,000 newsrooms around the world in all different languages. That's that's thing one. Thing two, which which shouldn't be overlooked, is that Reuters is is uh, the, the the exclusive news provider to one of the world's major financial terminal businesses which has recently been rebranded as lseg it used to be known as refinitiv and that is in many ways kind of the pepsi to the coca-cola of the bloomberg terminal if you're familiar with that and then of course there's reuters.com which is where anyone can go and for free read a selection of our breaking news and our excellent investigative special reports and so those are kind of the three big pieces and arms of the company to keep in mind as we move through this. Um, and at the core of all of it is really the lifeblood of the Reuters business as it has been since the very beginning, which is breaking news, right? You know, literally there are hundreds, if not thousands of little itty bitty stories that are flying out from our offices around the world every day. And it's been that way for more than a century. One of my favorite illustrations at this point is this very, very real 1883 memo sent out from the London office where John now works to uh, the correspondents in the field urging them to deliver more breaking news. I won't read the whole thing to you, though it, it is an entertaining read in general. Um, one thing to keep in mind is back then the telegram was how breaking news was submitted. And the author of this memo is really pushing down on the troops to deliver more breaking news. Near the end, they actually give an enumerated list of the type of news that they would like to hear more of. My favorite little bit here, if you uh, slow down and squint and read, is a call for all disturbances arising from strikes, duels between and suicides of persons of great note, social or political, and murders of a sensational or atrocious character, uh, which maybe gives you a sense of how editors saw the news back then. It's still true to some degree today. But the key line in this memo that is quoted around the office um, quite frequently comes in that last paragraph where it is requested that the bare fact be first telegraphed with the utmost promptitude. And we say the line with a little bit of irony today, given the sort of elevated, uh, you know, British diction, the King's English in there. Uh, but it really is still true and really the essence of our business. Being fast, being first, being simple and clear is really the, the primary imperative of the company. It's the comp We do so much more than that, but it really is at the heart and soul. And it's that kind of mission uh, that we're going to talk about today and how Data Wrapper helps us serve it better. Um, and we're going to do that one by John giving an overview of how, you know, he and his team built this, I think, truly wonderful system for distributing Data Wrapper charts across all those different arms we talked about. 
and then how I came in and, and, and tried to do a little, tried to do even more with it. So John, you want to do part one? You want to take it, man? I'll take it. If you don't mind driving. Um, so like a lot of places, data wrapper filled a, a, a pretty predictable need for us uh, in our newsroom. We are, uh, I suppose, one of the larger graphics teams um, by comparison to folks who aren't working in some of the uh, mainstay newsrooms, but still compared to the number of journalists that we uh, work with, we're actually quite small. And so before data wrapper, we had all the same problems that I'm sure you've heard echoed throughout this conference about, you know, being very thinly spread, uh, always seeing like we couldn't quite keep up with the reporting that uh, the newsroom was doing and really sort of failing that first rung of, of our own company ethos to really be there for the big breaking news. And behind the scenes, uh, the reporters uh, and editors that we work with would often reach out if they couldn't get us to these really terrible uh, charting tools that would be uh, sort of scattered throughout uh, dark corners of uh, Reuters infrastructure. I've then found a very nice copy down there. I believe that is a real chart that's come out of one of the terrible systems. I think Icon is that one. Um, and so in a lot of ways, Data Wrapper was going to fill exactly the need that, that we all have um, in situations that we really need to scale out the number of people who can create uh, charts in the newsroom. Do the next one. If you would, Ben, I think you're driving or am I, or can I drive actually? Okay, cool. Um, so as Ben mentioned though, um, we're a little bit different because of our wire service business. And one of the main tenets of that was, is that we have to service uh, other media clients. And so in addition to parking charts on a website, we actually also have to distribute them in a number of ways to uh, other media who will then publish them on in their websites, papers, television segments, whatever. Go ahead and pull, I guess I'll say. Or can I? Uh, I think you're going to have to drive, Ben. Sorry about that. So um, at Reuters, we, so we publish charts in a lot of different flavors for uh, our media clients in particular. And so we call these different editions, um, some of which you'll be very familiar with coming straight out of data wrapper. So uh, embeddable HTML pages. So the chart that you could just embed with embed code. We also make those so that uh, our media clients can host them on their own servers. But we also make static and editable um, images. So PNGs, PDFs. We also make our source code for uh, all of our graphics available to clients. Um, we have clients who have um, developers in-house who like to customize things themselves. And then we do the usual kind of light dark mode charts, little variations like that uh, pull. But what that all means for us is that uh, that little publish now button is not the end for us. Um, basically, that's just the start of a process by which we have to uh, take our charts and make them ready for uh, media clients. You can go to the next one. Um, and to do that, we use data wrappers, publishing hooks, and the API. And basically what that does is it gives us uh, the ability to you know, suck out those charts in the various flavors and formats that we need. We can break open the HTML, CSS, and JS, do various things in them, repackage them the way that we need them to be packaged for our clients and ship them out. And that may sound like it's very specific to us, but I think it opens up a ton of options for anybody to do really, really cool things with data wrapper charts. Um, we use uh, AWS Lambdas so that this can really scale. We'll talk about how big it scales here in a second with Ben. But um, that post-processing step is really uh, key to us being able to service our uh, clients. Um, you can go ahead and get your from Ben. We also use custom fields in the chart editor. It's a really easy way for us to attach some of the vital um, metadata. Uh, you'll see these root and wild slugs. These are some of the weirdest nomenclature at uh, Reuters, I think, but these are basically little pieces of metadata um, that uh, allow us to categorize and make it easier for our clients to find their stuff. And then once we've done all that, we've tagged our things, we've repackaged them, we've pushed them all up, we can ship them out to the world through uh, a platform that we call Reuters Connect, which is where clients can come and purchase um, our charts in any of the formats that I mentioned. As part of all that process, while we're doing all this repackaging, um, 
we take the moment to go ahead and flag charts that are coming that our newsroom has made or that our team has made or that our bots have made. Um, and especially in the context of our newsroom, it's actually a really great moment. And I've, I think I've heard several people mention this, they deal with Slack or whatever. Um, it's a really great moment for us to uh, coach our newsroom and really have sort of a feedback cycle about the charts as, as people are making. This is one such example uh, from someone in the newsroom. Uh, and if you are, um, so at the end of the day, what that means is in the last 18 months, we've onboarded something uh, north of 800 reporters, editors, and producers across our newsroom. They're publishing dozens of charts every day. And what that means is that the load is off of our, uh, by comparison, small graphics. Team, so we can focus on sort of bigger things that we're known for, or just on combat graphics. It also means that reporters can do more niche work in their, in their uh, individual beats. And um, our producers have actually become some of the most important chart makers we have. They're the first ones getting out maps, uh, quick charts on the news as it's happening. Um, so once we have that sort of pipeline in place, one of the things that we started to try to do was do some of this automated chart building that you heard some of the others uh, here talk about. This is our first example. It was uh, done by Trev Swerton in uh, our graphics team. It's called Tremolo, which I think is a good name for it. It's a USGS powered earthquake monitor. So um, the, one of my favorite uh, examples of this was last year when the Morocco quake struck. Uh, we had these shape maps out. Uh, within minutes, um, and we continue to pivot on those uh, throughout the day, uh, add more annotations to them, and stuff like that. And continue to update them. So we've now had this really great system by which we can, you know, either by hand from the newsroom or through an automated process, create a chart and then publish it out into the world in all these various ways. And so we are ready to try scaling this thing way, way up. And that's where Ben comes in. Ben. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, all this work was, you know, kind of ready and waiting for me when I started at Reuters and I was trying to figure out what the heck am I going to do? Let's find something ambitious, a project to take on, something to chew on. And I found inspiration immediately um, from two places. One is, a, is a, a system that was invented here at the company a few years ago called Insight. And so this system is basically templated uh, text stories. So when new data comes in on the feeds, they're sort of fit like a Mad Lib into um, a, a templated story and then sent directly out into the wire. And this is a, a, a type of system that exists not just at Reuters, but at other news wires and has been very effective at increasing kind of the speed and scale of the text operation. Um, the graphics editor, Matt Weber, you know, approached me and he, you know, he said that he and others had had the longstanding idea of why can't we do the same thing for graphics, right? So if we can automate these mad lib text stories, why can't we automate the graphics that would go with the same thing as well? And I thought, man, he's really got a point. So let's 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 look at it. Let's see if we can make it happen. And and then at that point, I learned all about John's system, you know, which he just, I think, covered very well. And it kind of blew my mind. It's really um, just a, a, a powerful, you know, end to end kind of assembly line that's just waiting for widgets to kind of be to be to be pushed down it. Uh, someone who, who who can claim to have worked for the entire tenure of the Tronk company, it reminded me in some ways in my lighter moments of the the funnel, uh, which is one of the more hilarious, uh, unintentionally hilarious metaphors in journalism history. If you haven't seen the video, the link's right there. Give it a look. Um, and and I just needed to figure out how I could get the, the data in there. So, you know, on the on on the one end is the data wrapper API. If any, if we can put charts into the data wrapper API, the top of the funnel, so to speak, we know the flow entirely down through John's system. And it has, as has been covered by other speakers in this panel, that's totally doable, right? Um, and then I'm a Python guy, not an R guy. I, I found, wow, there's this cool Python wrapper for the data wrapper API that makes it easy with a couple of lines of Python code to pass in whatever chart you might want. Oh, okay, that's great. Started checking that out, started working with that. Sergio Sanchez Zavala is the inventor of that, by the way, cool guy. And then I saw on the other end, well, where are we gonna get the data to put into the charts, right? Well, we've got this terminal, okay? So this LSEG terminal system really is this kind of incredible database that is just lim that has limited access to a very small number of financial professionals who pay for it, but it it updates 
literally within seconds of new market data being posted or macroeconomic indicators appearing on government websites. And um, learning about it has really been eye-opening and interesting to me as someone who's never worked at a terminal business before. Um, the, the, the truth of it is, is behind a system like this is literally hundreds, if not thousands of web scrapers that are crawling government data sites and putting in new figures instantly when they arrive. And then a whole quality control layer of people who make sure they flow through. So we had this great delivery system for graphics on the other, and we had this great data source, you know, on the other end, we just needed to connect them. Well, it turns out there's a Python API for the terminal as well, which would allow, would allow anyone with access to write code to download the data from the terminal. And all we had to do was to kind of close the missing link between the data source, the terminal, and data wrapper, our delivery device. And that really was the work that needed to be done and was kind of the job for me if we were gonna make it happen. And you know, one way of thinking about a process like that, that kind of ferries data from one to the other, is what you know really gnarly, boring computer programmers call an ETL pipeline, right? I think it's good we're just calling them pipelines now. It's a little more human. But that, that's an acronym for ext extract, transform, and load, right? And what those typically do is the extractor you know, downloads the source data from wherever it comes from, in this case, our terminal, right? there's some sort of computer programming layer that is gonna, gonna transform, clean, summarize, reformat that data so that it's ready for delivery to kind of its target. And then the loading step is that process of then delivering it out in this case to say data wrapper. And so, what, so I set out to write something like that. In real life, the actual pipeline is a little more complicated, but it, that's really the essence of it. We're extracting from the terminal we're transforming it into the format for data wrapper and then we're posting to the API. The main sort of um, additional thing is sort of configuring each of your chart templates to behave in a certain way based on what the data source is, what type of chart you want, how you wanna manage the layout, which we call the generation or the configuration of the template. Um, here is an example of one from real, real life. This is a screenshot from our code base. At the end of the day, we basically have kind of a Python framework of classes uh, designed for each of those stages in the ETL pipeline that we then configure based on the template or chart. So this example, without belaboring it, is the unemployment chart that ran last Friday morning when the Bureau of Labor Statistics posted the new report. And again, if you were to squint and look carefully, you would you would see that it's it's really only about 20 lines of code. And most of it is really just the specific stuff related to what data file, what data series should I go get from the terminal? What should the headline be, you know, and uh, what the date range should be and some of the specifics of how the chart ought to be, you know, collected and, and, and rendered. And that's really all it takes to do, to do an individual chart. Um, those, the system that executes that sort of pipeline process is run entirely in GitHub Actions. If you haven't checked out GitHub Actions yet, you should. This is a free task running system within, within the GitHub sort of repository universe where your code repository has access for free to task running jobs in data centers that will do on a schedule or based on triggers you set run computer programming tasks. And so for each of our kind of, we have our, we have our templates sort of organized into groups around say revenue or um, jobs or inflation. And those groups of templates are then executed on a schedule very frequently. And when they detect that new data has been found in our source, the terminal, they make the chart and send it out to data wrapper. Um, and it's, that is, it is the production environment. It works flawlessly. Um, I recommend exploring things like this in your own work. Um, once they then deliver that to the data wrapper API, John's system takes over. And so this is the chart that got pushed out just one minute after the new numbers were posted to the BLS website last Friday morning. It flowed into, this is the graphics pool where an editor could find, select a graphic and then embed it into a piece. It was there and ready. Um, we're seeing these charts get delivered through the system faster than even the text, the text stories get written and edited. And they're often there ahead of um, when the reporters and editors are even thinking about looking for art. Um, 
So this, these are obviously speed wins. That chart is then you know put right into the story, which was on the homepage of Reuters.com and out on the wire in the next few minutes, as were several other charts that in the jobs report, because we have a whole kind of package of four or five. Um, but it's not just for speed. You also begin to benefit from scale. So that same, that same class that I showed earlier, you may have noticed that it had two entries, one for the United States and the other for Canada. So that same template can be adapted to a different data series with a slightly different configuration and boom, you now are doing two instead of one with the same amount of labor. And that can multiply to really, really large numbers in the right circumstance. So for instance, we have a template for a bar chart of corporate earnings. So every quarter, a, a, a public corporation will report to its shareholders how much money it made in the previous period. We can make the same bar chart. We are making the same bar chart for every single publicly listed company we choose to track, which allows us to make literally thousands of these charts within seconds or minutes after the data being discovered in the system. And that's where you begin to get to scale that no human's going to be able to do on their own. So it's not just faster. It, it can do quite a bit uh, more. Um, and the result of that is that the staff on John's team is freed up to do much higher value, higher skill work, which can also have much, much higher impact as well. So in, in real life, you know, that that once at once a month, every Friday morning, Ali Levine here in the New York office would have to wake up early and make that same batch of jobs reports every single time, unless she unless she missed her alarm clock, I suppose. Uh, but now the robot does that for her and she gets to sleep in and do things like this, this beautiful Walt Disney graphic they recently published instead. And of, you know, all the people and writers that I've talked to about this project, no one has been more excited about it than Allie, who sees it as really something that um, allows her to work on more rewarding and challenging work. Um, we have kind of a, a, an internal system that we've built for monitoring the output. Um, thus far, we have uh, close to 60 templates that we've deployed, including even a few that branch out to different inputs and outputs. So for instance, we have some custom web scrapers that power charts that don't use the terminal. And we, we actually are publishing some static images generated not via data wrapper that get embedded into a, a morning email newsletter series. So the pipeline system can also kind of horizontally scale, if you will, in that way. Thus far, we've, we've pushed through about 20,000 charts uh, to data wrapper in this system. Uh, that's according to my little profile row in our, our team our team page in data wrapper. Um, my hope is if, if, if we aren't already, we will we will have published more charts than anyone else on the platform uh, using using this system. Um, beyond the actual work here privately inside of Reuters, I partnered with Sergio, the the maintainer of the Python data wrapper library. And we recently have released a new version, which I think maybe we're announcing for the first time here today, which now covers 100% of the API endpoints on the data wrapper API. So anything that's documented in the data wrapper API, we, from creating folders and moving folders, organizing teams, uh, creating maps, all of it should be possible in the system. If something isn't, tell me and I'll make sure we get it in. And Sergio has been really great to work with on that. Um, for anyone who's really into API stuff, here's just like a quick example of, of how the Python wrapper could make a really basic chart. Um, for those familiar with the API, you'll see that the, that metadata variable is hewing uh, very closely to um, the sort of the JSON structure that the, that the data wrapper prefers to be posted in. Um, the result of that is that it's a little, um, it's just a little verbose and and maybe not as friendly to beginners as, as it could be. So, you know, one of my personal kind of dreams or goals, and I would love to get feedback and collaborators on this on anyone is interesting interested, would be to maybe pursue an upgrade to the data wrapper API that is more um, say declarative. This this is pseudocode that does not exist, but to me, this is maybe how I think the API ought to uh, accept Python code, where all of the attributes are sort of keyword inputs that they all would be uh, fully documented and listed out somewhere, which I'm, I'm not sure that they are currently. Um, and just generally trying to move towards something that makes automation easier and easier over time. So if anyone has thoughts or or interest in that, I would I would love to hear what people think. Um, this is kind of my little you know attempt at dreaming it. Um, and then finally, 
Um, Sergio and I recently prepared uh, a, a tutorial on how any beginner could pick up Python and begin automating data wrapper charts with, with zero uh, experience. Uh, we presented that one week ago today at the uh, the NICAR conference, the, the large data journalism conference in Baltimore. It was standing room only. There was, there was so much enthusiasm from uh, the data journalists we met to, to do more with data wrapper and to do more with automation. I'll share the link to this um, in the chat once I finish talking here. It is free to anyone and, and every step in the class is explained and all of the code is included as well. Um, I think that's what we have. I just want to thank you all for, for tuning in. It's, it's really appreciated and we'd be happy to answer any and all questions. All right. Thank you so much, Ben and John. That was a fantastic speech. Very informative. Great to kind of see behind the curtain and learn so much about the intricacies of what goes into pushing out 20,000 charts in about six months. <laughs> um, that turnaround time that you mentioned is really remarkable uh, and very impressive. I have a couple of questions while we wait for other questions to come through in the chat, things that came to me while I was listening to this presentation. You mentioned a Teams integration as a kind of klaxon to make sure that things were being reviewed or make sure that nothing was going wrong. Um, was that an idea for this project from the get-go or was that implemented after the core pipeline was sort of built and created? Um, yeah, no, that was part of the original project. I mean, we needed um, to feed back some information to reporters about where their charts went into the graphic system and just decided that was a really great point to go ahead and pop a image of the chart since we had that in hand already. And that gave us a chance to see what people were making uh, very easily throughout our day. And we could pop in some comments and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's actually been one of the funnest things uh, about the whole process for me because uh, you never know what kind of data you're going to see on any given day come through. Um, and uh, it's nice to talk back to the uh, newsroom of, uh, about what charts are making. Really um, true. It's also one of my favorite parts about this job is the not knowing what, what kind of charts are going to come through on any given day. It's very exciting. <laughs> can agree with you there. And great foresight on that. We do have a question from Nora Gully. Um, how do you byline automated charts? We don't put a byline in the data wrapper field. We list the source. If you know if the data comes from the terminal, we list LSEG as the source, of course. Um, uh, but you know, no chart is published without a human editor reviewing it and what in the language of Reuters packaging it with the story. And so um, and so, you know, we kind of view that as the editorial oversight on the piece. Um, if you're interested in how the quality control aspect further, I mean, we do have a committee of people that um, I review all the templates with before they're implemented. Uh, and so these are people who are experts in the domain that we're trying to, to, to make the chart for. And so they're involved uh, in, in kind of a review process prior to that. Okay. Makes sense. Okay, I do have one other question that came to me. You mentioned that a lot of your data comes from one data source. Is that always in uh, the same consistent format or is that ever cleaning that and preparing it for data wrapper? Is, I can imagine that would be a sticking point. Uh, is that always the same cleaning process? It, it, it's, it's mostly consistent. You know, it's, it's a truly massive database with a really wide array of data. And so it is definitely not 100% consistent. Um, and there can be, and, and across domains, there can be a little bit of quirks. Um, like for instance, commodities data is sort of, that is handled a little different from stock market data, which is handled a little different from the macroeconomic data in terms of what the columns are called or how you query it from the, the source API. And so that's where the Python pipeline kind of comes in. And the approach we've taken is to try to write kind of generic Python classes that handle the most common kind of variations. Hey, here's our monthly macroeconomic extractor and transformer, right? And that's going to handle most of the macroeconomics data. But then you can always kind of override or tweak um, 
you know, the individual implementations based on what the quirks might be. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, having that kind of room to adjust things but with human eyes if needed. Fantastic. Okay. I think that we are done with any questions that might come through in the chat. Um, I want to say thank you again so much for the time. It was an excellent speech. Uh, great to hear about it. And um, now we can move on to our final talk of the day. Um, the last presentation of our, not of the day, but the final presentation of our API block. We have an excellent closer here. We'll be hearing from Sean Green, who is an assistant editor on the data and graphics desk at the LA Times, the Los Angeles Times. His focus is on visual storytelling and environmental journalism, and he's specifically going to give us a closer look at how the LA Times has rebuilt its drought and water supplies tracker with Python and the Data Wrapper API. I'm really excited to see how Sean and his team use these tools. So without further ado, uh, welcome to the stage, Sean Green. Uh, hey, everyone, can you hear me okay? I'll just keep talking in case you can't. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, this is a tough act to follow. Um, hi, Ben, if you're still listening. Uh, ben was my editor at the LA Times in his last job. Um, and unfortunately, I'm still not a great programmer. So I hope that sort of the theme of uh, this talk can be how you can kind of get started automating a chart without being um, without being the best programmer or the fastest. Uh, so so let's uh, let's see what goes on. Let's see what happens here. Um, so, yeah, how we how we uh, built our our drought tracker kind of on the back of the data wrapper API. Uh, what I main things I want to talk about kind of are how I learned to work um, smarter and not harder, um, meaning you know less JavaScript, more Python. Um, how this process really benefited us in terms of uh, what we were left with um, a chart for kind of all these different news events that we experienced uh, weather-wise in the last year or so in California. And um, then we'll take a kind of a, a dive into to how I did it. And um, maybe if there's time, you'll see some of my um, weird and bad uh, pandas code. So look forward to that, uh, stick around. Let's, let's get started. So uh, smarter, not harder. This is something that one of my colleagues, Iris Lee said to me uh, one time and I'm trying to take it to heart. So our first version of the drought tracker, it really, um, it, it, it had a lot of Svelte JS graphics. It was kind of designed, um, you know, at, at a different time. It was, uh, I'll talk about that later maybe. Um, but we had um, some bar charts showing reservoir trackers. Uh, maybe if you live in the US, you've seen the US drought monitor um, has these, uh, splotchy maps that that show kind of where the the severe droughts are in in the US and in in different states and so so in in some ways you know javascript and d3 and svelte can take you places that that data wrapper can't go i i tried in vain to make a chart like this a map like this work in in data wrapper and either um you know i wasn't trying hard enough or uh, can't be done or you know i'm just not smart enough um, so, so, you know, some things there's a place for, for D3 and JavaScript. Um, but in other times I was, I was working, um, too hard, I think. So in, in our first iteration of the, the drought tracker, we wanted to track like reservoir levels serving California. So showing these bars, um, of like current water levels or, you know, um, percentages of various reservoirs and what it, what the sort of like normal level would be for that time of year. So whenever I made this screenshot, um, Lake Mead was 27% of or 27% full and 59% average. And um, this 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 type of chart, I think, was really a product of the time where uh, uh, California was in a crisis. There was there was um, <laughs> it, it hadn't rained in like what felt like forever. And, uh, you know, we really couldn't imagine that um, it would ever rain again because we had these like apocalyptic photos and headlines of like a 1200 year mega drought. So, um, of course, um, yeah, we, we didn't expect it to, to ever rain again, but then it obviously it started to rain and it started to rain a lot. Um, and you know, it just, it just kept raining for months and months. Um, and pretty soon those bar charts I showed you, they just didn't make any sense anymore because 
No one really needed to know that the reservoirs were very full, but what was more important was how things were changing or uh, basically we needed to pivot the, the drought tracker to um, something that, that showed kind of a longer tail. And all these other stories kept coming up like, um, you know, a massive snowpack. Um, I think, um, let me let me see. I, I'll show this snowpack chart later, but um, we, we needed to rebuild this with like a lot more features and um you know something that that can you know track these things over time rather than just give this snapshot so in looking at it um i could have or i think remember thinking about drawing some line charts and multiple charts of um like those reservoirs showing that over time and then i realized i'm really not good enough at d3 and svelte to figure this out and we kind of need it now or maybe even like weeks ago. Um, so I, I I looked at data wrapper or maybe someone said, try try doing it in data wrapper. Um, so we, we kind of like threw our hands up, we let data wrapper take the wheel. And I think our first version was, um, you know, made a single reservoir chart for like the state kind of total and then use the API to duplicate that chart and kind of just swap the data, swap the, the title. And pretty soon I had like 14 versions of, of uh, a reservoir chart, but you know, for Lake Mead, for Lake Powell, for Lake Berryessa uh, up in Northern California, Lake Shasta, I think is our biggest one. Um, the upsides of this was it was, it was way less code. It was this, you know, basically a single Python notebook running and updating all of these these uh, these charts. Um, and importantly for, for me, um, changing the chart type if we needed to is relatively you know painless. If you decide if you make a bar chart in D3 or Svelte, and then you decide actually I need this to be a line chart over time, um, that's that's tragic, right? Because <laughs> you have to start all over. So um, data wrapper is just, you know, change your data and, and click the button. And um, I'll talk more about this later, but the charts are also portable. So um, if you're writing a lot of stories about uh, a, a record snowpack or uh, the state of your area's reservoir levels, then you have this on your tracker, but then you also have like this chart kind of ready to go everywhere else. Um, so, so here's that reservoir chart. This is the one that I, I kind of think started it all. Um, California state government uh, publishes, you know, a sort of aggregation of all its like main reservoirs. So we started with this and then quickly be, was able to like duplicate it and make many, many more um, and kind of just arrange them all on our page. Um, and yeah, so news was, was going really fast and we also needed to add like the snowpack chart um which has become really important and really useful for us also you can see what kind of a a, a wild year we had uh, a while back with you know 250 percent of like 300 percent of average uh snow up in, in in our mountains it was it was tremendous um so you know the data wrapper api really let us like respond to to news and keep our tracker kind of up to date with all of these things that you know for better well not for better you know kind of naively we didn't consider um like ever seeing snow again uh <laughs> it was it was really that bad that we 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 thought snow was was kind of extinct in california um so a chart for every occasion uh this just means once you've made an automated chart, it's there, it's ready. So for example, um, these are the US drought monitor graphics showing the uh, kind of percentage of the the, um, uh, the area in uh, various levels of drought in California um, over the years. And these these two charts were made by hand by, by one of our, our graphics reporters. And um, you know, every time we needed to do this chart, someone would would have to, you know, do it 
by hand. And I think these were made actually before we, as the LA Times used data wrapper. Um, but now like this is, this is our new version built in data wrapper. It's always ready to go. Um, whenever we write a story about drought, we can just add this, this chart in and like, boom, we have that, that extra value, um, on our story. Uh, and you know, here's some other examples of charts that we just have ready to go. So one day, um, an editor came into our, our channel and asked like, Hey, how about we do a precipitation gauge? So I, I've kind of used existing drought tracker, our drought tracker pipeline to pull this data in, process it, um, and, you know, kind of, I just added it basically to our, our rig and, um, now we, now we have it. Same with the snowpack chart um, and all of my favorite little reservoir charts. And they're, you know, so easy and so ready to go that they even land in print sometimes like they did uh, like last week. So um, anytime we, we write about the Colorado River, we, we the, the, the graphics request is already fulfilled before it comes in. And that makes me very happy. So uh, let's we can dive in a little bit, um, and you know, feel free to ask questions in the in the chat if I'm going too fast or say something wrong. Uh, just let me know. Um, so let's let's kind of like unpack how how, uh, how we did the snowpack chart. So it's it's cool that um, well, okay. So so yeah, one first things first. Someone asked me, um, what's the difference between using the data wrapper API and, and having like an auto updating chart. So you probably are all familiar enough with, with data wrapper, you know, like you can connect a Google sheet or connect um, some, some kind of spreadsheet with live data and you can get your chart to kind of update on its own, but it only gets you so far. There are all these other little things like on a chart that, that are important to add, such as, you know, like maybe the, the last date of, uh, of the data or, Maybe your description has some some dynamic variables, or even an annotation that you want to like kind of track across the chart or update a number there. Um, so, you know, normally you know you could easily do that by hand on the website, um, but you can anything you can do by hand on the data wrapper website, you can also do in the API. Um, all you need is well, this isn't a, a beginner talk. <laughs> Uh, even though I would call myself a beginning coder. Um, basically, our, our process, it starts, you know, we, we have some Python notebooks that download the government data, we clean it, we shape it into a format that data wrapper or uh, some of our Svelte charts need. Um, a GitHub action helps us, um, you know, automate that. So we time it to run around the time that we know the, uh, the 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 departments the agencies uh, post new data, and then we have another set of notebooks um, in a private repo that that handle the data the, the data wrapper stuff. So it it updates the chart, it um, it runs new uh, dynamic variables, and it republishes the graphics like you know so that we have new stuff across the website. Um, and here's kind of an example of some of the code. So I, I actually marked it up. Um, we just set set some variables like little calculations, like the percent of average, uh, the April 1st, which is like um, the noted sort of maximum or traditional maximum of the of the snowpack. It's percentage of normal. We also set some dates and then we kind of build it all in these these JSON objects and we push it into um, like a little, uh, a little Python request, and we publish it, and you know, pretty much everything, everything's all done. Um, so, I, I can't really uh, explain, you know, everything about the data wrapper API. Uh, their their docs are, you know, uh, better than anything I could ever explain, and they taught me everything I know. So um, that's kind of it. Um, I showed you kind of how I kind of was able to really throw my hands up and say, you know, I don't need, you don't need JavaScript to kind of skip the, the whole development process and go straight from kind of 
a data wrapper prototype to scaling up really fast and and really evolving our our, our drought tracker in a, a matter of days instead of weeks. Um, and that had you know a surprise kind of benefit of never having to make the same chart twice, which um, is really great because um, I, I like to tell people that data journalists are lazy. Um, and so if, you, if you've got these charts, if you know you're gonna have to make it more than twice, then you might as well try and automate it. Um, it's, it's not too hard and give it a try. It's, it's actually kind of fun, I would say. And, um, you know, again, any, any customization you can, you can think of doing by hand, you can also do in the API. Um, it's just a, a little bit of JSON parsing, um, which I would argue is also a little bit fun to, uh, to play with. So, uh, with that, I will actually give a shout out to uh, my colleague, Paul Luginski, who recently retired and lends a lot of illustrations to this drought tracker. Um, here is his version of California in a, in a sort of uh, green and happy, happily watered state. So uh, I'll answer questions in the chat if you have them. If not, thank you. Excellent. Uh Thank you so much, Sean. It was great to hear a process that is probably going to become, unfortunately, more and more salient as uh, people have to change climate data, change charts based on climate data, which is changing more and more these days. Um, really excellent processes that you went over um, and great to hear all of these considerations and everything. We are having a little bit of trouble with our streaming platform, StreamYard. It looks as though people are not able to enter the stream at this point. So we are we are a few people less than we were, I imagine. And we also may not get so many questions in the chat. Um, unfortunately, we'll be able to post the recordings of this, but anybody who would watch back and have questions for you now live will not be able to ask those so much. I do have one question for me, uh, for you, um, that I have right at the top of my head. You mentioned uh, dynamic annotations, and those are really interesting to me. Um, haven't seen them much in use. I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit more about those. How do you choose the points to talk about? Is What does the editing process for those look like, um, and so on? Yeah, um, so the dynamic annotations, Really, I think we're just using them in the the snow part, uh, the the snowpack chart, and um, I'd say honestly, like just specific to that one, it was kind of a compromise because you could you could choose to to visualize the snowpack. Um, I'll just if you bear with me, I'll yeah. scroll back to it so we can at least look at the chart as we talk about it. Um, there it is. So you could visualize a snowpack in two ways as like a percentage of its April 1st peak. So we're kind of building toward like this, this sort of um, like almost hypothetical moment in time. April 1st is the, the, the time of year that, that officials typically say the snowpack is at its peak. So it's kind of a goal. Like we want to, to we want to, we want to be where we are actually right now where it's at a hundred percent. So we're following this kind of slope up. Um, well, you could also visualize it as a percentage of like it's the average for this date, which would kind of produce a kind of up and down, noisy, hard to read, and not very informative uh, graphic. Uh, it's it's probably because a line chart isn't appropriate for that. Um, but both numbers are important, so we wanted to to put them in somehow. Um, this produces a nicer chart and one that's more familiar. Um, so we wanted to we wanted to have that description reflect both numbers because because both are newsworthy in different ways. Um, for this annotation, uh, you know, it's just helpful to to kind of get the 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 number directly labeled, um, but can't be done in an automated way without updating it like through the API because normally, um, but I don't think it's possible. I, I think this 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 annotation has has to be hand placed. Data wrapper doesn't automatically place um, a number at the end of the the line, and if it stops in in the middle of the chart, this whole thing is kind of 
and and it was an interesting hack because you you have to it's a multi-line chart but made to kind of look like uh like this this shaded area is i could should have showed you the uh the data wrapper part but no i think i understand it's the it's the area fill underneath the line yeah, yeah exactly thank you i i don't yeah. remember the words actually Shayla, you know <laughs> that uh i frequently break things in data wrapper ask them ask the team why it's broken and then they quickly easily point out that I've, I've done something silly. Uh, so I really appreciate the data wrapper team for- it's always interesting okay. questions though. So it's never, <laughs> you, you get those points. It's always something that, oh, I didn't know you could do something like that. And that's why that's leave, why you ran into something. Leave it to me to break things in, in spectacular <laughs> and unexpected ways. Well, I hope I'm uh, them, though. Um, no, it's fantastic. You did a great job. Um, it was wonderful hearing you speak. Let me switch this back to speaker view. Um, thank you again for your presentation. We, I did just get word that the stream is back up. Um, so I think we are going to, I'm going to pass the uh, torch over to Lisa, but thank you again for your presentation. Great to put a face to the name over Slack. Um, and you. with that, thanks. With that, um, I wanted to say thanks again to everyone for tuning in to the API block of Unwrapped as much as you could have. Um, thank you all for the engagement, for the questions. Thanks to our wonderful speakers. And of course, thanks to the Data Rapper Comms team and everyone else behind the scenes who helped support this fantastic Unwrapped conference. That was the last block of our conference. So now I am going to pass it back over to Lisa to close out the conference. Thank you so much, Shelly. Very nice um, block you had there. Wow, what a day, what a conference. Let me bring up some slides because I do want to give some last uh, notes um, on, um, on this conference. Uh, it's time to wrap things up. We are almost at the end. Uh, and yeah, what an amazing conference it has been. We started on Wednesday, with a two-hour introduction to Data Wrapper, we had in total 33 talks with 36 speakers who told us about how they solve problems in their organizations or as individuals, how they creatively use Data Wrapper, how they really make the most out of it. Um, and that was amazing, as was the keynote by Amanda Cox. I think we all learned a lot there. And then we even had a product announcement um, where uh, David and Alana, the data wrapper co-CEOs, uh, introduced um, live collaboration and it edited a story. So that was all very, very great. Um, but I, yeah, I want to give a little bit of a behind the scenes look of how Unwrap came to be, if you have time for that, and thank some people in the process, as one does at the end of a conference. So. We at DataWeb have never organized a conference before. It was all a very big experiment for us too. Um, and I remember approaching uh, the DataWeb co-CEO, David, um, with the idea of organizing a conference, uh, I think last summer, and it really was just a small idea back then. And I was so grateful that he said, sure, let's do it. Let's organize a conference. And before organizing a conference, I thought, well, that's organizing just means writing a lot of emails, a lot of emails. And I mean, that's what happened. We did write a lot of emails, um, but we also had so many decisions to make. Um, and I'm not good at making decisions. Um, and so that was a little bit of a surprise or something I didn't really understand before. But yeah, so many questions to answer. When is the conference? Which speakers should we have? How long should they talk? When should they talk? How should we group them? Which conference software should we use that maybe doesn't break down in the last minutes? Um, thank you so much to David, my communications team, and everyone else at DataWapper who always um, was happy to lend uh, me an ear and to walk through decisions with me and make them with me and who trusted the whole process. Then half a year ago, uh, I started approaching speakers and man, I asked so much of them. I asked so much of you, the speakers. I wanted to do a mini interview with you. I wanted to, you to send me your favorite data about charts for a blog post. Um, and I mean, that's what we did. We did publish a blog post about every single of these talks. 
this, these are just half of them. You will find the other half on our blog. Um, so if you have any questions about or want to see the visualizations again that you saw today in the talks, you can go to our blog and uh, look for the unwrapped category. And there you have lots of mini interviews with super interesting answers that the, the speakers gave. But yeah, I wanted you, the speaker, to try out a new conference software um, that uh, you've never used before. I wanted you to use an uncommon slide format. And you all did so, so wonderfully. Uh, we learned a lot from every single one of you. So thank you. Thank you to all the speakers um, that um, attended and um, made Unwrap to what it was. In December, we then also put a call uh, for speakers out, which I'm so glad we did. Like, thanks to everyone who attended this call for speakers. More than 30 of you followed the call, um, which was way more than I expected, actually. And in the end, roughly half of the speakers we saw here in the last two and a half days actually came from people or were people who filled out the speakers form. For the call of speakers, we also started to work on the design for the conference, like a brand design. Thanks to the, our head of design, David, for making the conference design so much better, for designing a lot of things for it, like the agenda you can see on the website. Um, and thanks for him and for our website development, John, um, for bringing the agenda alive. Then in January, we started getting serious about organizing. We decided on a conference software. This is actually a screenshot I took. What was that? Like 45 minutes ago. Thanks so much to Guillermina, um, who's also on the comms team, uh, who hosts our webinars for being open to trying it out um, at her webinars directly for like the last two and a half months. And then at some point in the last two months, we thought, what if we reveal the feature we're working on right now at Unwrapped? Can we make that happen in time? And yes, yes, we did. Thanks to our head of app development, Martin, and the whole app team um, at DataOpper from like we could make live collaboration and edit history possible in time for Unwrapped and announced it yesterday. Um, you all achieved something amazing there. I feel like you did achieve the impossible by having it ready in time. Uh, and I'm yeah so glad we could already show it off yesterday. And then after some back and forth with speakers, the agenda was settled. Now we needed hosts for all the blogs. And so thanks to my coworkers, Giamina, Michi, Elliot, Gregor, and Shaley for being so open and immediately saying yes when I asked you to, to host a blog. Um, I think it was super nice that uh, the um, audience could see some faces of Data Rapper. And uh, yeah, it, it really made the conference better that you all um, led through the blogs, asked questions, introduced speakers. That, that was amazing. Well, and then the conference began two and a half days ago. Thanks to everyone at DataWorker, actually, for your excitement, for your late minute ideas on how to do things, for your feedback, for everyone who answered um, to questions in the chat, either here directly in the stream chat or on Slack. Uh, it was so nice to see all that excitement about uh, the conference, to see all the ex excitement about the speakers and what they had to show uh, internally. So, so that was great. And of course, and maybe most importantly, thanks to you. Thank you for attending this conference, for asking questions, for helping others, for showing us your work in the conference Slack, for simply watching. Um, your interest in Data Rapper and, and your enthusiasm uh, about the tool is so, so great to see. And it truly is a big motivation for all of us uh, who work at Data Rapper. The conference is over, um, but the Academy and the blog continue uh, to be out there to help you with data wrapper. If you didn't catch all the talks, you can also rewatch them. We put links to that um, or yeah, on our conference website, you can find them already there. And we also let you know in our blog once we upload all the talks to our YouTube channel. Um, so if you haven't already, you can also sign up to our blog newsletter with that little link on uh, keep me updated um, to never miss a new blog post from us. And of course, we at DataWeb are always just an email away. Um, our support team continues to be there for you to keep writing to us with your ideas for improvements, keep writing with bug reports, or simply with a, hey, 
look guys, I built something cool. Isn't that nice? Um, that input, like your input has shaped and will continue to shape data wrapper. Like we're always happy to hear from you. So um, it's a wrap. <laughs> um, at unwrapped, well, or at least maybe it isn't because in half an hour, we have a data book club, which I'm super excited about actually. It is not officially part of the conference. I did want to have the closing remarks before that, but feel free to join us. Um, in half an hour, we will discuss Alberto Cairo's book, The Art of Insight with the author. Uh, join us even if you, have, if you have not read the book, but just want to talk about data visualization a little bit more. Uh, we'll be there in this very stream after half an hour of break. Um, but so far, um, see you all at some point, I hope. We won't announce another Unwrapped. We'll just let that sink in how it was for now. But uh, yeah, what an amazing experience. Thank you so much, everyone. And maybe see you in half an hour. Bye.
Hello, everyone. Hello. All right. Um, welcome to the day with this book lab. Guillermina, do you want to say some words about how this works, etc.? Of course. Welcome, everyone, to this uh, new edition and ve a very a special one of the uh, database uh, book club. Just uh, a sanity check. Can you all hear us? If so, please write that in the chat. Um, I'm really excited uh, to do this um, book club session because we are uh, wrapping up Unwrapped, uh, Data Wrappers uh, first uh, conference. And today we have today we have a very special guest. Uh, I think it's a third time that he's going to be participating in the database uh, in the database book club. If you already have some questions ready, I know that many of you do. Please uh, leave them in the chat because um, Lisa is going to be taking them and we're going to be asking those as we go. So with no further ado, we have here Alberto Cairo. Many of you, many of you might know him. He's a uh, night chair in visual journalism at the School of Communication of the University of Miami. Again, he's been at the database book club a lot. This is the third time. Uh, and we're here to discuss his latest book, The Art of Insight, How Great Visualization Designers uh, Think, a collection of um, more than 20 or so um, discussions um, with conversations with database practitioners, uh, which are divided in four different groups, the pragmatists, the eccentrists, uh, ambassadors, narrators. Um, so I'm going to start, Alberto, because I'm not going to lie. When I, when I, when I uh, first started reading the book, I was really surprised because um, can we agree that this book is somewhat different from your previous one, how charts lie, the functional art, the truthful art? I opened it, and the first thing that I read is a quote by many philosophers, and it's, well, the first one that I read is a quote by Camus, um, which is, by the way, one of my favorite authors. And I was like, wow, I wasn't expecting it. So then the question is going to be, why? Well, because all my books are truly not just about visualization. <laughs> I use visualization sort of like as an excuse to talk about other things that are perhaps a little bit deeper or, or more important than visualization itself. This is not to demean, obviously, the value of visualization. Otherwise, I would not teach visualization, obviously, if I didn't think that it was that it was important. By the way, my position has recently been renamed. It's not visual, it's not night chair in visual communication anymore. Now it's um, a night chair in infographics and data visualization, which is much more specific. But in any case, going back to the topics of the book, of the books, for example, The Truthful Art, my second book, is a book about visualization, but it's more than that. It's a book more about how to reason about specific statistics and more specifically uh, descriptive statistics through visualization. Uh, how Chart Sly is not really a book about line charts, although it's it's related to that. Obviously, that, that's the main topic, but underlying that is the overall theme of misinformation. And not only that, how we project our own beliefs onto the charts that we see uh, nowadays, which is a topic that still worries me, and I will keep writing about it. Um, in the in the future. And then the Art of Insight, it's obviously also a book about visualization, but it's much more than that because um, there are plenty of books out there already about, you know, the basics of visualization, wonderful, incredible books. Um, the, the literature about visualization has grown, you know, much larger, much more diverse, and that's a, that's a great thing. So there, there are great, you know, instructional materials out, out there i mean including your own blog i mean the data wrapper blog is a great resource for uh, to learn how to how to design good data visualizations so i i said you know i'm i don't need to write about this anymore there are better people writing about this stuff already so let's try to decide to do something different let's try to write a book not about the work itself but about the people who produce the work 
And that is what The Art of Insight is about. It's a book about the people. And if we talk about people, we talk about human beings. And we are we talk about human beings, then it's a humanistic book in, that, in the sense that this is the reason why perhaps I quote so many philosophers of the humanist sort of like side of things, such as Camus, for example, mm -hmm. um, because I see data visualization as part of the human of a humanistic project. I see visualization in a similar way that I see writing. I actually make a, lo a lot of analogies in the book about how I approach writing and the teaching of writing and how I approach visualization and the teaching of a visualization. And there's another reason why I so many philosophers appear in the book, which is, uh, that's one of my biases. I never intended to become a journalist. I never intended to become a data visualization designer. When I was planning to apply for college, I wanted to study history and philosophy, and I have not stopped reading philosophy up to this day. So now that you say that you focused on, on people, you know, I'm thinking about myself when... Um, when I first approached data visualization seven, eight years ago, that I was I was a little bit scared because I knew that I that I liked presenting charts and if I liked information design, but I couldn't really I didn't know how to how to actually approach it. And I think this uh, uh, humanistic way and this like very personal way that you that you present through these conversations through these uh, talks with all these practitioners makes it, I think, more uh, like easier to approach, right? Rather than just, I don't know, in my case, I, I remember in, uh, I was going crazy following D3 tutorials here and there and or reading about color theory when in fact, probably I, what I needed was this book, was a more humanistic approach to, to data visualization. So is this why um, you wrote it to kind of like trigger that enthusiasm, inspiration for, I'm thinking uh, about people who are, who want to enter the field of data, of data visualization or this craft, like you call it. Uh, is this also why, why you, why you wrote it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, that, that, that's, I mean, I, I, I cannot name a favorite conversation from the book, but the section of the book that I'm most fond of is the ambassador section, the, the, the section that covers people who try to lower the barrier of entry to the world, not only of data visualization, but data analysis in general, who are trying to make the field uh, more open, more diverse, more equitable in many different, in many different ways both in terms of like a gender, in terms of race, in terms of like nationality and, and showing people that that this is not magic. <laughs> that's that's the thing. It's like it's like writing. I mean, it obviously, um, you know, as a, as a visualization designer, you can look up to sort of like the big names in the field, right? Uh, you know, Nadi, Bremer, Moritz, Stefaner, like all the usual suspects. Uh, and we should look up to them, but and we could aspire to become similar to them but if you don't become as good as they are that's also fine it's like i if you make the equivalence to let's say writing obviously i mean i've written tons of books but my writing is not as good as my favorite authors but that's perfectly fine that should not be an obstacle uh, to write if you have good ideas to put out and you think that those ideas can help other people you should put them out no matter how how good your writing is so visualization is very similar my goal is to lower the barrier of entry to demysti demystify the field a little bit, showing people that this is something that anybody can benefit from, that visualization is not just a great tool for communication, but also a great tool for understanding and reasoning. And again, similarly to writing, writing functions in a similar way. It's a great way to communicate, but it's a great, a great way to reason. You can only reason well about something if you explain it to other people, that's when you realize whether you have understood something correctly or not. And it really helps you organize your ideas. So visualization is very, is very similar. So the answer is yes, I, I just want to demystify it. I think that um, older literature of visualization, including perhaps some of my first books, give the impression that visualization is something hard or that it requires following many rules and stuff and that scares people away. A little bit and i wanted to demystify that saying you know many of the rules quotation marks in there that you read in sort of like in early 
visualization books are just the opinions of some people. They are not backed up by, including my own opinions, they're not really backed up by um, empirical evidence or evidence of any kind. It's just the uh, aesthetic preferences of some old authors, usually old white men, which is, so, uh, uh, is also an issue that we should perhaps discuss at some point. That doesn't mean that there is no evidence. And that's what I also try to convey in the book. It's like, I, I on the one hand, I tell people, just relax, you're going to do fine. Just get started, design some graphics. Here's how you do it, perhaps. Um, but just make, I mean, just, just be aware that there are not many rules to follow. There are still those sort of a growing body of, of, of evidence that you can look into little by little and that you can try to incorporate to your own work. You mentioned, for example, color theory. Lisa has written a series of posts about a color for the a data wrapper a blog, which are great. And, and you wrote about, you know, the empirical evidence behind some assertions. Don't use the rainbow color palette. Well, there's a reason for that. The word reason is really important in the way that we approach visualization. It's sort of like the philosophy of design that I try to begin pushing in the Art of Insight, and I will probably keep pushing if I write another book about visualization, which is already in my mind. Sort of like stressing the importance of reasons it's not about rules. It's about reasons. I do this because I have observed or I have read or whatever. You provide yourself with justifications to act in a certain way or not to act in a particular way. And you need to back up those reasons by either your own observations about how readers react to your visualization, or you can back up your reasons with, let's say, things that you have read in a scientific paper and so on and so forth. But at the very end, it's all about your personal subjective reasoning. And that's the reason why there is a sentence in the book that I like to repeat all the time nowadays in, my, in the latest version of my courses, which is that every decision in data visualization is subjective but it should never be arbitrary. For every decision that you make, you need to have a reason for that. We can discuss that reason and we can we could debate and we can disagree, but at least you have a reason that we can debate about, right? When Whenever we design a graphic. Interesting. I feel like uh, Jeff Maggi here really um, seems to understand it well. He says my lazy shorthand for your trilogy, like the functional art, the truthful art and the art of insight is what, how, and why. My students love the book, by the way, he says. Yeah, interesting, yeah. Interesting way to think about him. Yeah, Yeah, Jeff, long time friend. That's a, that's a great, yeah, that's a great way to put it, Jeff. Um, you know me too well. Um, yeah, Jeff and I have known each other for more than 20 years now, so sort of like we can read each other's minds sometimes. Um, I would not, I mean, yes, um, the functional art is, is perhaps the what, the truthful art is the how. The art of insight, I don't know what it is, the why, Maybe it's the why not? That, that's the thing. It's like it's a it's a book about, you know, there are all these approaches, all these philosophies, all these dialects, as I say in the book, of the language of data visualization. So it's like, it's like, why not? Why not doing it this way or this other way? Give me a reason not to do it in this particular way, right? That's the reason why I try to show I try to showcase um, in the book as many designers as possible whose work departs the most from my own way of doing things, right? Mm -hmm. People who design graphics that are more poetic in nature, artistic in nature, experimental in nature, I see value in that. It's just another expression of the language of data visualization. And I, I advocate in the book for judging uh, the work according to its own terms and its own and its own goals. Yeah, I really like, Alberto, what you say about, about the rules, because if, if we, the only thing that we do is just follow rules, then probably many of the beautiful pieces of work that we that we have here in the book probably uh if we the only thing that we only the, the only thing that we think of it are rules then you lose that creativity that uh trying new things uh thinking out of the box and coming up with beautiful pieces of, of work data art probably wouldn't 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 exist wouldn't mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Every, yeah, I've... yeah. It, I mean, again, it's similar to writing. I mean, you can, you know, for example, I've always been skeptical about manuals of, you know, handbooks of writing, like, you know, the um, the elements of a style, for example, which is a book that is used all the time um, in, in journalism schools. Uh, which is a good book if you know how to read it. It's like if you if you take it to the letter, 
Yeah, if you take it too literally, then you will your 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 writing will become stilted because you're going to write according to somebody else's rules, which are not really rules. They're just the opinions of a couple of guys who know who knew how to read how to write really well and try to convey their own way of writing. Right? It's like and 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 it's good to read that book. It's but it's, it's good to read it with a grain of salt. So what I advocate for in the literature of visualization is to approach the literature of visualization also with a grain of salt. It's like it's this is obviously um this book or this other book, they, they may be good to 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 read, they can help you become better designers, but at the end it is you who needs to make those, those decisions. And you need to read them with the assumption again that those books are written by people like you who make mistakes and have their own opinions about how to do things. And it's one of the reasons why, by the way, another change that I have implemented in my the latest versions of my courses is that I, I, I explain to people from the get-go, I don't teach how to design data visualization. I teach how I design data visualization. I am going to expose you to the way that I myself reason about data visualization. But there are many other ways to reason about data visualization. Mine is just one, and it is backed up by these reasons, right? But these papers, by these observations, experiences, so I provide my reasons. But at the end, again, it's a very subjective approach. It is not arbitrary, but it is very subjective. Yeah, and what do you think the role of, of copying or finding inspiration from someone else's work uh, has here? Because now that you that you say that you teach how you do uh, how you design information, how you do data visualization, uh, I bet that your your students and also other people uh, have used your work as uh, inspiration. And what I see, and I've done it too. You 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 grab a piece uh, or or copy this section of this. Uh, data visualization and kind of like make it your own. So, what's 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 your take on 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 finding inspiration on, on other people's work? And, mm -hmm. and I think that inspiration is crucial, uh, but its role depends a lot on what your let's say innate talent is for the field. Um, I think that some people come to the field already with some talent coming from I don't know generic generations I don't even know where it comes from but they just jump into the field and they you know change things completely and um and they do things their own way and I, there are a couple of examples in in the art of insight um a Jaime Serra for example who is um a very famous infographics designer who began his, his career in the 90s essentially changed the the changed the parameters of the discussion in the infographics field because his work was so out there and so different. Now, his talent to me is obviously has been developed, but there's something innate in there. So he came there copying no one. He just started doing his own thing. And same thing happens with other people, I don't know, Federica Fragapane, Nadi Bremer. There are many other people, Moritz Stefano. Moritz, Moritz is not in the book, but he could be another example. So people who naturally come up with something novel and new, and super creative and they break new ground and that's wonderful. Now, on the other hand, that's a minority. Those are the outliers. Most of us, we are just mere mortals. And therefore the way that we learn is just by copying other people. And that's that's the best, best advice that I received at the beginning of my career 30 years ago. I was given when I, when I began my career as an intern, as an infographics intern in a newspaper in Spain, I was given a, a bunch of books about, about infographics uh, that collected the work of many people uh, from all over the world. And I was told by the person who gave me these books, copy someone. It's like copy in the sense of sort of like emulating, getting inspiration, look into the work, see, try to decompose it, deconstruct it, try to find out what the reasons were to take this choice or this other choice. That was implicit in the in the advice. And then try to mimic that. Don't plagiarize anybody, but try to sort of like copy that approach, and then eventually you will develop your own style. That's a way that many artists have um, de developed their own craft. So if you look, for example, at the work of Pablo Picasso, it's like Picasso's first paintings were plagiarized. <laughs> he was plagiarizing other people. He was copying other artists because he was developing his developing his craft, developing his skills, and then eventually he broke new ground, developed his own style, etc. I think that this is a, this is a very good approach. Is to try to look into the work of other people, collect it, uh, look into it, try to mix things up a little bit here and there, and then eventually try to come up with something new. But even if you don't, 
come up with your own style, that's perfectly fine. I mean, if you create graphics that are perfectly, uh, let's say, conventional, but you know they tell the story clearly, they convey the ideas that you want to convey in a truthful and clear manner, that's the whole goal of the of, of the craft. Alberto, you mentioned uh, before that you, you didn't have, you couldn't come up with a favorite, favorite discussion or conversation from the book, but was there one that surprised you the most? All of them in one way, one, one sense or, or the other. Maybe the conversation with Alan Hillary, who is an African-American data analyst, um, who is uh, essentially democratizing data, data, data science and data analysis? He's based in New York, and he's writing a lot about a historical, the, the historical development of data analysis, data journalism. You know, writing about the book for the, sorry about the work, for example, of Ida B. Wells, who is who was an activist at the end of the activist and journalist. Uh, she was labeled as an activist, but she was working as a data journalist collecting data about lynchings in, in the United States at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. Um, I feel ashamed that before talking to Alan, I knew very little about the work of uh, Ida B. Wells in the, um, a, in the data journalism uh, field. And I believe it is crucial. There's a book to be written about that. There are several biographies of Ida B. Wells uh, out there, and I read a couple after I, I actually read a lot of books for every conversation because every conversation led to thoughts about different things. Uh, so for example, I read books about the history of Hungary just because I, I talked to Attila Batorfi wow. and I read books about the history of Ukraine just because I talked to Anatoly Bondarenko, mm -hmm. another good friend of mine, right? So, but in this particular case, I read a couple of biographies of. Ida B. Wells, and none of them refer to her data work from the data perspective. Mm -hmm. So there is a there is a book to be written there, analyzing her data analysis, data analysis work. Um, yeah, I, Anna is main, mentioning "Still Like an Artist" by Austin Kleon. Right, that's that's the that's the philosophy that Austin um, sort of like pushes in in "Still Like an Artist." Like borrow ideas, borrow ideas, credit the people you borrow from, but then you know you do your own mix of, of those ideas and eventually something, and then try to contribute and, and add something new uh, to the uh, to the field. So I am rumbling a little bit. I lost track because I, I was reading the, um, the the chat window. No, so yeah, I, I, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, so you were asking about conversations that surprised me. So yeah, Alan, Alan's uh, the conversation with Alan, the conversation with uh, perhaps with Attila mm -hmm. uh, from Hungary. I knew a little bit already about uh, the recent history of Hungary because I have friends who live in Budapest. But you know, it surprised me how deep the authoritarian. Uh, tendencies of the government over there have uh, have gotten in the in the last decade or so, attacking journalists and things like that. So that was quite quite revealing. No, Alberta, oh yeah, sorry, Lisa. No, we have in the chat like a question that's basically the opposite of who stood out for you, who surprised you. I think you already touched on that a little bit, but Unis always asking. Was there any common thread that surfaced about all these people you interviewed? Yeah, yeah. There were actually many. I mean, how, how self-driven everybody is and how the fact that everybody is not interested just in visualization, that we see visualization as a vehicle to do other things. So visualization is perhaps not our core interest, which makes a lot of sense. It's like writing. It's like writers are usually interested in the craft of writing, but they use writing as sort of like not as an end goal, but as an instrumental goal that can lead you to something else. So that that was a common th thread. Also, how how passionate people are, I already knew that, or is how passionate fe people feel about, not specifically about the language of visualization, but about what they can do mm -hmm. uh, with it, how passionate they are about spreading the word. And again, try to promote the idea that I mentioned before about you know, democratizing democratize the field, lower the bar, lowering the barrier of, barrier of entry. So yeah, that was a, that was a common thread. So there, yeah, there are several ones. Yeah, that are common to all designers. Interesting, Alberto. Um, now that you mentioned, uh, since you interviewed all these people from different backgrounds, India, Ukraine, uh, Spain, um, and many other places, we had a. I was hosting uh, a panel during the first day of Unwrapped 
It was with Pearl Sheehy from the University of Ghana and Victoria Oliveres from El Diario um, dot S or mm -hmm. ES. Mm -hmm. Dot ES. Um, yeah. And there was a question that someone, I don't remember, I can't remember who asked, asked it, but um, the question was how how much of data visualization is cultural? Mm -hmm. And now that, that, that you say that that you interviewed all these people from different different backgrounds, different cultures, mm -hmm. I, I, I've been thinking about that question since yeah. like a few days now. And there's, and a, there's a whole research agenda to be developed around that. What are mm -hmm. cultural differences? How local culture, visual culture in particular, but not only culture in general affects the way that we do data visualization. Um, there's a little bit, a tiny bit of that in the out of insight in the sense, for example, that I talk to people who work in countries where doing data journalism can be really difficult, like Hungary, for example, right? Um, but but there's not, not, not enough of that, right? Uh, again, I'm not a cultural critic. I don't have any particular training on those type of topics, but there, there's work to be done in there. So it's a research agenda to make co cultural comparisons mm -hmm. between different countries and see. I, be, I believe that it does, right? For example, having experience in different countries of Latin America, I sort of like glimpse differences in the way that visualization and more or more in particular news infographics are practiced, for example, in Brazil than in the United States, right? In terms of style, in terms of, you know, so I would be interested in seeing what the uh, what underlies uh, uh, those uh, slight differences that I notice in different countries. Again, I don't, cannot speak about that in with any, with any sort of authority. I just hope that someone will take on on that and do some actual and deep research about cultural differences. Do you see that data visualization, for example, I'm, I'm thinking out loud, but do you think that data visualization is uh, a, a better known field or or craft in some other countries than, than mm -hmm. others? Yes, yeah, and that is something that appears in the Art of Insight. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, um, the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, Germany, and perhaps to a lesser extent, France or or Spain, Western European countries, data visualization is sort of like steadily being adopted as a, as a language, and um, it is valued to a certain extent. But there are many other places where you know it barely exists, or, or, or it's not that it barely exists; it does exist because people create graphs and charts in Excel. So data visualization does exist. It's only that it is not sort of like theorized or practiced with self-awareness, like the way that we do it in, in, in other countries. Like talking about, for example, Egypt, talk to Mohammed Waket for, mm -hmm. for one of the chapters, and he expressed a little bit of frustration about that, saying, you know, there's really not a community of data visualization designers uh, in, in Egypt, and he's trying to push it, he's trying to promote it, he's trying to sort of like um, be an ambassador in, in, in that sense in, in his country. Same thing in Hungary, same thing in New Zealand, for example, um, and in some other countries that I... It's usually, sometimes it's actually... Um, a, a visualization starts spreading because of a particularly highly influential figure or group of people who become really visible in their country. And then they start promoting this idea of, take a look at this. I mean, this, you've been creating graphs you know, for a very long time, but this actually has a name. It's called data visualization. And it is a language, and this is how it is practiced. So that's the role of the ambassadors, right? In different, in different places, yeah. Yeah, we definitely see this in the data vis dispatch as well that uh, my coworkers are putting together every week. It's our collection of like, the best of um, mm -hmm. the data from the last week. And we would love to feature more sources mm -hmm. from, I don't know, not the Washington Post, not Bloomberg and the yeah. Times and yeah. Spiel, but it's it's hard to find them. We keep asking people to send yeah. us these sources. But there, do you know another good source perhaps to find them? Um, so I've been recently be a part of the jury of the Sigma Awards, the, the Data Journalism Awards. And um, a, people from other countries, not just the US or the United Kingdom, submit their work. So we, we've seen work coming from South Asia, from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, etc. It's pretty excellent work. And um, so that's a, that would be a good source to so take a look at the finalists of the Sigma Awards. You might find some interesting, uh, uh, interesting pieces to feature. That's a great idea. We'll do that. Yeah. 
You also have another question from the chat. Um, let's see, let's bring it up. I want to ask Alberto, do you think that there is a new case of success, like the hockey stick chart, ask Raul Rodriguez? Yeah, I mean, any any chart that becomes iconic for one reason or another, such as the hockey stick chart back in the 90s and the 2000s. Um, by the way, one of the authors of the hockey stick chart, Michael Mann, who is um, uh, a climate scientist who was unfairly attacked by the right wing in the United States because of that chart, beginning in the 90s and the, and the 2000s, uh, has recently been vindicated because he has won. Um, so he, he took some of his critics to trial and he got a $1 million for uh, defamation <laughs> very, very recently. And the hockey stick chart has been sort of like replicated tons of times with different data sets, has been vindicated many times. It was it was iconic at the time already, but it's even more iconic in my in my opinion today just because you know time has passed by and it's still there. Right? It's like we still see that pattern. I mean every year that passes by is usually the hottest year <laughs> in history or in recent history, right? Um I would say that for example the warming stripes is another one that is super iconic. And then in general I think that we should focus much less on thinking a, about a specific cases of success and talk a little bit more, talk a little bit less about the trees and talk a little bit more about the forest. Meaning, for example, are people looking more at data visualizations by people, I mean, general people, general readers? And I think that the answer is yes. Uh, what has been the role of the pandemic, for example, in uh, spreading the word and the awareness about data visualization? Um, that will be another case worth uh, worth looking into. Have, has, for example, data visualization literacy increased uh, as a side effect of the of the pandemic, or people being exposed so often to data visualizations? Is data literacy increasing? I believe that it is, little by little, but it may be worth looking into that and to, my, to me that will be cases of success if, if if the average the overall average data literacy of the population is steadily slowly but steadily increasing i think that that's a case of success which is much more important than any single data visualization iconic landmark that we can think of thanks it makes a lot of sense um we have two more questions from the chat give me that you want to ask something else first or should we no. We can we can take the the questions from the chat, Lisa. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Philip David Priest asks. You mentioned that every decision of a data vis designer is subjective, but should not be arbitrary. What subjective decisions did you came across concerning the size of data visualizations, like from stem to house? Size? <laughs> That's an interesting question. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So whenever we design a data visual, I'm going to think out loud here. So yes, yes, bear with me. Um, and this is part of sort of like what I'm thinking about at the moment in terms of writing perhaps a new a new book at some time, expanding on some of the ideas at some point, expanding on some of the ideas that I outlined in the Art of Insight. Whenever we design a, a data visualization, we need to work with, obviously, with the data. We need to look into the data and think about what the data is that we are trying to represent. We also need to think about goals, what we want to convey. But at the same time, we also need to think about constraints, right? And the constraints are critical. And they, they usually not discussed that much in the literature about data visualization. Constra one constraint, for example, will be the type of public that you are that you are that you have in mind, sort of like your ideal reader for your graphic. That's a constraint because obviously the type of public that you intend uh, to uh, send your visualization to will constrain your choices in terms of what to show, how to show it, how to explain it, whether you need more text or less text to put the, the data in context and so on and so forth. And size of the platform where you're going to reproduce your, your graphic, that's another, that's another constraint. So my own take about the size of a data visualization is that is to always remember that as visualization designers, we have, uh, or data analysts, right? Data analysts also have these problems, statisticians. We have a, you know, high high familiarity with the data that we handle, and that prompts us to try to show everything. I mean, I have everything. Let's show everything, and therefore, I need to design a house-sized uh, infographic just to put everything in there, right? But at the same time, you need to develop your sort of like inner editorial voice saying, but. Do you do I really need to show all these? So, what is the bare minimum amount of information that I need to show 
to get the point across without oversimplifying my data. That's sort of the type of thinking, the type of frame of mind that I that I try to put myself into whenever I design a graphic. When am I showing too much? Or when am I showing too little? When am I oversimplifying things? Or when, when am I overcomplicating things? What is a nice middle ground between those two uh, possible biases, right? So again, it's not very objective because obviously you need to make a subjective choice, but I can reason my choices. And there are plenty of examples of these in, not necessarily in the art of insight, although in the art of insight, there is a sort of like a step-by-step -step deconstruction of a visualization. If I had put myself, if I put myself in the shoes of these particular designers, what type of decisions and steps I would have taken to reach this particular point? I deconstruct a graphic by, uh, by the pudding. I think that in chapter two or in chapter three, I do the type of exercise all the time. And I actually propose my students, tell my students to do this on a regular basis. Take a look at the graphic, but do, uh, uh, an existing visualization, but don't just think about the final art, the final version that you're seeing. Try it again to put yourself in the shoes of this designer. Try to think about the reasons who took that designer to that particular, to that particular point. And the reasoning can include also a reasoning about the size. Why is this graphic so small? Why is this graphic so big? Does the graphic need to be so big? Or is the graphic too small, right? That's the type of thinking that we need to develop. So again, very subjective, but not arbitrary because you can reason those type of choices. Again, those reasons may be debatable, uh, but but they're still your reasons. And if you can justify them, they are good, they are good reasons that you're providing for your choices. Perfect. Thank you. Christine Baumann wants to bring it back to the book uh, we are also discussing. She asked, could you talk a bit about the creation process of the book, please? Like how long did it take you from idea to publishing? How did you pick the people for the interviews? Oh gosh, that's a that's a hard one. Anyway, so um, all right. So publishing the the publishing part first. So this book was intended to be published in two thousand and twenty one, and it ended up being published in two thousand and twenty three. So it took me two years more than I had expected to write the book because originally I thought just about doing a book that was just a series of conversations. But then eventually I realized that that was not enough. That I needed to provide more context, commentary, you know, thread the conversations to each other somehow to have some sort of underlying narrative in it. And perhaps if you read the book, you will notice that. So it's perhaps among my books is the best, the best well-rounded one because the ending of the book connects to the beginning. So it's like I, I, I envision the art of insight as a journey, right? It's a journey that you're going to take with me through the work of different designers and through visiting these designers in the different ports or harbors where they leave, then we will eventually go back to the very beginning and we may have learned something in the process of taking this these journey. So coming up with the narrative, coming up with the commentary took a long time. Um, there were also some personal issues there in the middle that I unfortunately suffered that also delayed a, a, the book. So it was the hardest book to write for me, not because it's a particularly difficult book to write, but because of all these, all these uh, matters. Um, now, uh, in terms of how to choose the uh, the people for the, for the interviews, I actually, I think that I mentioned this in the intro to the book. I just made a list of people. Um, this, it was like 50 or 60, 70 people. And then I just had to find a cutoff in there. It's like, I not include everybody. And maybe I need to write a follow-up at some point, the Out of Insight 2, with the other 30 or 40 designers that I had on my list. Because there are many people who I left out. Uh, unfortunately, I wish that the book could have been, you know, 800 pages long, but then it will not be out until 2028, and I needed to, I needed to move on. Also, I needed to start working on other, on other topics that I have in the back of my mind uh, that I, that will need my attention soon. Interesting. Thank you. Um, another one that goes away from the book again um, by Piet Pietro. Alberto, what do you think are the main challenges from artif that artificial intelligence brings to the field of visualization? A threat or an opportunity? No, it's both, like any other, <laughs> like any other technology. It's like I compare these all the discourse around data visualization. Oh, sorry, around artificial generative, specifically generative artificial artificial intelligence, to the discourse around you know the launching of Photoshop 
30 or 40 years ago, right? Remember people saying, oh, you know, there's not going to be a need for photo editors anymore just because anybody can become a photo editor. Or later when web blogs were invented, there's not going to be newspapers anymore because everybody can become a journalist and write their own substack, which is true. Everybody can create their own substack, right? Which is a great thing or blogger at the time, right? Or WordPress or whatever, right? So, but there's always going to be a need, I think, for an informed um, a human voice or hand to take care of what the what the tool is doing so i see do i see it as a threat sure the same way that i see you know a deep fakes as a, as a threat that's a threat obviously there's a threat for you know a huge increase in the amount of misinformation and disinformation that we will see out there there's also a threat in the sense that creating visuals not only data visualizations but any sort of visual will become so easy that anybody will be able to do it which is a good thing that democratizes things but democ democracy has its dangers right we all know that, that already it's like people will misuse these types of these types of tools uh, inevitably um but you know we human beings have these sort of like this sort of ability to 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 sort of like um, start policing what we do with these types of tools so i'm hopeful that we will find ways to use uh, artificial intelligence in an, in an ethical way. I also see it as an opportunity, obviously, because it's, it potentially can speed up the work. I mean, tons of automated activities that nowadays we need to, we need to do can be automated through the tools, like writing code, for example. Obviously, you still need to double check the code that the AI generates, but you know, not having to write the code yourself, that's great progress. I don't write. I don't like to write code. I don't want to write code anymore. All that I want to do is to be an editor. So maybe that's the key thing, that we need to start thinking about ourselves, uh, if we are visualization designers, not only as designers, but, also, but, but as editors of the work that other people, or in this case, other tools are creating for us to cast a critical, critical eye on what the tool is generating and then edit the work that the tool, uh, uh, that the tool is putting out. Alberto, now that you're talking about artificial intelligence, um, I wanted to ask you, is there, uh, do you see that data visualization from, let's say, when you started uh, writing your first book, do you see a, a pattern, uh, something changing uh, in, in, in the field? Or how do you even, how do you envision data visualization uh, in the future? I honestly have no idea where visualization will go. I'm, I so one pattern that I that I that I saw and that I that I have tried to contribute to with my work is this popularization and spread of uh, of visualization. I don't want visualization to belong to just a cadre of you know experts quotation marks in there because nobody's an expert. Uh, you know, a group of experts who know what they talk about. You know, it's, uh, a, a thought leaders, which is a, it's a term that I really, really hate. Um, I just want everybody and anybody to benefit from these. And, I, and I've seen that. I've seen more people embracing visualization, approaching visualization, demystifying data visualization. So that's certainly, a, that's certainly progress. Now, in terms of the types of graphics themselves, I mean, I have not seen a huge you know, innovations. Other, I mean, perhaps there has been an expansion on the sort of like data sensification side of things, like more physicalizations, more sonifications. But data visualization itself has has continued being what it has always been. It's like, yeah, there has been some progress in terms of the tools that we use, obviously. Tools have become, in general, more accessible, easier to use, you know, creating a layer of, uh, you know, graphical user interfaces, right? Data wrapper is a great example, but there are many others, right? That facilitate the work. Mm -hmm. There has also been a, an increase in the variety of visualization that we commonly see, for example, in news media, right? The, the, uh, we ne barely saw any histograms or scatter plots in news media 20 or 30 years ago when I began my career, because editors thought that um, but if it's actually told you this, if you try to push a scatter plot in a newspaper, the reaction of your editor would always be, will always be, um, our reader will not understand this chart because it's so new, right? And we try to sort of like counteract that argument saying, well, but if we never publish a scatter plot, obviously nobody's going to understand it ever because we never use it, right? But so there has been an incorporation of new graphic forms 
to news media, and that has expanded also, I think, that the, the, the vocabulary that common people, regular people understand, and that's also that's also progress. Other people can talk more than I can about, about innovation. I'm honestly not that interested in innovation. I don't care. I there are other people working in that in that area. I'm I'm not that interested in contributing to creating the, the latest, highest end, super innovative data visualization tool, whatever. Other people can work on that. I am much more interested in that people, regular people can read correctly bar graphs, line charts, scatter plots, and data maps. And that I would consider that progress because it will mean that more people can benefit from using the language. Alberto, as we are coming to the end uh, of the uh, book club, I wanted to ask you one last question. Uh, this uh, session is kind of like part of, of Unwrapped, right? Uh, as you heard before, the uh, the Data Wrapper uh, conference, and we had uh, people attending who who were uh, experts in using using the tool and we had people who it was their first time exposed that they were exposed uh, to data wrapper and we even had like people that it was their first time at a data visualization mm -hmm. conference but they, they're just uh, getting started so my question is what would be that one thing that we, that you would recommend to people, to these people who are just getting started and feel a little bit like intimidated, but all the things that we, we talked about, the data wrapper API, we talked about very, very specific things. So for the people who are just getting started, what would be that uh, advice or recommendation that you would give them? Don't be intimidated. Nobody knows anything. Uh, at least at a deep, a very deep level. So just assume that anybody don't assume that anybody who writes book about these books about these things know a lot more than you do. We may have more experience. We have we have, we may have observed in how people um, read visualization, etc. But that doesn't mean that we have sort of like you know, we can cast rules on you. That's what I try to uh, counteract or fight against in the art of insight. Obviously, that doesn't mean that you should not read books about visualizations. You should, because you need, again, to back up your reasons, to provide yourselves with reasons to act in a certain way or in another way. And books are a great way to get acquainted with the uh, academic literature about visualization, right? I get, you know, Tamara Mansner's book, for example, right? Which uh, Tamara's book is a, so essentially summarizes research on data visualization for the past 20 or 30 years. It's a great it's, a, it's an academic book, so obviously don't expect to be able to read it from cover to cover. It's, it's a book that you could, you can consult. And there are many other books out there who are at great entry points to the field. Storytelling with Data by Cole, Newsbomber, you know, Better Data Visualizations by John Schwab. There are many entry-level books that are great for that. So get a few of those just to get familiar with the, with the field. Um, but then practice it. Just to start just to start. In getting a sense of how those principles discussed in those books, how they apply to the real world, and they, to develop a sense of how flexible they can be, right? And and how how the literature, the academic literature, or the empirical evidence actually translates to real world, a real world practice. As I said before, copy someone, not just one person, but try, borrow ideas shamelessly. Uh, recognize, acknowledge where you're borrowing your ideas from. But we all learn that way, and, so, and we need to acknowledge that. So do that. And then show your work. It's like show your work uh, publicly, uh, share it, um, ask for feedback. I mean, one of the great things about the visualization community is that perhaps with a few exceptions, it's a very welcoming community. And it has become growingly a very welcoming community. So, for example, if you join, you know, forums like you know the Data Visualization Society um, and others, and you show your work, you will probably get feedback from from other people. Um, and that feedback will be constructive. It is very rare nowadays that you will get a very negative reaction to your work. And if you do, just ignore it. I mean, negative reactions that don't that are not paired with advice are worthless. You may get, and this is a very important thing, also which is the sort of like the, side, the flip side of that of the feedback coin if you receive negative feedback and that feedback is backed up with reasons meaning that the person who wrote that feedback actually took the time to 
tell you why or she or he thinks that your visualization could be improved, even if the tone of the critique may sound negative to you, don't react negatively to it. Um, take, take those words, take that advice. Uh, you may dismiss that advice eventually because you may disagree with it, uh, but you may learn a little bit from that. And I, I speak based on my own experience. I received you know, negative criticism from some of my books by some people and um, not extremely negative, but certainly, you know, you know, very, you know, some harsh critiques uh, of some of my books. But those critiques were very well recent. They were so well recent, actually, that in just one, in one case, I actually invited one of those critics to become an editor of, of a couple of my books because he was so thorough uh, with his critiques. And that was super useful. And we became friends, friends eventually. And um, we have been speaking with each other ever since. So expose yourself to criticism. That's another thing. Again, the community is in general really welcoming and that's a great development. We need to keep it that way. There is also some discussion about community in the Out of Insight. We need to keep the community as open as open as possible and also as welcoming as possible to newcomers. So newcomers should not be intimidated, but they should take the job seriously. That's the again the flip side of the coin. I mean, it's very easy there's a whole reason why I wrote a book titled How, Ch How, Li How, How Charts Lies, <laughs> because it's very easy to unintendedly lie with charts, right? And they, we need to be aware of that risk. So therefore, we need to take the work seriously. Alberto, thank you so very much for your time, but especially for your genuinity. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that word correctly, but thank you so very much, really. Uh, can you tell people uh, where they can find your work, where they can find you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm still relatively not very active, but I still have a presence on Twitter. I barely post on Twitter anymore. I don't want to promote the work of Nazis, so I try to avoid it. Uh, I am on Blue Sky, for example. They can find me there. They can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I recently launched a newsletter. A, a, the English version is The Art of Insight, uh, the title of the newest book. So you can find me there on Substack. I, I, I launched it through Substack. And I also launched the Spanish version of the um, a, of the newsletter as well. You can find it on if you find me on LinkedIn, I post everything there. I'm, and I also started posting on posting on Instagram, so I have presence on Instagram as well. Awesome! Thank you so very much again, and hopefully we'll see you for the Art of Insight too. Thank you. We'll see. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Bye bye. Right. You excited about the Spanish version, right, Gamina? <laughs> I think um I haven't I haven't found yet at least or someone tell me in the chat, I haven't found like many, 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 many database resources in Spanish. For those who don't know, I come from Argentina, so I speak Spanish. <laughs> Uh, and usually the every every time I, I read something about data visualization it's usually in English so that's why I did the thumbs up because I think we need more uh, Spanish uh, database material in Spanish so yeah anyway so enough about Spanish <laughs> <laughs> thank to everyone who joined really thank you very very much I hope that you that you liked it uh, please, if you haven't done so, we have a database newsletter. That's the latest addition to our newsletter. So if you want to keep updated about the next uh, database book club session, we're going to be uh, posting it on Twitter. We're going to be sending out the newsletter. So please feel free to sign up if you want to if you want to find out when the next session is going to be and what we're going to be reading next. So with that. Thank you again, everyone, for joining, and we'll see you the next time. Thanks, Guillermina. Bye, everyone. <laughs>